Chapter 11 Secession and War Recruiting of the 54th and 55th Colored Regiments, visit to President Lincoln and Secretary Stanton, promised a commission as Adjutant General to General Thomas, disappointment. The cowardly and disgraceful reaction, from a courageous and manly assertion of right principles, as described in the foregoing pages, continued surprisingly long after secession and war were commenced. The patience and forbearance of the loyal people of the North were amazing. Speaking of this feature of the situation in Corinthian Hall, Rochester, at the time, I said. We, the people of the North, are a charitable people. And in the excess of this feeling we were disposed to put the very best construction upon the strange behavior of our Southern brethren. We hoped that all would yet go well. We thought that South Carolina might secede, it was entirely like her to do so. She had talked extravagantly about going out of the Union, and it was natural that she should do something extravagant and startling if for nothing else, to save a show of consistency. Georgia too, we thought might possibly secede. But strangely enough we thought and felt quite sure that these twin rebellious states would stand alone and unsupported in their infamy and their impotency. That they would soon tire of their isolation, repent of their folly and come back to their places in the Union. Traitors withdrew from the Cabinet, from the House of Representatives, and from the Senate, and hastened to their several states to fire the Southern heart, and to fan the hot flames of treason at home. Still we doubted if anything serious would come of it. We treated it as a bubble on the wave, a nine days wonder. Calm and thoughtful men ourselves, we relied upon the sober second thought of the southern people. Even the capture of a fort, a shot at one of our ships, an insult to the national flag, caused only a momentary feeling of indignation and resentment. We could not but believe that there existed at the South a latent and powerful Union sentiment which would assert itself at last. Though loyal soldiers had been fired upon in the streets of Baltimore. Though loyal blood had stained the pavements of that beautiful city, and the national government was warned to send no troops through Baltimore to the defense of the national capital. We 374 could not be made to believe that the border states would plunge madly into the bloody vortex of rebellion. But this confidence, patience, and forbearance could not last forever. These blissful illusions of hope were in a measure dispelled and the batteries of Charleston Harbor were opened upon the starving garrison at Fort Sumter. For the moment the northern lamb was transformed into a lion, and his roar was terrible. But he only showed his teeth, and clearly had no wish to use them. We preferred to fight with dollars and not daggers. The fewer battles the better, was the hopeful motto at Washington. Peace in sixty days, was held out by the astute Secretary of State. In fact, there was at the North no disposition to fight, no spirit of hate. No comprehension of the stupendous character and dimensions of the rebellion, and no proper appreciation of its inherent wickedness. Treason had shot its poisonous roots deeper, and had spread its death-dealing branches further than any northern calculation had covered. Thus while rebels were waging a barbarous war, marshalling savage Indians to join them in the slaughter. While rifled cannonballs were battering down the walls of our forts, and the ironclad hand of monarchical power was being invoked to assist in the destruction of our government and the dismemberment of our country. While a tremendous rebel ram was sinking our fleet and threatening the cities of our coast, we were still dreaming of peace. This infatuation, this blindness to the significance of passing events, can only be accounted for by the rapid passage of these events, and by the fact of the habitual leniency and goodwill cherished by the North towards the South. Our very lack of preparation for the conflict disposed us to look for some other than the way of blood out of the difficulty. Treason had largely infected both army and navy. Floyd had scattered our arms. Cobb had depleted our treasury, and Buchanan had poisoned the political thought of the times by his doctrines of anti-coercion. It was in such a condition of things as this that Abraham Lincoln, compelled from fear of assassination to enter the capital in disguise, was inaugurated and issued his proclamation for the repossession of the forts, places, and property which had been seized from the Union, and his call upon the militia of the several states to the number of 75,000 men, a paper which showed how little even he comprehended the work then before the loyal nation. 
It was perhaps better for the country and for mankind that the good man could not know the end from the beginning. Had he foreseen the thousands who must sink into bloody graves? The mountains of debt to be laid on the breast of the nation. The terrible hardships and sufferings involved in the contest, and his own death by an assassin's hand, he too might have adopted the weak sentiment of those who said, erring sisters depart in peace. From the first, for one, saw in this war the end of slavery, and truth requires me to say that my interest in the success of the North was largely due to this belief. True it is that this faith was many times shaken by passing events, 375 but never destroyed. When Secretary Seward instructed our ministers to say to the governments to which they were accredited, that, terminate however it might. The status of no class of the people of the United States would be changed by the rebellion, that the slaves would be slaves still. And that the masters would be masters still, when General McClellan and General Butler warned the slaves in advance that if any attempt was made by them to gain their freedom, it would be suppressed with an iron hand, when the government persistently refused to employ colored troops, when the Emancipation Proclamation of General John C. Fremont in Missouri was withdrawn, when slaves were being returned from our lines to their masters, when Union soldiers were stationed about the farmhouses of Virginia to guard and protect the master in holding his slaves, when Union soldiers made themselves more active in kicking colored men out of their camps than in shooting rebels, when even Mr. Lincoln could tell the poor Negro that he was the cause of the war, I still believed, and spoke as I believed, all over the North, that the mission of the war was the liberation of the slave, as well as the salvation of the Union. And hence from the first I reproached the North that they fought the rebels with only one hand. When they might strike effectually with two, that they fought with their soft white hand while they kept their black iron hand chained and helpless behind them, that they fought the effect while they protected the cause. And that the Union cause would never prosper till the war assumed an anti-slavery attitude, and the Negro was enlisted on the loyal side. In every way possible, in the columns of my paper and on the platform, by letters to friends, at home and abroad, I did all that I could to impress this conviction upon this country. But nations seldom listen to advice from individuals, however reasonable. They are taught less by theories than by facts and events. There was much that could be said against making the war an abolition war, much that seemed wise and patriotic. Make the war an abolition 376 war, we were told, and you drive the border states into the rebellion, and thus add power to the enemy, and increase the number you will have to meet on the battlefield. You will exasperate and intensify southern feeling, making it more desperate, and put far away the day of peace between the two sections. Employ the arm of the Negro, and the loyal men of the North will throw down their arms and go home. This is the white man's country, and the white man's war. It would inflict an intolerable wound upon the pride and spirit of white soldiers of the Union, to see the Negro in the United States uniform. Besides, if you make the Negro a soldier, you cannot depend on his courage, a crack of his old master's whip would send him scampering in terror from the field. And so it was that custom, pride, prejudice, and the old-time respect for Southern feeling, held back the government from an anti-slavery policy, and from arming the Negro. Meanwhile the rebellion availed itself of the Negro most effectively. He was not only the stomach of the rebellion, by supplying its commissary department, but he built its forts, and dug its entrenchments, and performed other duties of its camp. Which left the rebel soldier more free to fight the loyal army than he could otherwise have been. It was the cotton and corn of the Negro that made the rebellion sack stand on end, and caused a continuance of the war. Destroy these, was the burden of all my utterances during this part of the struggle, and you cripple and destroy the rebellion. It is surprising how long and bitterly the government resisted and rejected this view of the situation. The abolition heart of the North ached over the delay, and uttered its bitter complaints, but the administration remained blind and dumb. Bull Run, Ball's Bluff, Big Bethel, Fredericksburg, and the Peninsula disasters were the only teachers whose authority was of sufficient importance to excite the attention or respect of our rulers, and they were even slow in being taught by these. An important point was gained, however, when General B. F. Butler, at Fortress Monroe, 
announced the policy of treating 377 the slaves as contrabands to be made useful to the Union cause and was sustained therein at Washington. And sentiments of a similar nature were expressed on the floor of Congress by Hahn. A. G. Riddle of Ohio. A grand accession was made to this view of the case when Honorable Simon Cameron, then Secretary of War, gave it his earnest support, and General David Hunter put the measure into practical operation in South Carolina. General Phelps from Vermont, in command at Carrollton, La, also advocated the same plan though under discouragements which cost him his command. And many and grievous disasters on flood and field were needed to educate the loyal nation and President Lincoln up to the realization of the necessity, not to say justice, of this position, and many devices, intermediate steps. And makeshifts were suggested to smooth the way to the ultimate policy of freeing the slave, and arming the freedmen. When at last the truth began to dawn upon the administration that the Negro might be made useful to loyalty, as well as to treason, to the Union as well as to the Confederacy, it then considered in what way it could employ him. Which would in the least shock and offend the popular prejudice against him. He was already in the army as a waiter, and in that capacity there was no objection to him, and so it was thought that as this was the case. The feeling which tolerated him as a waiter would not seriously object if he should be admitted to the army as a laborer, especially as no one under a southern sun cared to have a monopoly of digging and toiling in trenches. This was the first step in employing Negroes in the United States service. The second step was to give them a peculiar costume which should distinguish them from soldiers, and yet mark them as a part of the loyal force. As the eyes of the loyal administration still further opened, it was proposed to give these laborers something better than spades and shovels with which to defend themselves in cases of emergency. Still later it was proposed to make them soldiers, but soldiers without the blue uniform. Soldiers with a mark upon them to 378 show that they were inferior to other soldiers, soldiers with a badge of degradation upon them. However, once in the army as a laborer, once there with a red shirt on his back and a pistol in his belt, the Negro was not long in appearing on the field as a soldier. But still he was not to be a soldier in the sense, and on an equal footing, with white soldiers. It was given out that he was not to be employed in the open field with white troops, under the inspiration of doing battle and winning victories for the Union cause, and in the face and teeth of his old masters. But that he should be made to garrison forts in yellow fever and otherwise unhealthy localities of the South, to save the health of white soldiers. And in order to keep up the distinction further the black soldiers were to have only half the wages of the white soldiers, and were to be commanded entirely by white commissioned officers. While of course I was deeply pained and saddened by the estimate thus put upon my race, and grieved at the slowness of heart which marked the conduct of the loyal government, I was not discouraged, and urged every man who could to enlist. To get an eagle on his button, a musket on his shoulder, and a star-spangled banner over his head. Hence, as soon as Governor Andrew of Massachusetts received permission from Mr. Lincoln to raise two colored regiments, the 54th and 55th, I made the following address to the colored citizens of the North through my paper, then being published in Rochester, which was copied in the leading journals. Men of color, to arms. When first the rebel cannon shattered the walls of Sumter and drove away its starving garrison, I predicted that the war then and there inaugurated would not be fought out entirely by white men. Every month's experience during these dreary years has confirmed that opinion. A war undertaken and brazenly carried on for the perpetual enslavement of colored men, calls logically and loudly for colored men to help suppress it. Only a moderate share of sagacity was needed to see that the arm of the slave was the best defense against the arm of the slaveholder. Hence with every reverse to the national arms, with every exulting shout of victory raised by the slaveholding rebels, I have implored the imperiled nation to unchain against her foes, her powerful black hand. Slowly and reluctantly that appeal is beginning to 379 be heeded. Stop not now to complain that it was not heeded sooner. It may or it may not have been best that it should not. This is not the time to discuss that question. Leave it to the future. When the war is over, the country is saved, peace is established, and the black man's rights are secured, as they will be, 
history with an impartial hand will dispose of that and sundry other questions. Action. Action. Not criticism, is the plain duty of this hour. Words are now useful only as they stimulate to blows. The office of speech now is only to point out when, where, and how to strike to the best advantage. There is no time to delay. The tide is at its flood that leads on to fortune. From east to west, from north to south, the sky is written all over, now or never. Liberty won by white men would lose half its luster. Who would be free themselves must strike the blow. Better even die free, than to live slaves. This is the sentiment of every brave colored man amongst us. There are weak and cowardly men in all nations. We have them amongst us. They tell you this is the white man's war. That you will be no better off after than before the war, that the getting of you into the army is to sacrifice you on the first opportunity. Believe them not. Cowards themselves, they do not wish to have their cowardice shamed by your brave example. Leave them to their timidity, or to whatever motive may hold them back. I have not thought lightly of the words I am now addressing you. The counsel I give comes of close observation of the great struggle now in progress, and of the deep conviction that this is your hour and mine. In good earnest then, and after the best deliberation, now for the first time during this war, feel at liberty to call and counsel you to arms. By every consideration which binds you to your enslaved fellow countrymen, and the peace and welfare of your country, by every aspiration which you cherish for the freedom and equality of yourselves and your children. By all the ties of blood and identity which make us one with the brave black men now fighting our battles in Louisiana and in South Carolina, I urge you to fly to arms. And smite with death the power that would bury the government and your liberty in the same hopeless grave. I wish I could tell you that the state of New York calls you to this high honor. For the moment her constituted authorities are silent on the subject. They will speak by and by, and doubtless on the right side. But we are not compelled to wait for her. We can get at the throat of treason and slavery through the state of Massachusetts. She was first in the War of Independence, first to break the chains of her slaves. First to make the black man equal before the law first to admit colored children to her common schools, and she was first to answer with her blood the alarm cry of the nation, when its capital was menaced by rebels. You know her patriotic governor, and you know Charles Sumner. I need not add more. Massachusetts now welcomes you to arms as soldiers. She has but a small colored population from which to recruit. She has full leave of the general government to send one regiment to the war, and she has undertaken 380 to do it. Go quickly and help fill up the first colored regiment from the north. I am authorized to assure you that you will receive the same wages, the same rations, the same equipments, the same protection, the same treatment, and the same bounty, secured to white soldiers. You will be led by able and skillful officers, men who will take a special pride in your efficiency and success. They will be quick to accord to you all the honor you shall merit by your valor, and see that your rights and feelings are respected by other soldiers. I have assured myself on these points, and can speak with authority. More than twenty years of unswerving devotion to our common cause may give me some humble claim to be trusted at this momentous crisis. I will not argue. To do so implies hesitation and doubt, and you do not hesitate. You do not doubt. The day dawns, the morning star is bright upon the horizon. The iron gate of our prison stands half open. One gallant rush from the north will fling it wide open, while four millions of our brothers and sisters shall march out into liberty. The chance is now given you to end in a day the bondage of centuries, and to rise in one bound from social degradation to the plane of common equality with all other varieties of men. Remember Denmark V.C. of Charleston. Remember Nathaniel Turner of Southampton, remember Shields Green and Copeland, who followed noble John Brown, and fell as glorious martyrs for the cause of the slave. Remember that in a contest with oppression, the Almighty has no attribute which can take sides with oppressors. The case is before you. This is our golden opportunity. Let us accept it, 
and forever wipe out the dark reproaches unsparingly hurled against us by our enemies. Let us win for ourselves the gratitude of our country, and the best blessings of our posterity through all time. The nucleus of this first regiment is now in camp at Reedville, a short distance from Boston. I will undertake to forward to Boston all persons adjudged fit to be mustered into the regiment, who shall apply to me at any time within the next two weeks. Rochester, March 2, 1863 Immediately after authority had been given by President Lincoln to Governor John A. Andrew of Massachusetts to raise and equip two regiments of colored men for the war, I received a letter from George L. Stearns of Boston, a noble worker for freedom in Kansas, and a warm friend of John Brown, earnestly entreating me to assist in raising the required number of men. It was presumed that by my labors in the anti-slavery cause, I had gained some influence with the colored men of the country, and that they would listen to me in this emergency, which supposition, I am happy to say, was supported by the results. There were fewer colored people in 381 Massachusetts then than now, and it was necessary in order to make up the full quota of these regiments, to recruit for them in other northern states. The nominal conditions upon which colored men were asked to enlist, were not satisfactory to me or them. But assurances from Governor Andrew that they would in the end be made just and equal, together with my faith in the logic of events, and my conviction that the wise thing to do was for the colored man to get into the army by any door open to him. No matter how narrow, made me accept with alacrity the work to which I was invited. The raising of these two regiments, the 54th and 55th, and their splendid behavior in South and North Carolina was the beginning of great things for the colored people of the whole country. And not the least satisfaction I now have in contemplating my humble part in raising them, is the fact that my two sons, Charles and Lewis, were the two first in the state of New York to enlist in them. The 54th was not long in the field before it proved itself gallant and strong, worthy to rank with the most courageous of its white companions in arms. Its assault upon Fort Wagner, in which it was so fearfully cut to pieces, and lost nearly half its officers, including its beloved and trusted commander, Colonel Shaw, at once gave it a name and a fame throughout the country. In that terrible battle, under the wing of night, more cavils in respect of the quality of Negro manhood were set at rest than could have been during a century of ordinary life and observation. After that assault we heard no more of sending Negroes to garrison forts and arsenals, to fight miasma, yellow fever, and smallpox. Talk of his ability to meet the foe in the open field, and of his equal fitness with the white man to stop a bullet, then began to prevail. From this time, and the fact ought to be remembered, the colored troops were called upon to occupy positions which required the courage, steadiness, and endurance of veterans. And even their enemies were obliged to admit that they proved themselves worthy the confidence reposed in them. After the 54th and 55th Massachusetts 382 colored regiments were placed in the field, and one of them had distinguished itself with so much credit in the hour of trial, the desire to send more such troops to the front became pretty general. Pennsylvania proposed to raise ten regiments. I was again called by my friend Mr. Stearns to assist in raising these regiments, and I set about the work with full purpose of heart, using every argument of which I was capable, to persuade every colored man able to bear arms to rally around the flag. And help to save the country and save the race. It was during this time that the attitude of the government at Washington caused me deep sadness and discouragement, and forced me in a measure to suspend my efforts in that direction. I had assured colored men that once in the Union Army they would be put upon an equal footing with other soldiers, that they would be paid, promoted, and exchanged as prisoners of war, Jeff. Davis's threats that they would be treated as felons to the contrary notwithstanding. But thus far, the government had not kept its promise or the promise made for it. The following letter which I find published in my paper of the same date will show the course I felt it my duty to take under the circumstances. Rochester, August 1, 1863. Major George L. Stearns. My dear sir, having declined to attend the meeting to promote enlistments, appointed for me at Pittsburgh, in present circumstances, I owe you a word of explanation. I have hitherto deemed it a duty, 
as it certainly has been a pleasure, to cooperate with you in the work of raising colored troops in the free states to fight the battles of the Republic against slaveholding rebels and traitors. Upon the first call you gave me to this work I responded with alacrity. I saw, or thought I saw a ray of light, brightening the future of my whole race as well as that of our war-troubled country, in arousing colored men to fight for the nation's life. I continue to believe in the black man's arm, and still have some hope in the integrity of our rulers. Nevertheless I must for the present leave to others the work of persuading colored men to join the Union Army. I owe it to my long-abused people, and especially to those already in the army, to expose their wrongs and plead their cause. I cannot do that in connection with recruiting. When I plead for recruits I want to do it with all my heart, without qualification. I cannot do that now. The impression settles upon me that colored men have much overrated the enlightenment, justice, and generosity of our rulers at 383 Washington. In my humble way I have contributed somewhat to that false estimate. You know that when the idea of raising colored troops was first suggested, the special duty to be assigned them, was the garrisoning of forts and arsenals in certain warm, unhealthy, and miasmatic localities in the South. They were thought to be better adapted to that service than white troops. White troops trained to war, brave, and daring, were to take fortifications, and the blacks were to hold them from falling again into the hands of the rebels. Three advantages were to arise out of this wise division of labor, first, the spirit and pride of white troops was not to waste itself in dull monotonous inactivity in fort life, their arms were to be kept bright by constant use. 2d, the health of white troops was to be preserved. 3d, black troops were to have the advantage of sound military training and to be otherwise useful, at the same time that they should be tolerably secure from capture by the rebels who early avowed their determination to enslave and slaughter them in defiance of the laws of war. Two out of the three advantages were to accrue to the white troops. Thus far, however, I believe that no such duty as holding fortifications has been committed to colored troops. They have done far other and more important work than holding fortifications. I have no special complaint to make at this point, and I simply mention it to strengthen the statement. That from the beginning of this business it was the confident belief among both the colored and white friends of colored enlistments that President Lincoln as Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy would certainly see to it that his colored troops should be so handled and disposed of as to be but little exposed to capture by the rebels, and that, if so exposed, as they have repeatedly been from the first. The President possessed both the disposition and the means for compelling the rebels to respect the rights of such as might fall into their hands. The piratical proclamation of Jefferson Davis, announcing slavery and assassination to colored prisoners was before the country and the world. But men had faith in Mr. Lincoln and his advisers. He was silent to be sure, but charity suggested that being a man of action rather than words he only waited for a case in which he should be required to act. This faith in the man enabled us to speak with warmth and effect in urging enlistments among colored men. That faith, my dear sir, is now nearly gone. Various occasions have arisen during the last six months for the exercise of his power in behalf of the colored men in his service. But no word comes to us from the War Department, sternly assuring the rebel chief that Inquisition shall yet be made for innocent blood. No word of retaliation and a black man is slain by a rebel in cold blood. No word was said when free men from Massachusetts were caught and sold into slavery in Texas. No word is said when brave black men who, according to the testimony of both friend and foe, fought like heroes to plant the star-spangled banner on the blazing parapets of Fort Wagner, and in doing so were captured, some mutilated and killed. And others sold into slavery. The same crushing silence reigns over this scandalous outrage as over that 384 of the slaughtered Teamsters at Murfreesboro, the same as over that at Milliken's Bend and Vicksburg. I am free to say, my dear sir, that the case looks as if the confiding colored soldiers had been betrayed into bloody hands by the very government in whose defense they were heroically fighting. I know what you will say to this. You will say, wait a little longer, and after all the best way to have justice done to your people is to get them into the army as fast as you can. You may be right in this. My argument has been the same, 
but have we not already waited, and have we not already shown the highest qualities of soldiers, and on this account deserve the protection of the government for which we are fighting? Can any case stronger than that before Charleston ever arise? If the President is ever to demand justice and humanity, for black soldiers, is not this the time for him to do it? How many 54 THs must be cut to pieces, its mutilated prisoners killed, and its living sold into slavery, to be tortured to death by inches, before Mr. Lincoln shall say, hold, enough. You know the 54th. To you, more than to any one man belongs the credit of raising that regiment. Think of its noble and brave officers literally hacked to pieces, while many of its rank and file have been sold into slavery worse than death, and pardon me. If I hesitate about assisting in raising a fourth regiment until the President shall give the same protection to them as to white soldiers. With warm and sincere regards. Frederick Douglass. Since writing the foregoing letter, which we have now put upon record. We have received assurances from Major Stearns that the government of the United States is already taking measures which will secure the captured colored soldiers at Charleston and elsewhere the same protection against slavery and cruelty extended to white soldiers. What ought to have been done at the beginning, comes late, but it comes. The poor colored soldiers have purchased interference dearly. It really seems that nothing of justice, liberty, or humanity can come to us except through tears and blood. The Black Man at the White House My efforts to secure just and fair treatment for the colored soldiers did not stop at letters and speeches. At the suggestion of my friend, Major Stearns, to whom the foregoing letter was addressed, I was induced to go to Washington and lay the complaints of my people before President Lincoln and the Secretary of War. And to urge upon them such action as should secure to the colored troops then fighting for the country, a reasonable degree of fair play. I need not say that at the time I undertook this mission it required much more nerve than a similar one would require now. The distance 385 then between the black man and the white American citizen, was immeasurable. I was an ex-slave, identified with a despised race, and yet I was to meet the most exalted person in this great republic. It was altogether an unwelcome duty, and one from which I would gladly have been excused. I could not know what kind of a reception would be accorded me. I might be told to go home and mind my business, and leave such questions as I had come to discuss to be managed by the men wisely chosen by the American people to deal with them. Or I might be refused an interview altogether. Nevertheless, I felt bound to go, and my acquaintance with Senators Charles Sumner, Henry Wilson, Samuel Pomeroy, Secretary Salmon P. Chase, Secretary William H. Seward, and Assistant Secretary of War Charles A. Dana, encouraged me to hope at least for a civil reception. My confidence was fully justified in the result. I shall never forget my first interview with this great man. I was accompanied to the executive mansion and introduced to President Lincoln by Senator Pomeroy. The room in which he received visitors was the one now used by the President's secretaries. I entered it with a moderate estimate of my own consequence, and yet there I was to talk with, and even to advise, the head man of a great nation. Happily for me, there was no vain pomp and ceremony about him. I was never more quickly or more completely put at ease in the presence of a great man, than in that of Abraham Lincoln. He was seated, when I entered, in a low armchair, with his feet extended on the floor, surrounded by a large number of documents, and several busy secretaries. The room bore the marks of business, and the persons in it, the President included, appeared to be much overworked and tired. Long lines of care were already deeply written on Mr. Lincoln's brow, and his strong face, full of earnestness, lighted up as soon as my name was mentioned. As I approached and was introduced to him, he rose and extended his hand, and bade me welcome. I at once felt myself in the presence of an honest man, one whom I could love, 386 honor, and trust without reserve or doubt. Proceeding to tell him who I was, and what I was doing, he promptly, but kindly, stopped me, saying, I know who you are, Mr. Douglas, Mr. Seward has told me all about you. Sit down. I am glad to see you. I then told him the object of my visit that I was assisting to raise colored troops. 
that several months before I had been very successful in getting men to enlist, but that now it was not easy to induce the colored men to enter the service. Because there was a feeling among them that the government did not deal fairly with them in several respects. Mr. Lincoln asked me to state particulars. I replied that there were three particulars which I wished to bring to his attention. First, that colored soldiers ought to receive the same wages as those paid to white soldiers. Second, that colored soldiers ought to receive the same protection when taken prisoners, and be exchanged as readily, and on the same terms, as any other prisoners, and if Jefferson Davis should shoot or hang colored soldiers in cold blood. The United States government should retaliate in kind and degree without delay upon Confederate prisoners in its hands. Third, when colored soldiers, seeking the bauble reputation at the cannon's mouth, performed great and uncommon service on the battlefield, they should be rewarded by distinction and promotion. Precisely as white soldiers are rewarded for like services. Mr. Lincoln listened with patience and silence to all I had to say. He was serious and even troubled by what I had said, and by what he had evidently thought himself before upon the same points. He impressed me with the solid gravity of his character, by his silent listening not less than by his earnest reply to my words. He began by saying that the employment of colored troops at all was a great gain to the colored people. That the measure could not have been successfully adopted at the beginning of the war, that the wisdom of making colored men soldiers was still doubted, that their enlistment was a serious offense 387 to popular prejudice. That they had larger motives for being soldiers than white men, that they ought to be willing to enter the service upon any conditions. That the fact that they were not to receive the same pay as white soldiers, seemed a necessary concession to smooth the way to their employment at all as soldiers, but that ultimately they would receive the same. On the second point, in respect to equal protection, he said the case was more difficult. Retaliation was a terrible remedy, and one which it was very difficult to apply, one which if once begun, there was no telling where it would end. That if he could get hold of the Confederate soldiers who had been guilty of treating colored soldiers as felons, he could easily retaliate, but the thought of hanging men for a crime perpetrated by others, was revolting to his feelings. He thought that the rebels themselves would stop such barbarous warfare, and less evil would be done if retaliation were not resorted to. That he had already received information that colored soldiers were being treated as prisoners of war. In all this I saw the tender heart of the man rather than the stern warrior and commander-in-chief of the American Army and Navy, and while I could not agree with him, I could but respect his humane spirit. On the third point he appeared to have less difficulty, though he did not absolutely commit himself. He simply said that he would sign any commission to colored soldiers whom his Secretary of War should commend to him. Though I was not entirely satisfied with his views, I was so well satisfied with the man and with the educating tendency of the conflict, I determined to go on with the recruiting. From the President, I went to see Secretary Stanton. The manner of no two men could be more widely different. I was introduced by Assistant Secretary Dana, whom I had known many years before at Brook Farm, Massachusetts, and afterwards as managing editor of the New York Tribune. Every line in Mr. Stanton's face told me that my communication with him must be brief, clear, and to the point, that he might turn his back 388 upon me as a bore at any moment, that politeness was not one of his weaknesses. His first glance was that of a man who says, Well, what do you want? I have no time to waste upon you or anybody else, and I shall waste none. Speak quick, or I shall leave you. The man and the place seemed alike busy. Seeing I had no time to lose, I hastily went over the ground I had gone over to President Lincoln. As I ended, I was surprised by seeing a changed man before me. Contempt and suspicion, and brusqueness, had all disappeared from his face and manner, and for a few minutes he made the best defense that I had then heard from any body of the treatment of colored soldiers by the government. I was not satisfied, yet I left in the full belief that the true course to the black man's freedom and citizenship was over the battlefield, and that my business was to get every black man I could into the Union armies. Both the President and Secretary of War assured me that justice would ultimately be done my race, and I gave full faith and credit to their promise. On assuring Mr. 
Stanton of my willingness to take a commission, he said he would make me assistant adjutant to General Thomas, who was then recruiting and organizing troops in the Mississippi Valley. He asked me how soon I could be ready. I told him in two weeks, and that my commission might be sent me to Rochester. For some reason, however, my commission never came. The government, I fear, was still clinging to the idea that positions of honor in the service should be occupied by white men, and that it would not do to inaugurate just then the policy of perfect equality. I wrote to the department for my commission, but was simply told to report to General Thomas. This was so different from what I expected and from what I had been promised, that I wrote to Secretary Stanton that I would report to General Thomas on receipt of my commission, but it did not come. And I did not go to the Mississippi Valley as I had fondly hoped. I knew too much of camp life and the value of shoulder straps in the army to go into the service without some visible mark of my rank. I 389 have no doubt that Mr. Stanton in the moment of our meeting meant all he said, but thinking the matter over he felt that the time had not then come for a step so radical and aggressive. Meanwhile my three sons were in the service. Lewis and Charles, as already named, in the Massachusetts regiments and Frederick recruiting colored troops in the Mississippi Valley. Chapter 12. Hope for the Nation. Proclamation of Emancipation, its reception in Boston, objections brought against it, its effect on the country, interview with President Lincoln, New York riots, re-election of Mr. Lincoln, his inauguration, and inaugural, Vice President Johnson, presidential reception, the fall of Richmond, Faneuil Hall, the assassination, condolence. The 1st of January, 1863, was a memorable day in the progress of American liberty and civilization. It was the turning point in the conflict between freedom and slavery. A death blow was then given to the slaveholding rebellion. Until then the federal arm had been more than tolerant to that relict of barbarism. It had defended it inside the slave states, it had countermanded the emancipation policy of John C. Fremont in Missouri. It had returned slaves to their so-called owners, and had threatened that any attempt on the part of the slaves to gain their freedom by insurrection, or otherwise, would be put down with an iron hand. It had even refused to allow the Hutchinson family to sing their anti-slavery songs in the camps of the Army of the Potomac, it had surrounded the houses of slaveholders with bayonets for their protection and through its Secretary of War, William H. Seward, had given notice to the world that, however the war for the Union might terminate, no change would be made in the relation of master and slave. Upon this pro-slavery platform the war against the rebellion had been waged during more than two years. It had not been a war of conquest, but rather a war of conciliation. McClellan, in command of the army, had been trying, apparently, to put down the rebellion without hurting the rebels, certainly without hurting slavery, and the government had seemed to cooperate with him in both 391 respects. Charles Sumner, William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, Garrett Smith, and the whole anti-slavery phalanx at the North, had denounced this policy, and had besought Mr. Lincoln to adopt an opposite one, but in vain. Generals, in the field, and councils in the cabinet, had persisted in advancing this policy through defeats and disasters, even to the verge of ruin. We fought the rebellion, but not its cause. The key to the situation was the four million of slaves, yet the slave who loved us, was hated, and the slaveholder who hated us, was loved. We kissed the hand that smote us, and spurned the hand that helped us. When the means of victory were before us, within our grasp, we went in search of the means of defeat. And now, on this day of January 1, 1863, the formal and solemn announcement was made that thereafter the government would be found on the side of emancipation. This proclamation changed everything. It gave a new direction to the councils of the cabinet, and to the conduct of the national arms. I shall leave to the statesman, the philosopher, and historian, the more comprehensive discussion of this document, and only tell how it touched me, and those in like condition with me at the time. I was in Boston, and its reception there may indicate the importance attached to it elsewhere. An immense assembly convened in Tremont Temple to await the first flash of the electric wires announcing the new departure. Two years of war prosecuted in the interests of slavery, had made free speech possible in Boston, 
and we were now met together to receive and celebrate the first utterance of the long hope for proclamation, if it came, and, if it did not come. To speak our minds freely. For, in view of the past, it was by no means certain that it would come. The occasion, therefore, was one of both hope and fear. Our ship was on the open sea, tossed by a terrible storm. Wave after wave was passing over us, and every hour was fraught with increasing peril. Whether we should survive or perish, depended in large measure upon the coming of this proclamation. At least so we felt. Although the conditions 392 on which Mr. Lincoln had promised to withhold it, had not been complied with, yet, from many considerations, there was room to doubt and fear. Mr. Lincoln was known to be a man of tender heart, and boundless patience, no man could tell to what length he might go, or might refrain from going in the direction of peace and reconciliation. Hitherto, he had not shown himself a man of heroic measures, and, properly enough, this step belonged to that class. It must be the end of all compromises with slavery, a declaration that thereafter the war was to be conducted on a new principle, with a new aim. It would be a full and fair assertion that the government would neither trifle, or be trifled with any longer. But would it come? On the side of doubt, it was said that Mr. Lincoln's kindly nature might cause him to relent at the last moment. That Mrs. Lincoln, coming from an old slaveholding family, would influence him to delay, and give the slaveholders one other chance. Every moment of waiting chilled our hopes, and strengthened our fears. A line of messengers was established between the telegraph office and the platform of Tremont Temple, and the time was occupied with brief speeches from Honorable Thomas Russell of Plymouth, Miss Anna E. Dickinson, a lady of marvelous eloquence, Rev. Mr. Grimes, J. Sella Martin, William Wells Brown, and myself. But speaking or listening to speeches was not the thing for which the people had come together. The time for argument was past. It was not logic, but the trump of jubilee, which everybody wanted to hear. We were waiting and listening as for a bolt from the sky, which should rend the fetters of four million of slaves. We were watching, as it were, by the dim light of the stars, for the dawn of a new day, we were longing for the answer to the agonizing prayers of centuries. Remembering those in bonds as bound with them, we wanted to join in the shout for freedom, and in the anthem of the redeemed. I have reason to know that this supposition did Mrs. Lincoln great injustice. Eight, nine, ten o'clock came and went, and still no word. A visible shadow seemed falling on the expecting throng, which the confident utterances of the speakers sought in vain to dispel. At last, when patience was well nigh exhausted, and suspense was becoming agony, a man, I think it was Judge Russell, with hasty step advanced through the crowd, and with a face fairly illumined with the news he bore. Exclaimed in tones that thrilled all hearts, It is coming. It is on the wires. The effect of this announcement was startling beyond description, and the scene was wild and grand. Joy and gladness exhausted all forms of expression from shouts of praise, to sobs and tears. My old friend Rue, a colored preacher, a man of wonderful vocal power, expressed the heartfelt emotion of the hour, when he led all voices in the anthem, sound the loud timbrel o'er Egypt's dark sea, Jehovah hath triumphed, his people are free. About twelve o'clock, seeing there was no disposition to retire from the hall, which must be vacated, my friend Grimes, of blessed memory, rose and moved that the meeting adjourn to the Twelfth Baptist Church, of which he was pastor. And soon that church was packed from doors to pulpit, and this meeting did not break up till near the dawn of day. It was one of the most affecting and thrilling occasions I ever witnessed, and a worthy celebration of the first step on the part of the nation in its departure from the thraldom of ages. There was evidently no disposition on the part of this meeting to criticize the proclamation, nor was there with any one at first. At the moment we saw only its anti-slavery side. But further and more critical examination showed it to be extremely defective. It was not a proclamation of liberty throughout all the land, unto all the inhabitants thereof, such as we had hoped it would be. But was one marked by discriminations and reservations. Its operation was confined within certain geographical and military lines. 
It only abolished slavery where it did not exist, and left it intact where it did exist. It was a measure apparently inspired by the Law Motive 394 of military necessity, and by so far as it was so, it would become inoperative and useless when military necessity should cease. There was much said in this line, and much that was narrow and erroneous. For my own part, I took the proclamation, first and last, for a little more than it purported, and saw in its spirit, a life and power far beyond its letter. Its meaning to me was the entire abolition of slavery, wherever the evil could be reached by the federal arm, and I saw that its moral power would extend much further. It was in my estimation an immense gain to have the war for the Union committed to the extinction of slavery, even from a military necessity. It is not a bad thing to have individuals or nations do right though they do so from selfish motives. I approved the one spur wisdom of Paddy, who thought if he could get one side of his horse to go, he could trust the speed of the other side. The effect of the proclamation abroad was highly beneficial to the loyal cause. Disinterested parties could now see in it a benevolent character. It was no longer a mere strife for territory and dominion, but a contest of civilization against barbarism. The proclamation itself was like Mr. Lincoln throughout. It was framed with a view to the least harm and the most good possible in the circumstances, and with a special consideration of the latter. It was thoughtful, cautious, and well guarded at all points. While he hated slavery, and really desired its destruction, he always proceeded against it in a manner the least likely to shock or drive from him any who were truly in sympathy with the preservation of the Union, but who were not friendly to emancipation. For this he kept up the distinction between loyal and disloyal slaveholders, and discriminated in favor of the one, as against the other. In a word, in all that he did, or attempted, he made it manifest that the one great and all-commanding object with him, was the peace and preservation of the Union, and that this was the motive and mainspring of all his measures. His wisdom and moderation at this point were for a season useful to the 395 loyal cause in the border states, but it may be fairly questioned, whether it did not chill the Union ardor of the loyal people of the North in some degree. And diminish rather than increase the sum of our power against the rebellion, for moderate cautions and guarded as was this proclamation it created a howl of indignation and wrath amongst the rebels and their allies. The old cry was raised by the copperhead organs of, an abolition war, and a pretext was thus found for an excuse for refusing to enlist, and for marshalling all the negro prejudice of the North on the rebel side. Men could say they were willing to fight for the Union, but that they were not willing to fight for the freedom of the negroes, and thus it was made difficult to procure enlistments or to enforce the draft. This was especially true of New York, where there was a large Irish population. The attempt to enforce the draft in that city was met by mobs, riot, and bloodshed. There is perhaps no darker chapter in the whole history of the war, than this cowardly and bloody uprising in July, 1863. For three days and nights New York was in the hands of a ferocious mob, and there was not sufficient power in the government of the country or of the city itself, to stay the hand of violence, and the effusion of blood. Though this mob was nominally against the draft which had been ordered, it poured out its fiercest wrath upon the colored people and their friends. It spared neither age nor sex. It hanged Negroes simply because they were Negroes, it murdered women in their homes, and burned their homes over their heads, it dashed out the brains of young children against the lamp posts, it burned the colored orphan asylum. A noble charity on the corner of Fifth Avenue. And scarce allowing time for the helpless two hundred children to make good their escape, plundering the building of every valuable piece of furniture. And colored men, women, and children were forced to seek concealment in cellars or garrets or wheresoever else it could be found until this high carnival of crime and reign of terror should pass away. In connection with G.O.L. Stearns, Thomas Webster, and 396 Colonel Wagner, I had been at Camp William Penn, Philadelphia, assisting in the work of filling up the colored regiments, and was on my way home from there just as these events were transpiring in New York. I was met by a friend at Newark who informed me of this condition of things. I, however, pressed on my way to the Chambers Street station of the Hudson River Railroad in safety, the mob being in the upper part of the city, fortunately for me, for not only my color. 
but my known activity in procuring enlistments would have made me especially obnoxious to its murderous spirit. This was not the first time I had been in imminent peril in New York City. My first arrival there, after my escape from slavery, was full of danger. My passage through its borders after the attack of John Brown on Harper's Ferry was scarcely less safe. I had encountered Isaiah Rinders and his gang of ruffians in the old Broadway tabernacle at our anti-slavery anniversary meeting, and I knew something of the crazy temper of such crowds. But this anti-draft, anti-Negro mob was something more and something worse, it was a part of the rebel force, without the rebel uniform, but with all its deadly hate, it was the fire of the enemy opened in the rear of the loyal army. Such men as Franklin Pierce and Horatio Seymour had done much in their utterances to encourage resistance to the drafts. Seymour was then governor of the state of New York, and while the mob was doing its deadly work he addressed them as, my friends, telling them to desist then, while he could arrange at Washington to have the draft arrested. Had Governor Seymour been loyal to his country, and to his country's cause, in this her moment of need, he would have burned his tongue with a red-hot iron sooner than allow it to call these thugs, thieves, and murderers his friends. My interviews with President Lincoln and his able secretary, before narrated, greatly increased my confidence in the anti-slavery integrity of the government. Although I confess I was greatly disappointed at my failure to receive the commission promised me by Secretary Stanton. I, however, faithfully 397 believed, and loudly proclaimed my belief, that the rebellion would be suppressed, the Union preserved, the slaves emancipated, and the colored soldiers would in the end have justice done them. This confidence was immeasurably strengthened when I saw General George B. McClellan relieved from the command of the Army of the Potomac and Gen. S. Grant placed at its head, and in command of all the armies of the United States. My confidence in General Grant was not entirely due to the brilliant military successes achieved by him, but there was a moral as well as military basis for my faith in him. He had shown his single-mindedness and superiority to popular prejudice by his prompt cooperation with President Lincoln in his policy of employing colored troops, and his order commanding his soldiers to treat such troops with due respect. In this way he proved himself to be not only a wise general, but a great man, one who could adjust himself to new conditions, and adopt the lessons taught by the events of the hour. This quality in General Grant was and is made all the more conspicuous and striking in contrast with his West Point education and his former political associations. For neither West Point nor the Democratic Party have been good schools in which to learn justice and fair play to the Negro. It was when General Grant was fighting his way through the wilderness to Richmond, on the line, he meant to pursue, if it took all summer, and every reverse to his arms was made the occasion for a fresh demand for peace without emancipation. That President Lincoln did me the honor to invite me to the executive mansion for a conference on the situation. I need not say I went most gladly. The main subject on which he wished to confer with me was as to the means most desirable to be employed outside the army to induce the slaves in the rebel states to come within the federal lines. The increasing opposition to the war, in the North, and the mad cry against it, because it was being made an abolition war, alarmed Mr. Lincoln, and made him apprehensive 398 that a peace might be forced upon him which would leave still in slavery all who had not come within our lines. What he wanted was to make his proclamation as effective as possible in the event of such a peace. He said in a regretful tone, the slaves are not coming so rapidly and so numerously to us as I had hoped. I replied that the slaveholders knew how to keep such things from their slaves, and probably very few knew of his proclamation. Well, he said, I want you to set about devising some means of making them acquainted with it, and for bringing them into our lines. He spoke with great earnestness and much solicitude, and seemed troubled by the attitude of Mr. Greeley, and the growing impatience there was being manifested through the North at the war. He said he was being accused of protracting the war beyond its legitimate object, and of failing to make peace, when he might have done so to advantage. He was afraid of what might come of all these complaints, but was persuaded that no solid and lasting peace could come short of absolute submission on the part of the rebels. And he was not for giving them rest by feudal conferences at Niagara Falls, or elsewhere, with unauthorized persons. He saw the danger of premature peace, 
and, like a thoughtful and sagacious man as he was, he wished to provide means of rendering such consummation as harmless as possible. I was the more impressed by this benevolent consideration because he before said, in answer to the peace clamor, that his object was to save the Union, and to do so with or without slavery. What he said on this day showed a deeper moral conviction against slavery than I had even seen before in anything spoken or written by him. I listened with the deepest interest and profoundest satisfaction, and, at his suggestion, agreed to undertake the organizing a band of scouts, composed of colored men, whose business should be somewhat after the original plan of John Brown. To go into the rebel states, beyond the lines of our armies, and carry the news of emancipation, and urged the slaves to come within our boundaries. This plan, however, was very soon rendered unnecessary by the success of the war in the wilderness and elsewhere, and by its termination in the complete abolition of slavery. I refer to this conversation because I think it is evidence conclusive on Mr. Lincoln's part that the proclamation, so far at least as he was concerned, was not effected merely as a necessity. An incident occurred during this interview which illustrates the character of this great man, though the mention of it may savor a little of vanity on my part. While in conversation with him his secretary twice announced, Governor Buckingham of Connecticut, one of the noblest and most patriotic of the loyal governors. Mr. Lincoln said, Tell Governor Buckingham to wait, for I want to have a long talk with my friend Frederick Douglass. I interposed, and begged him to see the governor at once, as I could wait. But no, he persisted he wanted to talk with me, and Governor Buckingham could wait. This was probably the first time in the history of this republic when its chief magistrate found occasion or disposition to exercise such an act of impartiality between persons so widely different in their positions and supposed claims upon his attention. From the manner of the governor, when he was finally admitted, I inferred that he was as well satisfied with what Mr. Lincoln had done, or had omitted to do, as I was. I have often said elsewhere what I wish to repeat here, that Mr. Lincoln was not only a great president, but a great man, too great to be small in anything. In his company I was never in any way reminded of my humble origin, or of my unpopular color. While I am, as it may seem, bragging of the kind consideration which I have reason to believe that Mr. Lincoln entertained towards me, I may mention one thing more. At the door of my friend John A. Gray, where I was stopping in Washington, I found one afternoon the carriage of Secretary Dole, and a messenger from President Lincoln with an invitation for me to take tea with him at the Soldiers' 400 home, where he then passed his nights. Riding out after the business of the day was over at the Executive Mansion. Unfortunately I had an engagement to speak that evening, and having made it one of the rules of my conduct in life never to break an engagement if possible to keep it, I felt obliged to decline the honor. I have often regretted that I did not make this an exception to my general rule. Could I have known that no such opportunity could come to me again, should have justified myself in disappointing a large audience for the sake of such a visit with Abraham Lincoln. It is due perhaps to myself to say here that I did not take Mr. Lincoln's attentions as due to my merits or personal qualities. While I have no doubt that Messrs. Seward and Chase had spoken well of me to him, and the fact of my having been a slave, and gained my freedom, and of having picked up some sort of an education, and being in some sense a self-made man. And having made myself useful as an advocate of the claims of my people, gave me favor in his eyes. Yet I am quite sure that the main thing which gave me consideration with him was my well-known relation to the colored people of the Republic. And especially the help which that relation enabled me to give to the work of suppressing the rebellion and of placing the Union on a firmer basis than it ever had or could have sustained in the days of slavery. So long as there was any hope whatsoever of the success of rebellion, there was of course a corresponding fear that a new lease of life would be granted to slavery. The proclamation of Fremont in Missouri, the letter of Phelps in the Department of the Gulf, the enlistment of colored troops by General Hunter, the contraband letter of General B. F. Butler, the soldierly qualities surprisingly displayed by colored soldiers in the terrific battles of Port Hudson, Vicksburg, Morris Island, and elsewhere, the Emancipation Proclamation by Abraham Lincoln had given slavery many in deadly wounds. Yet it was in fact only wounded and crippled, not disabled and killed. 
With this condition of national affairs came the summer 401 of 1864, and with it the revived Democratic Party, with the story in its mouth that the war was a failure, and with General George B. McClellan, the greatest failure of the war, as its candidate for the presidency. It is needless to say that the success of such a party, on such a platform, with such a candidate, at such a time would have been a fatal calamity. All that had been done toward suppressing the rebellion and abolishing slavery would have proved of no avail, and the final settlement between the two sections of the Republic, touching slavery and the right of secession, would have been left to tear and rend the country again at no distant future. It was said that this Democratic Party, which under Mr. Buchanan had betrayed the government into the hands of secession and treason, was the only party which could restore the country to peace and union. No doubt it would have patched up a peace, but it would have been a peace more to be dreaded than war. So at least I felt and worked. When we were thus asked to exchange Abraham Lincoln for McClellan, a successful Union president for an unsuccessful Union general, a party earnestly endeavoring to save the Union, torn and rent by a gigantic rebellion, I thought with Mr. Lincoln, that it was not wise to swap horses while crossing a stream. Regarding, as I did, the continuance of the war to the complete suppression of the rebellion, and the retention in office of President Lincoln as essential to the total destruction of slavery, I certainly exerted myself to the uttermost. In my small way, to secure his re-election. This most important object was not attained, however, by speeches, letters, or other electioneering appliances. The staggering blows dealt upon the rebellion that year by the armies under Grant and Sherman, and his own great character, ground all opposition to dust, and made his election sure, even before the question reached the polls. Since William the Silent, who was the soul of the mighty war for religious liberty against Spain and the Spanish Inquisition, no leader of men has been loved and trusted in such generous measure as Abraham Lincoln. 402 His election silenced, in a good degree, the discontent felt at the length of the war, and the complaints of its being an abolition war. Every victory of our arms, on flood and field, was a rebuke to McClellan and the Democratic Party, and an endorsement of Abraham Lincoln for president, and his new policy. It was my good fortune to be present at his inauguration in March, and to hear on that occasion his remarkable inaugural address. On the night previous I took tea with Chief Justice Chase, and assisted his beloved daughter, Mrs. Sprague, in placing over her honored father's shoulders the new robe, then being made, in which he was to administer the oath of office to the re-elected president. There was a dignity and grandeur about the Chief Justice which marked him as one born great. He had known me in early anti-slavery days, and had conquered his race prejudice, if he ever had any. At any rate, he had welcomed me to his home and his table, when to do so was a strange thing in Washington, and the fact was by no means an insignificant one. The inauguration, like the election, was a most important event. For years before, after Mr. Lincoln's first election, the pro-slavery spirit determined against his inauguration, and it no doubt would have accomplished its purpose had he attempted to pass openly and recognized through Baltimore. There was murder in the air then, and there was murder in the air now. His first inauguration arrested the fall of the Republic, and the second was to restore it to enduring foundations. At the time of the second inauguration the rebellion was apparently vigorous, defiant, and formidable, but in reality weak, dejected, and desperate. It had reached that verge of madness when it had called upon the Negro for help to fight against the freedom which he so longed to find, for the bondage he would escape, against Lincoln the Emancipator for Davis the Enslaver. But desperation discards logic as well as law, and the South was desperate. Sherman was marching to the sea, and Virginia with its rebel capital was in the firm grip of Ulysses S. Grant. To those who knew the 403 situation it was evident that unless some startling change was made the Confederacy had but a short time to live, and that time full of misery. This condition of things made the air at Washington dark and lowering. The friends of the Confederate cause here were neither few nor insignificant. They were among the rich and influential. A wink or a nod from such men might unchain the hand of violence and set order and law at defiance. To those who saw beneath the surface it was clearly perceived that there was danger abroad. 
And as the procession passed down Pennsylvania Avenue, I for one felt an instinctive apprehension that at any moment a shot from some assassin in the crowd might end the glittering pageant and throw the country into the depths of anarchy. I did not then know, what has since become history, that the plot was already formed and its execution contemplated for that very day, which though several weeks delayed, at last accomplished its deadly work. Reaching the capital, I took my place in the crowd where I could see the presidential procession as it came upon the east portico, and where I could hear and see all that took place. There was no such throng as that which celebrated the inauguration of President Garfield, nor that of President Rutherford B. Hayes. The whole proceeding was wonderfully quiet, earnest, and solemn. From the oath, as administered by Chief Justice Chase, to the brief but weighty address delivered by Mr. Lincoln, there was a leaden stillness about the crowd. The address sounded more like a sermon than a state paper. In the fewest words possible it referred to the condition of the country four years before, on his first accession to the presidency, to the causes of the war, and the reasons on both sides for which it had been waged. Neither party, he said, expected for the war the magnitude or the duration which it had already attained. Neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with or even before the conflict itself should cease. Each looked for an easier triumph, and a result less fundamental and astounding. Then in a few short sentences, admitting the conviction that 404 slavery had been the offense which, in the providence of God, must needs come, and the war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came. He asks if there can be discerned in this any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in a loving God always ascribe to him. Fondly do we hope, he continued, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondman's two hundred and fifty years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. As was said three thousand years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle. And for his widow and his orphans, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. I know not how many times, and before how many people I have quoted these solemn words of our martyred president. They struck me at the time, and have seemed to me ever since to contain more vital substance than I have ever seen compressed in a space so narrow. Yet on this memorable occasion when I clapped my hands in gladness and thanksgiving at their utterance, I saw in the faces of many about me expressions of widely different emotion. On this inauguration day, while waiting for the opening of the ceremonies, I made a discovery in regard to the Vice President, Andrew Johnson. There are moments in the lives of most men, when the doors of their souls are open, and unconsciously to themselves, their true characters may be read by the observant eye. It was at such an instant I caught a glimpse of the real nature of this man, which all subsequent developments proved true. I was standing in the crowd by 405 the side of Mrs. Thomas J. Dorsey, when Mr. Lincoln touched Mr. Johnson, and pointed me out to him. The first expression which came to his face, and which I think was the true index of his heart, was one of bitter contempt and aversion. Seeing that I observed him, he tried to assume a more friendly appearance. But it was too late, it was useless to close the door when all within had been seen. His first glance was the frown of the man, the second was the bland and sickly smile of the demagogue. I turned to Mrs. Dorsey and said, whatever Andrew Johnson may be, he certainly is no friend of our race. No stronger contrast could well be presented between two men than between President Lincoln and Vice President Johnson on this day. Mr. Lincoln was like one who was treading the hard and thorny path of duty and self-denial, Mr. Johnson was like one just from a drunken debauch. The face of the one was full of manly humility, although at the topmost height of power and pride, the other was full of pomp and swaggering vanity. The fact was, though it was yet early in the day, Mr. Johnson was drunk. In the evening of the day of the inauguration, another new experience awaited me. 
The usual reception was given at the executive mansion, and though no colored persons had ever ventured to present themselves on such occasions, it seemed now that freedom had become the law of the republic. Now that colored men were on the battlefield mingling their blood with that of white men in one common effort to save the country. It was not too great an assumption for a colored man to offer his congratulations to the president with those of other citizens. I decided to go, and sought in vain for someone of my own color to accompany me. It is never an agreeable experience to go where there can be any doubt of welcome, and my colored friends had too often realized discomfiture from this cause to be willing to subject themselves to such unhappiness. They wished me to go, as my New England colored friends in the long ago liked very well to have me 406 take passage on the first-class cars, and be hauled out and pounded by rough-handed brake men, to make way for them. It was plain, then, that someone must lead the way, and that if the colored man would have his rights, he must take them. And now, though it was plainly quite the thing for me to attend President Lincoln's reception, they all with one accord began to make excuse. It was finally arranged that Mrs. Dorsey should bear me company, so together we joined in the grand procession of citizens from all parts of the country, and moved slowly towards the executive mansion. I had for some time looked upon myself as a man, but now in this multitude of the elite of the land, I felt myself a man among men. I regret to be obliged to say, however, that this comfortable assurance was not of long duration, for on reaching the door, two policemen stationed there took me rudely by the arm and ordered me to stand back. For their directions were to admit no persons of my color. The reader need not be told that this was a disagreeable setback. But once in the battle, I did not think it well to submit to repulse. I told the officers I was quite sure there must be some mistake, for no such order could have emanated from President Lincoln, and if he knew I was at the door he would desire my admission. They then, to put an end to the parley, as I suppose, for we were obstructing the doorway, and were not easily pushed aside, assumed an air of politeness, and offered to conduct me in. We followed their lead, and soon found ourselves walking some planks out of a window, which had been arranged as a temporary passage for the exit of visitors. We halted so soon as we saw the trick, and I said to the officers, You have deceived me. I shall not go out of this building till I see President Lincoln. At this moment a gentleman who was passing in, recognized me, and I said to him, Be so kind as to say to Mr. Lincoln that Frederick Douglass is detained by officers at the door. It was not long before Mrs. Dorsey and I walked into the spacious East Room, amid a scene of elegance such as in this country I had never witnessed before. Point four o seven, like a mountain pine high above all others, Mr. Lincoln stood, in his grand simplicity, and homelike beauty. Recognizing me, even before I reached him, he exclaimed, so that all around could hear him, Here comes my friend Douglas. Taking me by the hand, he said, I am glad to see you. I saw you in the crowd today, listening to my inaugural address, how did you like it? I said, Mr. Lincoln, I must not detain you with my poor opinion, when there are thousands waiting to shake hands with you. No, no, he said, you must stop a little, Douglas, there is no man in the country whose opinion I value more than yours. I want to know what you think of it. I replied, Mr. Lincoln, that was a sacred effort. I am glad you liked it. He said, and I passed on, feeling that any man, however distinguished, might well regard himself honored by such expressions, from such a man. It came out that the officers at the White House had received no orders from Mr. Lincoln, or from anyone else. They were simply complying with an old custom, the outgrowth of slavery, as dogs will sometimes rub their necks, long after their collars are removed, thinking they are still there. My colored friends were well pleased with what had seemed to them a doubtful experiment, and I believe were encouraged by its success to follow my example. I have found in my experience that the way to break down an unreasonable custom, is to contradict it in practice. To be sure in pursuing this course I have had to contend not merely with the white race, but with the black. The one has condemned me for my presumption in daring to associate with them, and the other for pushing myself where they take it for granted I am not wanted. I am pained to think that the latter objection springs largely from a consciousness of inferiority, 
for as colors alone can have nothing against each other, and the conditions of human association are founded upon character rather than color. And character depends upon mind and morals, there can be nothing blameworthy in people thus equal in meeting each other on the plane of civil or social rights. A series of important events followed soon after the second inauguration of Mr. Lincoln, conspicuous amongst which was the fall of Richmond. The strongest endeavor, and the best generalship of the rebellion was employed to hold that place, and when it fell the pride, prestige, and power of the rebellion fell with it, never to rise again. The news of this great event found me again in Boston. The enthusiasm of that loyal city cannot be easily described. As usual when anything touches the great heart of Boston, Faneuil Hall became vocal and eloquent. This hall is an immense building, and its history is correspondingly great. It has been the theater of much patriotic declamation from the days of the Revolution and before. As it has since my day been the scene, where the strongest efforts of the most popular orators of Massachusetts have been made. Here Webster the Great, expounder, addressed the sea of upturned faces. Here Choate, the wonderful Boston barrister, by his weird, electric eloquence, enchained his thousands, here Everett charmed with his classic periods the flower of Boston aristocracy, and here, too, Charles Sumner, Horace Mann, John A. Andrew, and Wendell Phillips, the last superior to most, and equal to any, have for forty years spoken their great words for justice, liberty, and humanity, sometimes in the calm and sunshine of unruffled peace. But oftener in the tempest and whirlwind of mobocratic violence. It was here that Mr. Phillips made his famous speech in denunciation of the murder of Elijah P. Lovejoy in 1837, which changed the whole current of his life and made him preeminently the leader of anti slavery thought in New England. Here too Theodore Parker, whose early death not only Boston, but the lovers of liberty throughout the world, still mourn, gave utterance to his deep and life-giving thoughts in words of fullness and power. But I set out to speak of the meeting which was held there, in celebration of the fall of Richmond, for it was a meeting as remarkable for its composition, as for its occasion. Among the speakers by whom it was addressed, and who gave voice to 409 the patriotic sentiments which filled and overflowed each loyal heart, were Honorable Henry Wilson, and Honorable Robert C. Winthrop. It would be difficult to find two public men more distinctly opposite than these. If any one may properly boast an aristocratic descent, or if there be any value or worth in that boast, Robert C. Winthrop may without undue presumption, avail himself of it. He was born in the midst of wealth and luxury, and never felt the flint of hardship or the grip of poverty. Just the opposite to this was the experience of Henry Wilson. The son of common people, wealth and education had done little for him, but he had in him a true heart, and a world of common sense. And these with industry, good habits, and perseverance, had carried him further and lifted him higher, than the brilliant man with whom he formed such striking contrast. Winthrop, before the war, like many others of his class, had resisted the anti-slavery current of his state, had sided largely with the demands of the slave power, had abandoned many of his old Whig friends. When they went for free soil and free men in 1848, and gone into the Democratic Party. During the war he was too good to be a rebel sympathizer, and not quite good enough to become as Wilson was, a power in the Union cause. Wilson had risen to eminence by his devotion to liberal ideas, while Winthrop had sunken almost to obscurity from his indifference to such ideas. But now either himself or his friends, most likely the latter, thought that the time had come when some word implying interest in the loyal cause should fall from his lips. It was not so much the need of the Union, as the need of himself, that he should speak. The time when the Union needed him, and all others, was when the slaveholding rebellion raised its defiant head, not when as now, that head was in the dust and ashes of defeat and destruction. But the beloved Winthrop, the proud representative of what Daniel Webster once called the solid men of Boston, had great need to speak now. It had been no fault of the loyal cause that he had not spoken sooner. Four hundred and ten its gates like those of heaven stood open night and day. If he did not come in, it was his own fault. Regiment after regiment, brigade after brigade, had passed over Boston Common to endure the perils and hardships of war. 
Governor Andrew had poured out his soul, and exhausted his wonderful powers of speech in patriotic words to the brave departing sons of old Massachusetts. And a word from Winthrop would have gone far to nerve up those young soldiers going forth to lay down their lives for the life of the Republic. But no word came. See on. Yet now in the last quarter of the eleventh hour, when the day's work was nearly done, Robert C. Winthrop was seen standing upon the same platform with the veteran Henry Wilson. He was there in all his native grace and dignity, elegantly and aristocratically clothed, his whole bearing marking his social sphere as widely different from many present. Happy for his good name, and for those who shall bear it when he is no longer among the living, that he was found even at the last hour, in the right place, in old Faneuil Hall, side by side with plain Henry Wilson, the shoemaker senator. But this was not the only contrast on that platform on that day. It was my strange fortune to follow Mr. Winthrop on this interesting occasion. I remembered him as the guest of John H. Clifford of New Bedford, afterwards governor of Massachusetts, when twenty-five years before, I had been only a few months from slavery, I was behind his chair as waiter. And was even then charmed by his elegant conversation, and now after this lapse of time, I found myself no longer behind the chair of this princely man, but announced to succeed him in the order of speakers, before that brilliant audience. I was not insensible to the contrast in our history and positions, and was curious to observe if it affected him, and how. To his credit I am happy to say he bore himself grandly throughout. His speech was fully up to the enthusiasm of the hour, and the great audience greeted his utterances with merited applause. I need not speak of the speeches of Henry Wilson and others, or of my own. The meeting was every way a 411 remarkable expression of popular feeling, created by a great and important event. After the fall of Richmond the collapse of the rebellion was not long delayed, though it did not perish without adding to its long list of atrocities one which sent a thrill of horror throughout the civilized world. In the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. A man so amiable, so kind, humane, and honest, that one is at a loss to know how he could have had an enemy on earth. The details of his taking off are too familiar to be more than mentioned here. The recently attempted assassination of James Abraham Garfield has made us all too painfully familiar with the shock and sensation produced by the hellblack crime, to make any description necessary. The curious will note that the Christian name of both men is the same, and that both were remarkable for their kind qualities, and for having risen by their own energies from among the people. And that both were victims of assassins at the beginning of a presidential term. Mr. Lincoln had reason to look forward to a peaceful and happy term of office. To all appearance, we were on the eve of a restoration of the Union, and a solid and lasting peace. He had served one term as President of the Disunited States, he was now for the first time to be President of the United States. Heavy had been his burden, hard had been his toil, bitter had been his trials, and terrible had been his anxiety. But the future seemed now bright and full of hope. Richmond had fallen, Grant had General Lee in the Army of Virginia firmly in his clutch. Sherman had fought and found his way from the banks of the Great River to the shores of the sea, leaving the two ends of the rebellion squirming and twisting in agony, like the severed parts of a serpent, doomed to inevitable death. And now there was but a little time longer for the good president to bear his burden, and be the target of reproach. His accusers, in whose opinion he was always too fast or too slow, too weak or too strong, too conciliatory or too aggressive, would soon become his admirers. For twelve it was soon to be seen that he had conducted the affairs of the nation with singular wisdom, and with absolute fidelity to the great trust confided in him. A country, redeemed and regenerated from the foulest crime against human nature that ever saw the sun. What a bright vision of peace, prosperity, and happiness must have come to that tired and overworked brain, and weary spirit. Men used to talk of his jokes, and he no doubt indulged them, but I seemed never to have the faculty of calling them to the surface. I saw him oftener than many who have reported him, but I never saw any levity in him. He always impressed me as a strong, earnest man, having no time or disposition to trifle, grappling with all his might the work he had in hand. The expression of his face was a blending of suffering with patience and fortitude. 
Men called him homely, and homely he was, but it was manifestly a human homeliness, for there was nothing of the tiger or other wild animal about him. His eyes had in them the tenderness of motherhood, and his mouth and other features the highest perfection of a genuine manhood. His picture, now before me in my study, by Marshall, corresponds well with the impression I have of him. But, alas! What are all good and great qualities, what are human hopes and human happiness to the revengeful hand of an assassin? What are sweet dreams of peace, what are visions of the future? A simple leaden bullet, and a few grains of powder, in the shortest limit of time, are sufficient to blast and ruin all that is precious in human existence, not alone of the murdered, but of the murderer. I write this in the deep gloom flung over my spirit by the cruel, wanton, and cold-blooded attempted assassination of Abraham Garfield, as well as that of Abraham Lincoln. I was in Rochester, N.Y. Where I then resided, when news of the death of Mr. Lincoln was received. Our citizens, not knowing what else to do in the agony of the hour, betook themselves to the city hall. Though all hearts ached for utterance, few felt like speaking. We were stunned and overwhelmed by a crime and calamity hitherto unknown to our 413 country and our government. The hour was hardly one for speech, for no speech could rise to the level of feeling. Dr. Robinson, then of Rochester University, but now of Brown University, Providence, our I, was prevailed upon to take the stand, and made one of the most touching and eloquent speeches I ever heard. At the close of his address, I was called upon, and spoke out of the fullness of my heart, and, happily, I gave expression to so much of the soul of the people present. That my voice was several times utterly silenced by the sympathetic tumult of the great audience. I had resided long in Rochester, and had made many speeches there which had more or less touched the hearts of my hearers, but never till this day was I brought into such close accord with them. We shared in common a terrible calamity, and this, touch of nature, made us, more than countrymen, it made us, kin. I sincerely regret that I have done Mr. Winthrop great injustice. This Faneuil Hall speech of his was not the first manifestation of his zealous interest in the loyal cause during the late war. While it is quite true that Mr. Winthrop was strongly against the anti-slavery movement at the North, his addresses and speeches delivered during the war, as they have come to my knowledge since writing the foregoing chapter prove him to have been among the most earnest in his support of the national government in its efforts to suppress the rebellion and to restore the Union. Frederick Douglass Chapter 13 Vast Changes Satisfaction and Anxiety, New Fields of Labor Opening, Lyceums and Colleges Soliciting Addresses, Literary Attractions, Pecuniary Gain, Still Pleading for Human Rights, President Andy Johnson, Colored Delegation, Their Reply to Him. National Loyalist Convention. 1866, and its procession, not wanted, meeting with an old friend, joy and surprise, the old master's welcome, and Miss Amanda's friendship, enfranchisement discussed, its accomplishment, the Negro a citizen. When the war for the Union was substantially ended, and peace had dawned upon the land as was the case almost immediately after the tragic death of President Lincoln. When the gigantic system of American slavery which had defied the march of time, resisted all the appeals and arguments of the abolitionists, and the humane testimonies of good men of every generation during 250 years, was finally abolished and forever prohibited by the organic law of the land. A strange and, perhaps, perverse feeling came over me. My great and exceeding joy over these stupendous achievements, especially over the abolition of slavery, which had been the deepest desire and the great labor of my life, was slightly tinged with a feeling of sadness. I felt I had reached the end of the noblest and best part of my life, my school was broken up, my church disbanded, and the beloved congregation dispersed, never to come together again. The anti-slavery platform had performed its work, and my voice was no longer needed. Othello's occupation was gone. The great happiness of meeting with my fellow workers was now to be among the things of memory. Then, too, some thought of my personal future came in. Like Daniel Webster, when asked by his friends to leave John Tyler's cabinet, I naturally inquired, where shall I go? For fifteen I was still in the midst of my years, 
and had something of life before me, and as the minister urged by my old friend George Bradburn to preach anti-slavery, when to do so was unpopular, said, it is necessary for ministers to live. I felt it was necessary for me to live, and to live honestly. But where should I go, and what should I do? I could not now take hold of life as I did when I first landed in New Bedford, twenty-five years before, I could not go to the wharf of either Gideon or George Howland, to Richmond's Brass Foundry, or Richardson's Candle and Oil Works. Load and unload vessels, or even ask Governor Clifford for a place as a servant. Rolling oil casks and shoveling coal were all well enough when I was younger, immediately after getting out of slavery. Doing this was a step up, rather than a step down. But all these avocations had had their day for me, and I had had my day for them. My public life and labors had unfitted me for the pursuits of my earlier years, and yet had not prepared me for more congenial and higher employment. Outside the question of slavery my thoughts had not been much directed, and I could hardly hope to make myself useful in any other cause than that to which I had given the best twenty-five years of my life. A man in the situation I found myself, has not only to divest himself of the old, which is never easily done, but to adjust himself to the new, which is still more difficult. Delivering lectures under various names, John B. Goff says, whatever may be the title, my lecture is always on temperance, and such is apt to be the case with any man who has devoted his time and thoughts to one subject for any considerable length of time. But what should I do, was the question. I had a few thousand dollars, a great convenience, and one not generally so highly prized by my people as it ought to be, saved from the sale of my bondage and my freedom, and the proceeds of my lectures at home and abroad. And with this sum I thought of following the noble example of my old friend Stephen and Abby Kelly Foster, purchase a little farm and settle myself down to earn an honest living by tilling the soil. 416 My children were all grown up, and ought to be able to take care of themselves. This question, however, was soon decided for me. I had after all acquired, a very unusual thing, a little more knowledge and aptitude fitting me for the new condition of things than I knew, and had a deeper hold upon public attention than I had supposed. Invitations began to pour in upon me from colleges, lyceums, and literary societies, offering me one hundred, and even two hundred dollars for a single lecture. I had, some time before, prepared a lecture on self-made men, and also one upon ethnology, with special reference to Africa. The latter had cost me much labor, though as I now look back upon it, it was a very defective production. I wrote it at the instance of my friend Dr. M. B. Anderson, president of Rochester University, himself a distinguished ethnologist, a deep thinker and scholar. I had been invited by one of the literary societies of Western Reserve College, then at Hudson, but recently removed to Cleveland, Ohio, to address it on commencement day. And never having spoken on such an occasion, never, indeed, having been myself inside of a schoolhouse for the purpose of an education, I hesitated about accepting the invitation, and finally called upon Prof. Henry Wayland, son of the great Dr. Wayland of Brown University, and on Dr. Anderson, and asked their advice whether I ought to accept. Both gentlemen advised me to do so. They knew me, and evidently thought well of my ability. But the puzzling question now was, what shall I say if I do go there? It won't do to give them an old-fashioned anti-slavery discourse. I learned afterwards that such a discourse was precisely what they needed, though not what they wished. For the faculty, including the president, was in great distress because I, a colored man, had been invited, and because of the reproach this circumstance might bring upon the college. But what shall I talk about? Became the difficult question. I finally hit upon the one before mentioned. I had read, when in England a few years before, with great interest, parts of 417 Dr. Pritchard's Natural History of Man, a large volume marvelously calm and philosophical in its discussion of the science of the origin of the races. And was thus in the line of my then convictions. I sought this valuable book at once in our bookstores, but could not obtain it anywhere in this country. I sent to England, where I paid the sum of seven and a half dollars for it. In addition to this valuable work, President Anderson kindly gave me a little book entitled, Man and His Migrations, 
by Dr. R. G. Latham, and loan me the large work of Dr. Morton the famous archaeologist, and that of Messrs. Knott and Glidden, the latter written evidently to degrade the Negro and support the then prevalent Calhoun doctrine of the rightfulness of slavery. With these books, and occasional suggestions from Dr. Anderson and Prof. Wayland, I set about preparing my commencement address. For many days and nights I toiled, and succeeded at last in getting something together in due form. Written orations had not been in my line. I had usually depended upon my unsystematized knowledge, and the inspiration of the hour and the occasion. But I had now got the scholar bee in my bonnet, and supposed that inasmuch as I was to speak to college professors and students, I must at least make a show of some familiarity with letters. It proved, as to its immediate effect, a great mistake, for my carefully studied and written address, full of learned quotations, fell dead at my feet, while a few remarks I made extemporaneously at collation, were enthusiastically received. Nevertheless, the reading and labor expended were of much value to me. They were needed steps preparatory to the work upon which I was about to enter. If they failed at the beginning, they helped to success in the end. My lecture on The Races of Men was seldom called for, but that on Self-Made Men was in great demand, especially through the West. I found that the success of a lecturer depends more upon the quality of his stock in store, than the amount. My friend, Wendell Phillips, for such I esteem him, who has said more cheering words to me, and in vindication of my 418 race, than any man now living, has delivered his famous lecture on the lost arts during the last forty years. And I doubt if among all his lectures, and he has many, there is one in such requisition as this. When Daniel O'Connell was asked why he did not make a new speech he playfully replied, that, it would take Ireland twenty years to learn his old ones. Upon some such consideration as this, I adhered pretty closely to my old lecture on, self-made men, retouching and shading it a little from time to time as occasion seemed to require. Here, then, was a new vocation before me, full of advantages, mentally and pecuniarily. When in the employment of the American Anti-Slavery Society, my salary was about $450 a year, and I felt I was well paid for my services. But I could now make from $50 to $100 a night, and have the satisfaction, too, that I was in some small measure helping to lift my race into consideration, for no man who lives at all, lives unto himself. He either helps or hinders all who are in any wise connected with him. I never rise to speak before an American audience without something of the feeling that my failure or success will bring blame or benefit to my whole race. But my activities were not now confined entirely to lectures before lyceums. Though slavery was abolished, the wrongs of my people were not ended. Though they were not slaves they were not yet quite free. No man can be truly free whose liberty is dependent upon the thought, feeling, and action of others and who has himself no means in his own hands for guarding, protecting, defending, and maintaining that liberty. Yet the Negro after his emancipation was precisely in this state of destitution. The law on the side of freedom is of great advantage only where there is power to make that law respected. I know no class of my fellow men, however just, enlightened, and humane, which can be wisely and safely trusted absolutely with the liberties of any other class. Protestants are excellent people, but it would not be wise for Catholics to depend entirely upon them to look after their rights and interests. Catholics are a 419 pretty good sort of people, though there is a soul-shuddering history behind them, yet no enlightened Protestants would commit their liberty to their care and keeping. And yet the government had left the freedmen in a worse condition than either of these. It felt that it had done enough for him. It had made him free, and henceforth he must make his own way in the world, or as the slang phrase has it, root, pig, or die, yet he had none of the conditions for self-preservation or self-protection. He was free from the individual master, but the slave of society. He had neither property, money, nor friends. He was free from the old plantation, but he had nothing but the dusty road under his feet. He was free from the old quarter that once gave him shelter, but a slave to the rains of summer and the frosts of winter. He was in a word literally turned loose naked, hungry, and destitute to the open sky. 
the first feeling towards him by the old master classes, was full of bitterness and wrath. They resented his emancipation as an act of hostility towards them, and since they could not punish the emancipator, they felt like punishing the object which that act had emancipated. Hence they drove him off the old plantation, and told him he was no longer wanted there. They not only hated him because he had been freed as a punishment to them, but because they felt that they had been robbed of his labor. An element of greater bitterness still came into their hearts, the freedman had been the friend of the government, and many of his class had borne arms against them during the war. The thought of paying cash for labor that they could formerly extort by the lash did not in any wise improve their disposition to the emancipated slave, or improve his own condition. Now, since poverty has, and can have no chance against wealth, the landless against the landowner, the ignorant against the intelligent, the freedman was powerless. He had nothing left him but a slavery distorted and diseased body, and lame and twisted limbs with which to fight the battle of life. I, therefore, soon found that the Negro had still a cause, and that he needed my voice and pen with others 420 to plead for it. The American Anti-Slavery Society, under the lead of Mr. Garrison, had disbanded, its newspapers were discontinued, its agents were withdrawn from the field, and all systematic efforts by abolitionists were abandoned. Many of the society, Mr. Phillips and myself amongst the number, differed from Mr. Garrison as to the wisdom of this course. I felt that the work of the society was not done, that it had not fulfilled its mission, which was not merely to emancipate, but to elevate the enslaved class, but against Mr. Garrison's leadership and the surprise and joy occasioned by the emancipation, it was impossible to keep the association alive. And the cause of the freedmen was left mainly to individual effort and to hastily extemporized societies of an ephemeral character, brought together under benevolent impulse, but having no history behind them, and being new to the work. They were not as effective for good as the old society would have been had it followed up its work and kept its old instrumentalities in operation. From the first I saw no chance of bettering the condition of the freedman, until he should cease to be merely a freedman, and should become a citizen. I insisted that there was no safety for him, or for anybody else in America, outside the American government, that to guard, protect, and maintain his liberty, the freedman should have the ballot. That the liberties of the American people were dependent upon the ballot box, the jury box, and the cartridge box, that without these no class of people could live and flourish in this country, and this was now the word for the hour with me. And the word to which the people of the North willingly listened when I spoke. Hence regarding as I did, the elective franchise as the one great power by which all civil rights are obtained, enjoyed, and maintained under our form of government, and the one without which freedom to any class is delusive if not impossible. I set myself to work with whatever force and energy I possessed to secure this power for the recently emancipated millions. Wendell Phillips the demand for the ballot was such a vast advance upon the former objects proclaimed by the friends of the colored race, that it startled and struck men as preposterous and wholly inadmissible. Anti-slavery men themselves were not united as to the wisdom of such demand. Mr. Garrison himself, though foremost for the abolition of slavery, was not yet quite ready to join this advanced movement. In this respect he was in the rear of Mr. Phillips, who saw not only the justice, but the wisdom and necessity of the measure. To his credit it may be said, that he gave the full strength of his character and eloquence to its adoption. While Mr. Garrison thought it too much to ask, Mr. Phillips thought it too little. While the one thought it might be postponed to the future, the other thought it ought to be done at once. But Mr. Garrison was not a man to lag far in the rear of truth and right, and he soon came to see with the rest of us that the ballot was essential to the freedom of the freedmen. A man's head will not long remain wrong, when his heart is right. The applause awarded to Mr. Garrison by the conservatives, for his moderation both in respect of his views on this question, and the disbandment of the American Anti-Slavery Society must have disturbed him. He was at any rate soon found on the right side of the suffrage question. The enfranchisement of the freedmen was resisted on many grounds, but mainly these two, first the tendency of the measure to bring the freedmen into conflict with the old master class, and the white people of the South generally. 
secondly, their unfitness, by reason of their ignorance, servility, and degradation, to exercise so great a power as the ballot, over the destinies of this great nation. These reasons against the measure which were supposed to be unanswerable, were in some sense the most powerful arguments in its favor. The argument that the possession of suffrage would be likely to bring the Negro into conflict with the old master class at the South, had its main force in the admission that the interests of the two classes antagonized 424 each other and that the maintenance of the one would prove inimical to the other. It resolved itself into this, if the Negro had the means of protecting his civil rights, those who had formerly denied him these rights would be offended and make war upon him. Experience has shown in a measure the correctness of this position. The old master was offended to find the Negro whom he lately possessed the right to enslave and flog to toil, casting a ballot equal to his own, and resorted to all sorts of meanness, violence, and crime. To dispossess him of the enjoyment of this point of equality. In this respect the exercise of the right of suffrage by the Negro has been attended with the evil, which the opponents of the measure predicted, and they could say, I've told you so. But immeasurably and intolerably greater would have been the evil consequences resulting from the denial to one class of this natural means of protection, and granting it to the other, and hostile class. It would have been, to have committed the lamb to the care of the wolf, the arming of one class and disarming the other, protecting one interest, and destroying the other, making the rich strong, and the poor weak, the white man a tyrant, and the black man a slave. The very fact therefore that the old master classes of the South felt that their interests were opposed to those of the freedmen, instead of being a reason against their enfranchisement, was the most powerful one in its favor. Until it shall be safe to leave the lamb in the hold of the lion, the laborer in the power of the capitalist, the poor in the hands of the rich, it will not be safe to leave a newly emancipated people completely in the power of their former masters. Especially when such masters have not ceased to be such from enlightened moral convictions but by irresistible force. Then on the part of the government itself, had it denied this great right to the freedmen, it would have been another proof that, republics are ungrateful. It would have been rewarding its enemies, and punishing its friends, embracing its foes, and spurning its allies, setting a premium on treason, and degrading 425 loyalty. As to the second point, viz. The Negro's ignorance and degradation, there was no disputing either. It was the nature of slavery from whose depths he had arisen to make him so, and it would have kept it so. It was the policy of the system to keep him both ignorant and degraded, the better and more safely to defraud him of his hard earnings, and this argument never staggered me. The ballot in the hands of the Negro was necessary to open the door of the schoolhouse, and to unlock the treasures of knowledge to him. Granting all that was said of his ignorance, I used to say, if the Negro knows enough to fight for his country he knows enough to vote, if he knows enough to pay taxes for the support of the government, he knows enough to vote. If he knows as much when sober, as an Irishman knows when drunk, he knows enough to vote. And now while I am not blind to the evils which have thus far attended the enfranchisement of the colored people, I hold that the evils from which we escaped, and the good we have derived from that act, amply vindicate its wisdom. The evils it brought are in their nature temporary, and the good is permanent. The one is comparatively small, the other absolutely great. The young child has staggered on his little legs, and he has sometimes fallen and hurt his head in the fall, but then he has learned to walk. The boy in the water came near drowning, but then he has learned to swim. Great changes in the relations of mankind can never come, without evils analogous to those which have attended the emancipation and enfranchisement of the colored people of the United States. I am less amazed at these evils, than by the rapidity with which they are subsiding and not more astonished at the facility with which the former slave has become a free man, than at the rapid adjustment of the master class to the new situation. Unlike the movement for the abolition of slavery, the success of the effort for the enfranchisement of the freedmen was not long delayed. It is another illustration of how any 426 advance in pursuance of a right principle, prepares and makes easy the way to another. The way of transgression is a bottomless pit, one step in that direction invites the next, and the end is never reached. And it is the same with the path of righteous obedience. Two hundred years ago, the pious Dr. Godwin dared affirm that it was, not a sin to baptize a negro, 
and won for him the rite of baptism. It was a small concession to his manhood. But it was strongly resisted by the slaveholders of Jamaica, and Virginia. In this they were logical in their argument, but they were not logical in their object. They saw plainly that to concede the Negro's right to baptism was to receive him into the Christian church, and make him a brother in Christ, and hence they opposed the first step sternly and bitterly. So long as they could keep him beyond the circle of human brotherhood, they could scourge him to toil, as a beast of burden, with a good Christian conscience, and without reproach. What, said they, baptize a Negro? Preposterous. Nevertheless the Negro was baptized and admitted to church fellowship. And though for a long time his soul belonged to God, his body to his master, and he poor fellow had nothing left for himself, he is at last not only baptized, but emancipated and enfranchised. In this achievement, an interview with President Andrew Johnson, on the 7th of February, 1866, by a delegation consisting of George T. Downing, Louis H. Douglas, William E. Matthews, John Jones, John F. Cook, Joseph E. Otis, W. Ross, William Whipper, John M. Brown, Alexander Dunlop, and myself, will take its place in history as one of the first steps. What was said on that occasion brought the whole question virtually before the American people. Until that interview the country was not fully aware of the intentions and policy of President Johnson on the subject of Reconstruction, especially in respect of the newly emancipated class of the South. After having heard the brief addresses made to him by Mr. Downing and myself, he occupied at least three-quarters of an 427 hour in what seemed a set speech, and refused to listen to any reply on our part, although solicited to grant a few moments for that purpose. Seeing the advantage that Mr. Johnson would have over us in getting his speech paraded before the country in the morning papers, the members of the delegation met on the evening of that day, and instructed me to prepare a brief reply which should go out to the country simultaneously with the President's speech to us. Since this reply indicates the points of difference between the President and ourselves, I produce it here as a part of the history of the times, it being concurred in by all the members of the delegation. Both the speech and the reply were commented upon very extensively. Mr. President, in consideration of a delicate sense of propriety as well as your own repeated intimations of indisposition to discuss or listen to a reply to the views and opinions you were pleased to express to us in your elaborate speech today, the undersigned would respectfully take this method of replying thereto. Believing as we do that the views and opinions you expressed in that address are entirely unsound and prejudicial to the highest interests of our race as well as our country at large, we cannot do other than expose the same, and, as far as may be in our power, arrest their dangerous influence. It is not necessary at this time to call attention to more than two or three features of your remarkable address. 1. The first point to which we feel especially bound to take exception, is your attempt to found a policy opposed to our enfranchisement, upon the alleged ground of an existing hostility on the part of the former slaves. Toward the poor white people of the South. We admit the existence of this hostility, and hold that it is entirely reciprocal. But you obviously commit an error by drawing an argument from an incident of slavery, and making it a basis for a policy adapted to a state of freedom. The hostility between the whites and blacks of the South is easily explained. It has its root and sap in the relation of slavery, and was incited on both sides by the cunning of the slave master. Those masters secured their ascendancy over both the poor whites and blacks by putting enmity between them. They divided both to conquer each. There was no earthly reason why the blacks should not hate and dread the poor whites when in a state of slavery, for it was from this class that their masters received their slave catchers, slave drivers, and overseers. They were the men called in upon all occasions by the masters, whenever any fiendish outrage was to be committed upon the slave. Now, sir, you cannot but perceive, that the cause of 428 this hatred removed, the effect must be removed also. Slavery is abolished. The cause of this antagonism is removed, and you must see that it is altogether illogical, 
and putting new wine into old bottles, to legislate from slaveholding and slave-driving premises for a people whom you have repeatedly declared your purpose to maintain in freedom. 2. Besides, even if it were true as you allege, that the hostility of the blacks toward the poor whites must necessarily project itself into a state of freedom. And that this enmity between the two races is even more intense in a state of freedom than in a state of slavery, in the name of heaven, we reverently ask how can you, in view of your professed desire to promote the welfare of the black man, deprive him of all means of defense, and clothe him whom you regard as his enemy in the panoply of political power? Can it be that you recommend a policy which would arm the strong and cast down the defenseless? Can you, by any possibility of reasoning, regard this as just, fair, or wise? Experience proves that those are most abused who can be abused with the greatest impunity. Men are whipped oftenest who are whipped easiest. Peace between races is not to be secured by degrading one race and exalting another, by giving power to one race and withholding it from another, but by maintaining a state of equal justice between all classes. First pure, then peaceable. 3. On the colonization theory you were pleased to broach, very much could be said. It is impossible to suppose, in view of the usefulness of the black man in time of peace as a laborer in the South, and in time of war as a soldier at the North, and the growing respect for his rights among the people, and his increasing adaptation to a high state of civilization in his native land, there can ever come a time when he can be removed from this country without a terrible shock to its prosperity and peace. Besides, the worst enemy of the nation could not cast upon its fair name a greater infamy than to admit that Negroes could be tolerated among them in a state of the most degrading slavery and oppression, and must be cast away, driven into exile. For no other cause than having been freed from their chains. Washington, February 7, 1866. From this time onward, the question of suffrage for the freedmen was not allowed to rest. The rapidity with which it gained strength, was something quite marvelous and surprising even to its advocates. Senator Charles Sumner soon took up the subject in the Senate and treated it in his usually able and exhaustive manner. It was a great treat to listen to his argument running through two days, abounding as it did in eloquence, learning, and conclusive reasoning. A committee of the Senate had reported a proposition giving to the states lately in rebellion in so many words complete option as to the 429 enfranchisement of their colored citizens, only coupling with that proposition the condition that to such states as chose to enfranchise such citizens, the basis of their representation in Congress should be proportionately increased. Or, in other words, only three-fifths of the colored citizens should be counted in the basis of representation in states where colored citizens were not allowed to vote, while in the states granting suffrage to colored citizens. The entire colored people should be counted in the basis of representation. Against this proposition, myself and associates addressed to the Senate of the United States the following memorial. To the Honorable the Senate of the United States. The undersigned. Being a delegation representing the colored people of the several states, and now sojourning in Washington, charged with the duty to look after the best interests of the recently emancipated, would most respectfully, but earnestly, pray your honorable body to favor no amendment of the Constitution of the United States which will grant any one or all of the states of this Union to disfranchise any class of citizens on the ground of race or color, for any consideration whatever. They would further respectfully represent that the Constitution as adopted by the Fathers of the Republic in 1789, evidently contemplated the result which has now happened, to wit, the abolition of slavery. The men who framed it, and those who adopted it, framed and adopted it for the people, and the whole people, colored men being at that time legal voters in most of the states. In that instrument as it now stands, there is not a sentence or a syllable conveying any shadow of right or authority by which any state may make color or race a disqualification for the exercise of the right of suffrage. And the undersigned will regard as a real calamity the introduction of any words, expressly or by implication, giving any state or state such power. And we respectfully submit that if the amendment now pending before your honorable body shall be adopted, it will enable any state to deprive any class of citizens of the elective franchise. 
notwithstanding it was obviously framed with a view to affect the question of Negro suffrage only. For these and other reasons the undersigned respectfully pray that the amendment to the Constitution, recently passed by the House and now before your body, be not adopted. And as in duty bound, etc. It was the opinion of Senator W.M. Pitt Fessenden, Senator Henry Wilson, and many others, that the measure here memorialized against would, if incorporated into the Constitution, certainly bring about the enfranchisement of the whole colored 430 population of the South. It was held by them to be an inducement to the states to make suffrage universal, since the basis of representation would be enlarged or contracted, according as suffrage should be extended or limited. But the judgment of these leaders was not the judgment of Senator Sumner, Senator Wade, Yates, Howe, and others, or of the colored people. Yet, weak as this measure was, it encountered the united opposition of Democratic senators. On that side, the Honorable Thomas H. Hendricks of Indiana, took the lead in appealing to popular prejudice against the Negro. He contended that among other objectionable and insufferable results that would flow from its adoption, would be, that a Negro would ultimately be a member of the United States Senate. I never shall forget the ineffable scorn and indignation with which Mr. Hendricks deplored the possibility of such an event. In less, however, than a decade from that debate, Senators Revels and Bruce, both colored men, had fulfilled the startling prophecy of the Indiana Senator. It was not, however, by the halfway measure, which he was opposing for its radicalism, but by the Fourteenth and Fifteenth Amendments, that these gentlemen reached their honorable positions. In defeating the option proposed to be given to the states, to extend or deny suffrage to their colored population, much credit is due to the delegation already named as visiting President Johnson. That delegation made it their business to personally see and urge upon leading Republican statesmen the wisdom and duty of impartial suffrage. Day after day, Mr. Downing and myself saw and conversed with such members of the Senate, whose advocacy of suffrage would be likely to ensure its success. The second marked step in effecting the enfranchisement of the Negro, was made at the National Loyalists Convention, held at Philadelphia in September, 1866. This body was composed of delegates from the South, North, and West. Its object was, to diffuse clear views of the situation of affairs at the South, and to indicate the principles deemed advisable by 431 it to be observed in the reconstruction of society in the Southern states. This convention was, as its history shows, numerously attended by the ablest and most influential men from all sections of the country, and its deliberations participated in by them. The policy foreshadowed by Andrew Johnson, who, by the grace of the assassin's bullet, was then in Abraham Lincoln's seat, a policy based upon the idea that the rebel states were never out of the Union, and hence had forfeited no rights which his pardon could not restore, gave importance to this convention, more than anything which was then occurring at the South. For through the treachery of this bold, bad man, we seemed then about to lose nearly all that had been gained by the war. I was residing in Rochester at the time, and was duly elected as a delegate from that city to attend this convention. The honor was a surprise and a gratification to me. It was unprecedented for a city of over 60,000 white citizens and only about 200 colored residents to elect a colored man to represent them in a national political convention. And the announcement of it gave a shock to the country of no inconsiderable violence. Many Republicans, with every feeling of respect for me personally, were unable to see the wisdom of such a course. They dreaded the clamor of social equality and amalgamation which would be raised against the party, in consequence of this startling innovation. They, dear fellows, found it much more agreeable to talk of the principles of liberty as glittering generalities, than to reduce those principles to practice. When the train on which I was going to the convention reached Harrisburg, it met and was attached to another from the West crowded with Western and Southern delegates on the way to the convention, and among them were several loyal governors. Chief among whom was the loyal governor of Indiana, Oliver P. Morton, a man of Websterian mold in all that appertained to mental power. When my presence 432 became known to these gentlemen, a consultation was immediately held among them, upon the question as to what was best to do with me. It seems strange now, in view of all the progress which has been made, 
that such a question could arise. But the circumstances of the times made me the Jonah of the Republican ship, and responsible for the contrary winds and misbehaving weather. Before we reached Lancaster, on our eastward bound trip, I was duly waited upon by a committee of my brother delegates, which had been appointed by other honorable delegates. To represent to me the undesirableness of my attendance upon the National Loyalists' Convention. The spokesman of these subdelegates was a gentleman from New Orleans with a very French name, which has now escaped me, but which I wish I could recall, that I might credit him with a high degree of politeness and the gift of eloquence. He began by telling me that he knew my history and my works, and that he entertained a very high respect for me, that both himself and the gentleman who sent him, as well as those who accompanied him, regarded me with admiration. That there was not among them the remotest objection to sitting in the convention with me, but their personal wishes in the matter they felt should be set aside for the sake of our common cause. That whether I should or should not go into the convention was purely a matter of expediency, that I must know that there was a very strong and bitter prejudice against my race in the North as well as at the South. And that the cry of social and political equality would not fail to be raised against the Republican Party if I should attend this loyal national convention. He insisted that it was a time for the sacrifice of my own personal feeling, for the good of the Republican cause. That there were several districts in the state of Indiana so evenly balanced that a very slight circumstance would be likely to turn the scale against us and defeat our congressional candidates. And thus leave Congress without a two-thirds vote to control the headstrong and treacherous man then in the presidential chair. It was urged that this was a terrible responsibility for me or any other man to take. I listened very attentively to this address, uttering no word during its delivery. But when it was finished, I said to the speaker and the committee, with all the emphasis I could throw into my voice and manner, gentlemen, with all respect, you might as well ask me to put a loaded pistol to my head and blow my brains out. As to ask me to keep out of this convention, to which I have been duly elected. Then, gentlemen, what would you gain by this exclusion? Would not the charge of cowardice, certain to be brought against you, prove more damaging than that of amalgamation? Would you not be branded all over the land as dastardly hypocrites, professing principles which you have no wish or intention of carrying out? As a mere matter of policy or expediency, you will be wise to let me in. Everybody knows that I have been duly elected as a delegate by the city of Rochester. The fact has been broadly announced and commented upon all over the country. If I am not admitted, the public will ask, where is Douglas? Why is he not seen in the convention, and you would find that inquiry more difficult to answer than any charge brought against you for favoring political or social equality. But, ignoring the question of policy altogether, and looking at it as one of right and wrong, I am bound to go into that convention, not to do so, would contradict the principle and practice of my life. With this answer, the committee retired from the car in which I was seated, and did not again approach me on the subject. But I saw plainly enough then, as well as on the morning when the Loyalist procession was to march through the streets of Philadelphia, that while I was not to be formally excluded, I was to be ignored by the convention. I was the ugly and deformed child of the family, and to be kept out of sight as much as possible while there was company in the house. Especially was it the purpose to offer me no inducement to be present in the ranks of the procession of its members and friends, which was to start from Independence Hall on the first morning of its meeting. In good season, however, I was present at this grand starting point. My reception there confirmed my impression as to the policy intended to be pursued towards me. Few of the many I knew were prepared to give me a cordial recognition, and among these few I may mention General Benj F. Butler, who, whatever others may say of him, has always shown a courage equal to his convictions. Almost everybody else on the ground whom I met seemed to be ashamed or afraid of me. On the previous night I had been warned that I should not be allowed to walk through the city in the procession. Fears had been expressed that my presence in it would so shock the prejudices of the people of Philadelphia, as to cause the procession to be mobbed. The members of the convention were to walk two abreast, and as I was the only colored member of the convention, the question was, as to who of my brother members would consent to walk with me? The answer was not long in coming. There was one man present who was broad enough to take in the whole situation, and brave enough to meet the duty of the hour, 
one who was neither afraid nor ashamed to own me as a man and a brother. One man of the purest Caucasian type, a poet and a scholar, brilliant as a writer, eloquent as a speaker. And holding a high and influential position, the editor of a weekly journal having the largest circulation of any weekly paper in the city or state of New York, and that man was Mr. Theodore Tilton. He came to me in my isolation, seized me by the hand in a most brotherly way, and proposed to walk with me in the procession. I have been in many awkward and disagreeable positions in my life, when the presence of a friend would have been highly valued, but I think I never appreciated an act of courage and generous sentiment more highly than I did of this brave young man. When we marched through the streets of Philadelphia on this memorable day. Well. What came of all these dark forebodings of timid men? How was my presence regarded by the populace? And 435 what effect did it produce? I will tell you. The fears of the loyal governors who wished me excluded to propitiate the favor of the crowd, met with a signal reproof, their apprehensions were shown to be groundless, and they were compelled, as many of them confessed to me afterwards, to own themselves entirely mistaken. The people were more enlightened and had made more progress than their leaders had supposed. An act for which those leaders expected to be pelted with stones, only brought to them unmeasured applause. Along the whole line of march my presence was cheered repeatedly and enthusiastically. I was myself utterly surprised by the heartiness and unanimity of the popular approval. We were marching through a city remarkable for the depth and bitterness of its hatred of the abolition movement. A city whose populace had mobbed anti-slavery meetings, burned temperance halls and churches owned by colored people, and burned down Pennsylvania Hall because it had opened its doors to people of different colors upon terms of equality. But now the children of those who had committed these outrages and follies, were applauding the very principles which their fathers had condemned. After the demonstrations of this first day, I found myself a welcome member of the convention, and cordial greeting took the place of cold aversion. The victory was short, signal, and complete. During the passage of the procession, as we were marching through Chestnut Street, an incident occurred which excited some interest in the crowd, and was noticed by the press at the time. And may perhaps be properly related here as a part of the story of my eventful life. It was my meeting Mrs. Amanda Sears, the daughter of my old mistress, Miss Lucretia Ald, the same Lucretia to whom I was indebted for so many acts of kindness when under the rough treatment of Aunt Katie, on the old plantation home of Colonel. Edward Lloyd. Mrs. Sears now resided in Baltimore, and as I saw her on the corner of Ninth and Chestnut Streets, I hastily ran to her, and expressed my surprise and joy at meeting her. Point 436, but what brought you to Philadelphia at this time? I asked. She replied, with animated voice and countenance, I heard you were to be here, and I came to see you walk in this procession. The dear lady, with her two children, had been following us for hours. Here was the daughter of the owner of a slave, following with enthusiasm that slave as a free man, and listening with joy to the plaudits he received as he marched along through the crowded streets of the great city. And here I may relate another circumstance which should have found place earlier in this story, which will further explain the feeling subsisting between Mrs. Sears and myself. Seven years prior to our meeting, as just described, I delivered a lecture in National Hall, Philadelphia, and at its close a gentleman approached me and said, Mr. Douglas, do you know that your once mistress has been listening to you tonight? I replied that I did not, nor was I inclined to believe it. The fact was, that I had four or five times before had a similar statement made to me by different individuals in different states, and this made me skeptical in this instance. The next morning, however, I received a note from a Mr. William Needles, very elegantly written, which stated that she who was Amanda Ald, daughter of Thomas and Lucretia Ald, and granddaughter to my old master, Captain. Aaron Anthony, was now married to Mr. John L. Sears, a coal merchant in West Philadelphia. The street and number of Mr. Sears's office was given, so that I might, by seeing him, assure myself of the facts in the case, and perhaps learn something of the relatives whom I left in slavery. This note, with the intimation given me the night before, convinced me there was something in it, and I resolved to know the truth. I had now been out of slavery twenty years, 
and no word had come to me from my sisters, or my brother Perry, or my grandmother. My separation had been as complete as if I had been an inhabitant of another planet. A law of Maryland at that time visited with heavy fine and imprisonment any colored 437 person who should come into the state, so I could not go to them any more than they could come to me. Eager to know if my kinsfolk still lived, and what was their condition, I made my way to the office of Mr. Sears, found him in, and handed him the note I had received from Mr. Needles, and asked him to be so kind as to read it and tell me if the facts were as they're stated. After reading the note, he said it was true, but he must decline any conversation with me, since not to do so would be a sacrifice to the feelings of his father-in-law. I deeply regretted his decision, and spoke of my long separation from my relations, and appealed to him to give me some information concerning them. I saw that my words were not without their effect. Presently he said, you publish a newspaper, I believe. I do, I said, but if that is your objection to speaking with me, no word shall go into its columns of our conversation. To make a long story short, we had then quite a long conversation, during which Mr. Sears said that in my narrative I had done his father-in-law injustice, for he was really a kind-hearted man, and a good master. I replied that there must be two sides to the relation of master and slave, and what was deemed kind and just to the one was the opposite to the other. Mr. Sears was not disposed to be unreasonable, and the longer we talked the nearer we came together. I finally asked permission to see Mrs. Sears, the little girl of seven or eight years when I left the eastern shore of Maryland. This request was a little too much for him at first, and he put me off by saying that she was a mere child when I last saw her, and she was now the mother of a large family of children, and I would not know her. He could tell me everything about my people as well as she. I pressed my suit, however, insisting that I could select Miss Amanda out of a thousand other ladies, my recollection of her was so perfect, and begged him to test my memory at this point. After much parley of this nature, he at length consented to my wishes, giving me the number of his house and name of street, with permission to call at 3 4 38 o'clock p.m. on the next day. I left him delighted, and prompt to the hour was ready for my visit. I dressed myself in my best, and hired the finest carriage I could get to take me, partly because of the distance, and partly to make the contrast between the slave and the free man as striking as possible. Mr. Sears had been equally thoughtful. He had invited to his house a number of friends to witness the meeting between Mrs. Sears and myself. I was somewhat disconcerted when I was ushered into the large parlors occupied by about thirty ladies and gentlemen, to all of whom I was a perfect stranger. I saw the design to test my memory by making it difficult for me to guess who of the company was, Miss Amanda. In her girlhood she was small and slender, and hence a thin and delicately formed lady was seated in a rocking chair near the center of the room with a little girl by her side. The device was good, but it did not succeed. Glancing around the room, I saw in an instant the lady who was a child twenty-five years before, and the wife and mother now. Satisfied of this, I said, Mr. Sears, if you will allow me, I will select Miss Amanda from this company. I started towards her, and she, seeing that I recognized her, bounded to me with joy in every feature, and expressed her great happiness at seeing me. All thought of slavery, color, or what might seem to belong to the dignity of her position vanished, and the meeting was as the meeting of friends long separated, yet still present in each other's memory and affection. Amanda made haste to tell me that she agreed with me about slavery, and that she had freed all her slaves as they had become of age. She brought her children to me, and I took them in my arms, with sensations which I could not if I would stop here to describe. One explanation of the feeling of this lady towards me was, that her mother, who died when she was yet a tender child, had been briefly described by me in a little narrative of my life, published many years before our meeting and when I could have had no motive but 439 the highest for what I said of her. She had read my story, and learned something of the amiable qualities of her mother through me. She also recollected that as I had had trials as a slave, she had had her trials under the care of a stepmother. And that when she was harshly spoken to by her father's second wife she could always read in my dark face the sympathy of one who had often received kind words from the lips of her beloved mother. 
Mrs. Sears died three years ago in Baltimore, but she did not depart without calling me to her bedside, that I might tell her as much as I could about her mother, whom she was firm in the faith that she should meet in another and better world. She especially wished me to describe to her the personal appearance of her mother, and desired to know if any of her own children then present resembled her. I told her that the young lady standing in the corner of the room was the image of her mother in form and features. She looked at her daughter and said, Her name is Lucretia, after my mother. After telling me that her life had been a happy one, and thanking me for coming to see her on her deathbed, she said she was ready to die. We parted to meet no more in life. The interview touched me deeply, and was, I could not help thinking, a strange one, another proof that, truth is often stranger than fiction. If any reader of this part of my life shall see in it the evidence of a want of manly resentment for wrongs inflicted upon myself and race by slavery, and by the ancestors of this lady, so it must be. No man can be stronger than nature, one touch of which, we are told, makes all the world akin. I esteem myself a good, persistent hater of injustice and oppression, but my resentment ceases when they cease, and I have no heart to visit upon children the sins of their fathers. It will be noticed, when I first met Mr. Sears in Philadelphia, he declined to talk with me, on the ground that I had been unjust to Captain Ald, his father-in-law. Soon after that meeting, Captain Ald had occasion to go to Philadelphia, and, as usual, went straight to the house of his son-in-law, and had 440 hardly finished the ordinary salutations, when he said, Sears, I see by the papers that Frederick has recently been in Philadelphia. Did you go to hear him? Yes, sir, was the reply. After asking something more about my lecture, he said, Well, Sears, did Frederick come to see you? Yes, sir, said Sears. Well, how did you receive him? Mr. Sears then told him all about my visit, and had the satisfaction of hearing the old man say that he had done right in giving me welcome to his house. This last fact I have from Rev. J. D. Long, who, with his wife, was one of the party invited to meet me at the house of Mr. Sears, on the occasion of my visit to Mrs. Sears. But I must now return from this digression, and further relate my experience in the Loyalist National Convention, and how from that time there was an impetus given to the enfranchisement of the freedmen, which culminated in the Fifteenth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. From the first, the members of the Convention were divided in their views of the proper measures of Reconstruction, and this division was in some sense sectional. The men from the far south, strangely enough, were quite radical, while those from the border states were mostly conservative, and, unhappily, these last had control of the convention from the first. A Kentucky gentleman was made president, and its other officers were for the most part Kentuckians, and all opposed to colored suffrage in sentiment. There was a whole heap, to use a Kentucky phrase, of halfness in that state during the war for the Union, and there was much more there after the war. The Maryland delegates, with the exception of Honorable John L. Thomas, were in sympathy with Kentucky. Those from Virginia, except Honorable John Minor Botts, were unwilling to entertain the question. The result was, that the convention was broken square in two. The Kentucky president declared it adjourned, and left the chair against the earnest protests of the Friends of Manhood Suffrage. But the friends of this measure were not to be out, generaled 441 and suppressed in this way, and instantly reorganized, elected John M. Botts of Virginia, president, discussed and passed resolutions in favor of enfranchising the freedmen, and thus placed the question before the country in such a manner that it could not be ignored. The delegates from the southern states were quite in earnest, and bore themselves grandly in support of the measure, but the chief speakers and advocates of suffrage on that occasion were Mr. Theodore Tilton and Miss Anna E. Dickinson. Of course, on such a question, I could not be expected to be silent. I was called forward, and responded with all the energy of my soul, for I looked upon suffrage to the Negro as the only measure which could prevent him from being thrust back into slavery. From this time onward the question of suffrage had no rest. The rapidity with which it gained strength was more than surprising to me. In addition to the justice of the measure, it was soon commended by events as a political necessity. 
As in the case of the abolition of slavery, the white people of the rebellious states have themselves to thank for its adoption. Had they accepted, with moderate grace, the decision of the court to which they appealed, and the liberal conditions of peace offered to them, and united heartily with the national government in its efforts to reconstruct their shattered institutions, instead of sullenly refusing as they did, their counsel and their votes to that end. They might easily have defeated the argument based upon necessity for the measure. As it was, the question was speedily taken out of the hands of colored delegations and mere individual efforts, and became a part of the policy of the Republican Party, and President U.S. Grant, with his characteristic nerve and clear perception of justice, promptly recommended the great amendment to the Constitution by which colored men are today invested with complete citizenship, the right to vote and to be voted for in the American Republic. Chapter 14 Living and Learning Inducements to a Political Career, Objections, A Newspaper Enterprise, The New National Era, Its Abandonment, The Freedmen's Savings and Trust Company, sad experience, vindication. The adoption of the 14th and 15th Amendments and their incorporation into the Constitution of the United States opened a very tempting field to my ambition, and one to which I should probably have yielded, had I been a younger man. I was earnestly urged by many of my respected fellow citizens, both colored and white and from all sections of the country, to take up my abode in some one of the many districts of the South where there was a large colored vote and get myself elected, as they were sure I easily could do, to a seat in Congress, possibly in the Senate. That I did not yield to this temptation was not entirely due to my age, for the idea did not square well with my better judgment and sense of propriety. The thought of going to live among a people in order to gain their votes and acquire official honors, was repugnant to my self-respect. And I had not lived long enough in the political atmosphere of Washington to have this sentiment sufficiently blunted to make me indifferent to its suggestions. I do not deny that the arguments of my friends had some weight in them, and from their standpoint it was all right, but I was better known to myself than to them. I had small faith in my aptitude as a politician, and could not hope to cope with rival aspirants. My life and labors in the North had in a measure unfitted me for such work, and I could not readily have adapted myself to the peculiar oratory found to be most effective with the newly enfranchised class. In the New England and Northern 443 atmosphere I had acquired a style of speaking which in the South would have been considered tame and spiritless. And, consequently, he who could tear a passion to tatters and split the ear of groundlings, had far better chance of success with the masses there, than one so little boisterous as myself. Upon the whole, I have never regretted that I did not enter the arena of congressional honors to which I was invited. Outside of mere personal considerations I saw, or thought I saw, that in the nature of the case the scepter of power had passed from the old slave and rebellious states to the free and loyal states, and that hereafter. At least for some time to come, the loyal North, with its advanced civilization, must dictate the policy and control the destiny of the Republic. I had an audience ready made in the free states, one which the labors of thirty years had prepared for me, and before this audience the freedmen of the South needed an advocate as much as they needed a member of Congress. I think in this I was right, for thus far our colored members of Congress have not largely made themselves felt in the legislation of the country, and I have little reason to think I could have done any better than they. I was not, however, to remain long in my retired home in Rochester, where I had planted my trees and was reposing under their shadows. An effort was being made about this time to establish a large weekly newspaper in the city of Washington, which should be devoted to the defense and enlightenment of the newly emancipated and enfranchised people. And I was urged by such men as George T. Downing, J. H. Hawes, J. Sella Martin, and others, to become its editor-in-chief. My sixteen years' experience as editor and publisher of my own paper, and the knowledge of the toil and anxiety which such a relation to a public journal must impose, caused me much reluctance and hesitation, nevertheless. I yielded to the wishes of my friends and counselors, went to Washington, threw myself into the work, hoping to be able to lift up a standard at the national capital, for my people. Which should 444 cheer and strengthen them in the work of their own improvement and elevation. I was not long connected with this enterprise, before I discovered my mistake. 
the cooperation so liberally promised, and the support which had been assured, were not very largely realized. By a series of circumstances a little bewildering as I now look back upon them, I found myself alone, under the mental and pecuniary burden involved in the prosecution of the enterprise. I had been misled by loud talk of a grand incorporated publishing company, in which I should have shares if I wished, and in any case a fixed salary for my services. And after all these fair-seeming conditions, I had not been connected with the paper one year before its affairs had been so managed by the agent appointed by this invisible company or corporate body, as to compel me to bear the burden alone. And to become the sole owner of the printing establishment. Having become publicly associated with the enterprise, I was unwilling to have it prove a failure, and had allowed it to become in debt to me, both for money loaned, and for services. And at last it seemed wise that I should purchase the whole concern, which I did, and turned it over to my sons Louis and Frederick, who were practical printers, and who, after a few years, were compelled to discontinue its publication. This paper was the new national era, to the columns of which the colored people are indebted for some of the best things ever uttered in behalf of their cause. For, aside from its editorials and selections, many of the ablest colored men of the country made it the medium through which to convey their thoughts to the public. A misadventure though it was, which cost me from nine to ten thousand dollars, over it I have no tears to shed. The journal was valuable while it lasted, and the experiment was full of instruction to me, which has to some extent been heeded, for I have kept well out of newspaper undertakings since. Someone has said that, experience is the best teacher. For forty-five unfortunately the wisdom acquired in one experience seems not to serve for another and new one. At any rate, my first lesson at the national capital, bought rather dearly as it was, did not preclude the necessity of a second whetstone to sharpen my wits in this my new home and new surroundings. It is not altogether without a feeling of humiliation that I must narrate my connection with the Freedman Savings and Trust Company. This was an institution designed to furnish a place of security and profit for the hard earnings of the colored people, especially at the South. Though its title was, The Freedman's Savings and Trust Company, it is known generally as the Freedman's Bank. According to its managers it was to be this and something more. There was something missionary in its composition, and it dealt largely in exhortations as well as promises. The men connected with its management were generally church members, and reputed eminent for their piety. Some of its agents had been preachers of the word. Their aim was now to instill into the minds of the untutored Africans lessons of sobriety, wisdom, and economy, and to show them how to rise in the world. Circulars, tracts, and other papers were scattered like snowflakes in winter by this benevolent institution among the sable millions, and they were told to look to the Freedmen's Bank and live. Branches were established in all the southern states, and as a result, money flowed into its vaults to the amount of millions. With the usual effect of sudden wealth, the managers felt like making a little display of their prosperity. They accordingly erected one of the most costly and splendid buildings of the time on one of the most desirable and expensive sites in the national capital, finished on the inside with black walnut. And furnished with marble counters and all the modern improvements. The magnificent dimensions of the building bore testimony to its flourishing condition. In passing it on the street I often peeped into its spacious windows, and looked down the row of its gentlemanly and elegantly 446 dressed colored clerks, with their pens behind their ears and buttonhole bouquets in their coat fronts. And felt my very eyes enriched. It was a sight I had never expected to see. I was amazed with the facility with which they counted the money, they threw off the thousands with the dexterity, if not the accuracy, of old and experienced clerks. The whole thing was beautiful. I had read of this bank when I lived in Rochester, and had indeed been solicited to become one of its trustees, and had reluctantly consented to do so. But when I came to Washington and saw its magnificent brown stone front, its towering height, and its perfect appointments, and the fine display it made in the transaction of its business, I felt like the Queen of Sheba when she saw the riches of Solomon, the half had not been told me. After settling myself down in Washington in the office of the New Era, I could and did occasionally attend the meetings of the Board of Trustees, and had the pleasure of listening to the rapid reports of the condition of the institution. 
which were generally of a most encouraging character. My confidence in the integrity and wisdom of the management was such that at one time I had entrusted to its vaults about $12,000. It seemed fitting to me to cast in my lot with my brother Friedman, and help to build up an institution which represented their thrift and economy to so striking advantage. For the more millions accumulated there, I thought, the more consideration and respect would be shown to the colored people of the whole country. About four months before this splendid institution was compelled to close its doors in the starved and deluded faces of its depositors, and while I was assured by its president and by its actuary of its sound condition. I was solicited by some of its trustees to allow them to use my name in the board as a candidate for its presidency. So I waked up one morning to find myself seated in a comfortable armchair, with gold spectacles on my nose, and to hear myself addressed as president of the Freedmen's Bank. I could not help 447 reflecting on the contrast between Frederick the slave boy, running about at Colonel Lloyd's with only a tow linen shirt to cover him, and Frederick, president of a bank counting its assets by millions. I had heard of golden dreams, but such dreams had no comparison with this reality. And yet this seeming reality was scarcely more substantial than a dream. My term of service on this golden height covered only the brief space of three months, and these three months were divided into two parts. During the first part of which I was quietly employed in an effort to find out the real condition of the bank and its numerous branches. This was no easy task. On paper, and from the representations of its management, its assets amounted to three millions of dollars, and its liabilities were about equal to its assets. With such a showing I was encouraged in the belief that by curtailing expenses, doing away with non-paying branches, which policy the trustees had now adopted, we could be carried safely through the financial distress then upon the country. So confident was I of this, that in order to meet what was said to be a temporary emergency, I was induced to loan the bank $10,000 of my own money, to be held by it until it could realize on a part of its abundant securities. This money, though it was repaid, was not done so promptly as under the supposed circumstances I thought it should be. And these circumstances increased my fears lest the chasm was not so easily bridged as the actuary of the institution had assured me it could be. The more I observed and learned the more my confidence diminished. I found that those trustees who wished to issue cards and publish addresses professing the utmost confidence in the bank, had themselves not one dollar deposited there. Some of them, while strongly assuring me of its soundness, had withdrawn their money and opened accounts elsewhere. Gradually I discovered that the bank had sustained heavy losses at the South through dishonest agents, that there was a discrepancy on the books of $40,000, for which no account could be given. That instead of our assets being equal to our liabilities we could not in all likelihoods of 448 the case pay 72 cents on the dollar. There was an air of mystery, too, about the spacious and elegant apartments of the bank building which greatly troubled me, and which I have only been able to explain to myself on the supposition that the employees, from the actuary and the inspector down to the messengers, were, perhaps, naturally anxious to hold their places, and consequently have the business continued. I am not a violent advocate of the doctrine of the total depravity of human nature. I am inclined, on the whole, to believe it a tolerably good nature, Yet instances do occur which oblige me to concede that men can and do act from mere personal and selfish motives. In this case, at any rate, it seemed not unreasonable to conclude that the finely dressed young gentleman, adorned with pens and bouquets, the most fashionable and genteel of all our colored youth, stationed behind those marble counters, should desire to retain their places as long as there was money in the vaults to pay them their salaries. Standing on the platform of this large and complicated establishment, with its 34 branches, extending from New Orleans to Philadelphia, its machinery in full operation, its correspondence carried on in cipher, its actuary dashing in and out of the bank with an air of pressing business, if not of bewilderment, I found the path of inquiry I was pursuing an exceedingly difficult one. I knew there had been very lately several runs on the bank, and that there had been a heavy draft made upon its reserve fund, but I did not know what I should have been told before being allowed to enter upon the duties of my office. That this reserve, which the bank by its charter was required to keep, had been entirely exhausted, 
and that hence there was nothing left to meet any future emergency. Not to make too long a story, I was, in six weeks after my election as president of this bank, convinced that it was no longer a safe custodian of the hard earnings of my confiding people. This conclusion once reached, I could not hesitate as to my duty in the premises, and this was, to save as much as possible of the assets held by the bank for 449 the benefit of the depositors. And to prevent their being further squandered in keeping up appearances, and in paying the salaries of myself and other officers in the bank. Fortunately, Congress, from which we held our charter, was then in session, and its committees on finance were in daily session. I felt it my duty to make known as speedily as possible to Han. John Sherman, Chairman of the Senate Committee on Finance, and to Senator Scott of Pennsylvania, also of the same committee, that I regarded the institution as insolvent and irrecoverable. And that I could no longer ask my people to deposit their money in it. This representation to the Finance Committee subjected me to very bitter opposition on the part of the officers of the bank. Its actuary, Mr. Stickney, immediately summoned some of the trustees, a dozen or so of them, to go before the Finance Committee and make a counter-statement to that made by me, and this they did. Some of them who had assisted me by giving me facts showing the insolvency of the bank, now made haste to contradict that conclusion and to assure the committee that it was abundantly able to weather the financial storm. And pay dollar for dollar to its depositors if allowed to go on. I was not exactly thunderstruck, but I was much amazed by this contradiction. I, however, adhered to my statement that the bank ought to stop. The finance committee substantially agreed with me, and in a few weeks so legislated as to bring this imposing banking business to a close by appointing three commissioners to take charge of its affairs. This is a fair and unvarnished narration of my connection with the Freedman Savings and Trust Company, otherwise known as the Freedman Savings Bank. A connection which has brought upon my head an amount of abuse and detraction greater than any encountered in any other part of my life. Before leaving the subject I ought in justice to myself to state that when I found that the affairs of the bank were to be closed up, I did not, as I might easily have done, and as others did. Make myself a preferred creditor and take my money out of the bank, but on the contrary, I determined to take my 450 chances with other depositors, and left my money, to the amount of $2,000. To be divided with the assets among the creditors of the bank. And now, after seven years have been allowed for the value of the securities to appreciate and the loss of interests on the deposits for that length of time. The depositors may deem themselves fortunate if they receive 60 cents on the dollar of what they placed in the care of this fine savings institution. It is also due to myself to state, especially since I have seen myself accused of bringing the Freedmen's Bank into ruin and squandering in senseless loans on bad security the hardly earned monies of my race that all the loans ever made by the bank were made prior to my connection with it as its president. Not a dollar, not a dime of its millions were loaned by me, or with my approval. The fact is, and all investigation shows it, that I was married to a corpse. The fine building was there with its marble counters and black walnut finishings, the affable and agile clerks, and the discreet and comely colored cashier. But the life, which was the money, was gone, and I found that I had been placed there with the hope that by, some drugs, some charms, some conjuration, or some mighty magic, I would bring it back. When I became connected with the bank I had a tolerably fair name for honest dealing. I had expended in the publication of my paper in Rochester thousands of dollars annually, and had often to depend upon my credit to bridge over immediate wants, but no man there or elsewhere can say I ever wronged him out of a cent. And I could, today, with the confidence of the converted centurion, offer, to restore fourfold to any from whom I have unjustly taken aught. I say this, not for the benefit of those who know me, but for the thousands of my own race who hear of me mostly through the malicious and envious assaults of unscrupulous aspirants who vainly fancy that they lift themselves into consideration by wanton attacks upon the characters of men who receive a larger share of respect and esteem than themselves. Chapter 15 Weighed in the Balance The Santo Domingo Controversy, Decoration Day at Arlington, 1871, Speech Delivered There, National Colored Convention at New Orleans, 1872, Elector at Large for the State of New York, 
Death of Han. Henry Wilson. The most of my story is now before the reader. Whatever of good or ill the future may have in store for me, the past at least is secure. As I review the last decade up to the present writing, I am impressed with a sense of completeness. A sort of rounding up of the arch to the point where the keystone may be inserted, the scaffolding removed, and the work, with all its perfections or faults, left to speak for itself. This decade, from 1871 to 1881, has been crowded, if time is capable of being thus described, with incidents and events which may well enough be accounted remarkable. To me they certainly appear strange, if not wonderful. My early life not only gave no visible promise, but no hint of such experience. On the contrary, that life seemed to render it, in part at least, impossible. In addition to what is narrated in the foregoing chapter, I have to speak of my mission to Santo Domingo, my appointment as a member of the Council for the Government of the District of Columbia. My election as elector at large for the State of New York, my invitation to speak at the Monument of the Unknown Loyal Dead, at Arlington, on Decoration Day, my address on the unveiling of Lincoln Monument, at Lincoln Park, Washington. My appointment to bring the electoral vote from New York to the national capital, my invitation to speak near the statue of Abraham Lincoln, Madison Square, New York, my accompanying the body of Vice President Wilson from Washington to Boston. My conversations with Senator Sumner and President Grant, my welcome to the receptions of Secretary Hamilton Fish, my appointment by President R. B. Hayes to the Office of Marshal of the District of Columbia. My visit to Thomas Ald, the 452 man who claimed me as his slave, and from whom I was purchased by my English friends, and my visit to Lloyd's Plantation, the home of my childhood, after an absence of 56 years. My appointment by President James A. Garfield to the Office of Recorder of Deeds of the District of Columbia, are some of the matters which belong to this decade, and may come into the chapter one am now about to write. Those who knew of my more than friendly relations with Honorable Charles Sumner, and of his determined opposition to the annexation of Santo Domingo to the United States, were surprised to find me earnestly taking sides with Jen. Grant upon that question. Some of my white friends, and a few of those of my own color, who, unfortunately, allow themselves to look at public questions more through the medium of feeling than of reason, and who follow the line of what is grateful to their friends rather than what is consistent with their own convictions, thought my course was an ungrateful return for the eminent services of the Massachusetts Senator. I am free to say that, had I been guided only by the promptings of my heart, I should in this controversy have followed the lead of Charles Sumner. He was not only the most clear-sighted, brave, and uncompromising friend of my race who had ever stood upon the floor of the Senate, but was to me a loved, honored, and precious personal friend. A man possessing the exalted and matured intellect of a statesman, with the pure and artless heart of a child. Upon any issue, as between him and others, when the right seemed in any wise doubtful, I should have followed his counsel and advice. But the annexation of Santo Domingo, to my understanding, did not seem to be any such question. The reasons in its favor were many and obvious, and those against it, as I thought, were easily answered. To Mr. Sumner, annexation was a measure to extinguish a colored nation, and to do so by dishonorable means and for selfish motives. To me it meant the alliance of a weak and defenseless people, having few or none of the attributes of a nation, torn and rent by internal feuds, unable to 455 maintain order at home, or command respect abroad. To a government which would give it peace, stability, prosperity, and civilization, and make it helpful to both countries. To favor annexation at the time when Santo Domingo asked for a place in our Union, was a very different thing from what it was when Cuba and Central America were sought by filibustering expeditions. When the slave power bore rule, and a spirit of injustice and oppression animated and controlled every part of our government, I was for limiting our dominion to the smallest possible margin. But since liberty and equality have become the law of our land, I am for extending our dominion whenever and wherever such extension can peaceably and honorably, and with the approval and desire of all the parties concerned, be accomplished. Santo Domingo wanted to come under our government upon the terms thus described, and for more reasons than I can stop here to give, I then believed, 
and do now believe, it would have been wise to have received her into our sisterhood of states. Charles Sumner The idea that annexation meant degradation to a colored nation, was altogether fanciful. There was no more dishonor to Santo Domingo in making her a state of the American Union, than in making Kansas, Nebraska, or any other territory such a state. It was giving to a part the strength of the whole, and lifting what must be despised for its isolation into an organization and relationship which would compel consideration and respect. Though I differed from Mr. Sumner in respect of this measure, and although I told him I thought he was unjust to President Grant, it never disturbed our friendship. After his great speech against annexation, which occupied six hours in its delivery, and in which he arraigned the President in a most bitter and fierce manner, being at the White House one day. I was asked by President Grant what I now thought of my friend Mr. Sumner. I replied that I believed Mr. Sumner sincerely thought, that in opposing annexation, he was defending the cause of the colored race as he always had done for fifty-six but that I thought he was mistaken. I saw my reply was not very satisfactory, and said, What do you, Mr. President, think of Senator Sumner? He answered, with some feeling, I think he is mad. The difference in opinion on this question between these two great men was the cause of bitter personal estrangement, and one which I intensely regretted. The truth is, that neither one was entirely just to the other, because neither saw the other in his true character, and having once fallen asunder, the occasion never came when they could be brought together. Variance between great men finds no healing influence in the atmosphere of Washington. Interested parties are ever ready to fan the flame of animosity and magnify the grounds of hostility in order to gain the favor of one or the other. This is perhaps true in some degree in every community. But it is especially so of the national capital, and this for the reason that there is ever a large class of people here dependent upon the influence and favor of powerful public men for their daily bread. My selection to visit Santo Domingo with the commission sent thither, was another point indicating the difference between the old time and the new. It placed me on the deck of an American man-of-war, manned by 100 marines and 500 men-of-war's men, under the national flag, which I could now call mine, in common with other American citizens. And gave me a place not in the forecastle, among the hands, nor in the caboose with the cooks, but in the captain's saloon and in the society of gentlemen, scientists, and statesmen. It would be a pleasing task to narrate the varied experiences and the distinguished persons encountered in this Santo Domingo tour, but the material is too boundless for the limits of these pages. I can only say, it was highly interesting and instructive. The conversations at the captain's table, at which I had the honor of a seat, were usually led by Messrs. Wade, Howe, and White, the three commissioners, for fifty-seven and by Mr. Hurlbert of the New York World. The last named gentleman impressed me as one remarkable for knowledge and refinement, in which he was no whit behind Messrs. Howe and White. As for Honorable Benj F. Wade, he was there, as everywhere, abundant in knowledge and experience, fully able to take care of himself in the discussion of any subject in which he chose to take a part. In a circle so brilliant, it is no affectation of modesty to say I was for the most part a listener and a learner. The commander of our good ship on this voyage, Captain Temple, now promoted to the position of Commodore, was a very imposing man, and deported himself with much dignity towards us all. For his treatment to me I am especially grateful. A son of the United States Navy as he was, a department of our service considerably distinguished for its aristocratic tendencies, I expected to find something a little forbidding in his manner. But I am bound to say that in this I was agreeably disappointed. Both the commander and the officers under him bore themselves in a friendly manner towards me during all the voyage, and this is saying a great thing for them. For the spectacle presented by a colored man seated at the captain's table was not only unusual, but had never before occurred in the history of the United States Navy. If during this voyage there was anything to complain of, it was not in the men in authority, or in the conduct of the thirty gentlemen who went out as the honored guests of the expedition, but in the colored waiters. My presence and position seemed to trouble them for its incomprehensibility, and they did not know exactly how to deport themselves towards me. Possibly they may have detected in me something of the same sort in respect of themselves. 
At any rate we seemed awkwardly related to each other during several weeks of the voyage. In their eyes I was Fred. Douglas suddenly, and possibly undeservedly, lifted above them. The fact that I was colored and they were colored had so long made us equal, that the contradiction now presented was too much for them. After all, I have no blame for Sam and 458 Garrett. They were trained in a school of servility to believe that white men alone were entitled to be waited upon by colored men. And the lesson taught by my presence on the Tennessee was not to be learned upon the instant, without thought and experience. I refer to the matter simply as an incident quite commonly met with in the lives of colored men who, by their own exertions or otherwise, have happened to occupy positions of respectability and honor. While the rank and file of our race quote with much vehemence the doctrine of human equality, they are often among the first to deny and denounce it in practice. Of course this is true only of the more ignorant. Intelligence is a great leveler here as elsewhere. It sees plainly the real worth of men and things, and is not easily imposed upon by the dressed-up emptiness of human pride. With a colored man on a sleeping car as its conductor, the last to have his bed made up at night, and the last to have his boots blacked in the morning, and the last to be served in any way, is the colored passenger. This conduct is the homage which the black man pays to the white man's prejudice whose wishes, like a well-trained servant, he is taught to anticipate and obey. Time, education, and circumstances are rapidly destroying these mere color distinctions, and men will be valued in this country as well as in others, for what they are, and for what they can do. My appointment at the hands of President Grant to a seat in the council, by way of eminence sometimes called the upper house of the territorial legislature of the District of Columbia, at the time it was made, must be taken as a signal evidence of his high sense of justice, fairness, and impartiality. The colored people of the district constituted then as now about one-third of the whole population. They were given by Gen. Grant, three members of this legislative council, a representation more proportionate than any that has existed since the government has passed into the hands of commissioners, for they have all been white men. Commissioners to Santo Domingo. It has sometimes been asked why I am called honorable. My appointment to this council must explain this, as it explains the impartiality of Gen. Grant, though I fear it will hardly sustain this prodigious handle to my name, as well as it does the former part of this proposition. The members of this district council were required to be appointed by the President, with the advice and consent of the United States Senate. This is the ground, and only ground that I know of, upon which anybody has claimed this title for me. I do not pretend that the foundation is a very good one, but as I have generally allowed people to call me what they have pleased, and as there is nothing necessarily dishonorable in this. I have never taken the pains to dispute its application and propriety. And yet I confess that I am never so spoken of without feeling a trifle uncomfortable, about as much so as when I am called, as I sometimes am, the Reverend Frederick Douglass. My stay in this legislative body was of short duration. My vocation abroad left me little time to study the many matters of local legislation, hence my resignation, and the appointment of my son Louis to fill out my term. I have thus far told my story without copious quotations from my letters, speeches, or other writings, and shall not depart from this rule in what remains to be told, except to insert here my speech, delivered at Arlington. Near the monument to the Unknown Loyal Dead, on Decoration Day, 1871. It was delivered under impressive circumstances, in presence of President Grant, his cabinet, and a great multitude of distinguished people, and expresses, as I think, the true view which should be taken of the great conflict between slavery and freedom to which it refers. Friends and fellow citizens, tarry here for a moment. My words shall be few and simple. The solemn rites of this hour and place call for no lengthened speech. There is in the very air of this resting ground of the unknown dead a silent, subtle, and an all-pervading eloquence, far more touching, impressive, and thrilling than living lips have ever uttered. Into the measureless depths of every loyal soul it is now whispering lessons of all that is precious, priceless, holiest, and most enduring in human existence. Dark and sad will be the hour to this nation when it forgets to pay grateful homage to its greatest benefactors. 
The offering we bring today is due alike to the patriot soldiers dead and their noble comrades who still live. For whether living or dead, whether in time or eternity, the loyal soldiers who imperiled all for country and freedom are one and inseparable. Those unknown heroes whose whitened bones have been piously gathered here, and whose green graves we now strew with sweet and beautiful flowers, choice emblems alike of pure hearts and brave spirits. Reached in their glorious career that last highest point of nobleness beyond which human power cannot go. They died for their country. No loftier tribute can be paid to the most illustrious of all the benefactors of mankind than we pay to these unrecognized soldiers, when we write above their graves this shining epitaph. When the dark and vengeful spirit of slavery, always ambitious, preferring to rule in hell than to serve in heaven, fired the southern heart and stirred all the malign elements of discord. When our great republic, the hope of freedom and self-government throughout the world, had reached the point of supreme peril. When the union of these states was torn and rent asunder at the center, and the armies of a gigantic rebellion came forth with broad blades and bloody hands to destroy the very foundation of American society. The unknown braves who flung themselves into the yawning chasm, where cannon roared and bullets whistled, fought and fell. They died for their country. We are sometimes asked, in the name of patriotism, to forget the merits of this fearful struggle, and to remember with equal admiration those who struck at the nation's life and those who struck to save it. Those who fought for slavery and those who fought for liberty and justice. I am no minister of malice. I would not strike the fallen. I would not repel the repentant, but may my right hand forget her cunning, and my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth, if I forget the difference between the parties to that terrible, protracted, and bloody conflict. If we ought to forget a war which has filled our land with widows and orphans, which has made stumps of men of the very flower of our youth. Sent them on the journey of life armless, legless, maimed and mutilated. Which has piled up a debt heavier than a mountain of gold, swept uncounted thousands of men into bloody graves, and planted agony at a million hearthstones. I say if this war is to be forgotten, I ask in the name of all things sacred what shall men remember. The essence and significance of our devotions here today are not to be found in the fact that the men whose remains fill these graves were brave in battle. If we met simply to show our sense of bravery, we should find enough to kindle admiration on both sides. In the raging storm of fire and blood, in the fierce torrent of shot and shell, of sword and bayonet, whether on foot or on horse, unflinching courage marked the rebel not less than the loyal soldier. But we are not here to applaud manly courage, save as it has been displayed in a noble cause. We must never forget that victory to the rebellion meant death to the republic. We must never forget that the loyal soldiers who rest beneath this sod flung themselves between the nation and the nation's destroyers. If today we have a country not boiling in an agony of blood like France. If now we have a united country, no longer cursed by the hell-black system of human bondage, if the American name is no longer a byword and a hissing to a mocking earth. If the star-spangled banner floats only over free American citizens in every quarter of the land, and our country has before it a long and glorious career of justice, liberty, and civilization. We are indebted to the unselfish devotion of the noble army who rest in these honored graves all around us. In the month of April, 1872, I had the honor to attend and preside over a national convention of colored citizens, held in New Orleans. It was a critical period in the history of the Republican Party, as well as in that of the country. Eminent men who had hitherto been looked upon as the pillars of republicanism had become dissatisfied with President Grant's administration and determined to defeat his nomination for a second term. The leaders in this unfortunate revolt were Messrs. Trumbull, Schurz, Greeley, and Sumner. Mr. Schurz had already succeeded in destroying the Republican Party in the state of Missouri, and it seemed to be his ambition to be the founder of a new party. And to him more than to any other man belongs the credit of what was once known as the Liberal Republican Party which made Horace Greeley its standard bearer in the campaign of that year. At the time of the convention in New Orleans the elements of this new combination were just coming together. The division in the Republican ranks seemed to be growing deeper and broader every day. 
the colored people of the country were much affected by the threatened disruption, and their leaders were much divided as to the side upon which they should give their voice and their votes. The names of Greeley and Sumner, on account of their long and earnest advocacy of justice and liberty to the blacks, had powerful attractions for the newly enfranchised class. And there was in this convention at New Orleans naturally enough a strong 464 disposition to fraternize with the new party and follow the lead of their old friends. Against this policy I exerted whatever influence I possessed, and, I think, succeeded in holding back that convention from what I felt sure then would have been a fatal political blunder, and time has proved the correctness of that position. My speech on taking the chair on that occasion was telegraphed from New Orleans in full to the New York Herald. And the keynote of it was that there was no path out of the Republican Party that did not lead directly into the Democratic Party, away from our friends and directly to our enemies. Happily this convention pretty largely agreed with me, and its members have not since regretted that agreement. From this convention onward, until the nomination and election of Grant and Wilson, I was actively engaged on the stump, a part of the time in Virginia with Honorable Henry Wilson, in North Carolina with John M. Longston and John H. Smith, and in the state of Maine with Senator Hamlin, General B. F. Butler, General Woodford, and Honorable James G. Blaine. Since 1872 I have been regularly what my old friend Parker Pillsbury would call a field hand in every important political campaign, and at each national convention have sided with what has been called the stalwart element of the Republican Party. It was in the Grant presidential campaign that New York took an advanced step in the renunciation of a timid policy. The Republicans of that state not having the fear of popular prejudice before their eyes placed my name as an elector at large at the head of their presidential ticket. Considering the deep-rooted sentiment of the masses against Negroes, the noise and tumult likely to be raised, especially among our adopted citizens of Irish descent, this was a bold and manly proceeding. And one for which the Republicans of the state of New York deserve the gratitude of every colored citizen of the Republic, for it was a blow at popular prejudice in a quarter where it was capable of making the strongest resistance. The result proved not only the justice and generosity 465 of the measure, but its wisdom. The Republicans carried the state by a majority of 50,000 over the heads of the Liberal Republican and the Democratic parties combined. Equally significant of the turn now taken in the political sentiment of the country, was the action of the Republican Electoral College at its meeting in Albany. When it committed to my custody the sealed-up electoral vote of the great state of New York, and commissioned me to bring that vote to the national capital. Only a few years before, any colored man was forbidden by law to carry a United States mail bag from one post office to another. He was not allowed to touch the sacred leather, though locked in, triple steel, but now, not a mail bag, but a document which was to decide the presidential question with all its momentous interests. Was committed to the hands of one of this despised class. And around him, in the execution of his high trust, was thrown all the safeguards provided by the Constitution and the laws of the land. Though I worked hard and long to secure the nomination and the election of Gen. Grant in 1872, I neither received nor sought office under him. He was my choice upon grounds altogether free from selfish or personal considerations. I supported him because he had done all, and would do all, he could to save not only the country from ruin, but the emancipated class from oppression ultimate destruction, and because Mr. Greeley, with the Democratic Party behind him, would not have the power, even if he had the disposition, to afford us the needed protection which our peculiar condition required. I could easily have secured the appointment as minister to Haiti, but preferred to urge the claims of my friend, Ebenezer Bassett, a gentleman and a scholar and a man well fitted by his good sense and amiable qualities to fill the position with credit to himself and his country. It is with a certain degree of pride that I am able to say that my opinion of the wisdom of sending Mr. Bassett to Haiti has been fully justified by the creditable manner in which, for eight years, for sixty-six he discharged the difficult duties of that position, for I have the assurance of Honorable Hamilton Fish, Secretary of State of the United States, that Mr. Bassett was a good minister. In so many words, the ex-secretary told me, that he, wished that one half of his ministers abroad performed their duties as well as Mr. Bassett. 
to those who knew Han. Hamilton Fish, this compliment will not be deemed slight, for few men are less given to exaggeration and are more scrupulously exact in the observance of law, and in the use of language, than is that gentleman. While speaking in this strain of complacency in reference to Mr. Bassett, I take pleasure also in bearing my testimony based upon knowledge obtained at the State Department, that Mr. John Mercer Langston, the present minister to Haiti, has acquitted himself with equal wisdom and ability to that of Mr. Bassett in the same position. Having known both these gentlemen in their youth, when the one was at Yale, and the other at Oberlin College, and witnessed their efforts to qualify themselves for positions of usefulness. It has afforded me no limited satisfaction to see them rise in the world. Such men increase the faith of all in the possibilities of their race, and make it easier for those who are to come after them. The unveiling of Lincoln Monument in Lincoln Park, Washington, April 14, 1876, and the part taken by me in the ceremonies of that grand occasion, takes rank among the most interesting incidents of my life. Since it brought me into mental communication with a greater number of the influential and distinguished men of the country than any I had before known. There were present the President of the United States and his cabinet, judges of the Supreme Court, the Senate and House of Representatives. And many thousands of citizens to listen to my address upon the illustrious man in whose memory the colored people of the United States had, as a mark of their gratitude, erected that impressive monument. Occasions like this have done wonders in the removal of popular prejudice, and in lifting into consideration the colored 467 race. And I reckon it one of the high privileges of my life, that I was permitted to have a share in this and several other like celebrations. The progress of a nation is sometimes indicated by small things. When Henry Wilson, an honored senator and vice president of the United States, died in the capital of the nation, it was a significant and telling indication of national advance, when three colored citizens, Mr. Robert Purvis, Mr. James Wormley, and myself, were selected with the Senate Committee, to accompany his honored remains from Washington to the grand old commonwealth he loved so well, and whom in turn she had so greatly loved and honored. It was meet and right that we should be represented in the long procession that met those remains in every state between here and Massachusetts, for Henry Wilson was among the foremost friends of the colored race in this country. And this was the first time in its history when a colored man was made a pallbearer at the funeral, as I was in this instance, of a Vice President of the United States. An appointment to any important and lucrative office under the United States government, usually brings its recipient a large measure of praise and congratulation on the one hand, and much abuse and disparagement on the other. And he may think himself singularly fortunate if the censure does not exceed the praise. I need not dwell upon the causes of this extravagance, but I may say there is no office of any value in the country which is not desired and sought by many persons equally meritorious and equally deserving. But as only one person can be appointed to any one office, only one can be pleased, while many are offended, unhappily, resentment follows disappointment, and this resentment often finds expression in disparagement and abuse of the successful man. As in most else I have said, I borrow this reflection from my own experience. My appointment as United States Marshal of the District of Columbia, was in keeping with the rest of my life, as a 468 freeman. It was an innovation upon long-established usage, and opposed to the general current of sentiment in the community. It came upon the people of the district as a gross surprise, and almost a punishment. And provoked something like a scream, I will not say a yell, of popular displeasure. As soon as I was named by President Hayes for the place, efforts were made by members of the bar to defeat my confirmation before the Senate. All sorts of reasons against my appointment, but the true one, were given, and that was withheld more from a sense of shame, than from a sense of justice. The apprehension doubtless was, that if appointed marshal, would surround myself with colored deputies, colored bailiffs, colored messengers, and pack the jury box with colored jurors, in a word, Africanize the courts. But the most dreadful thing threatened, was a colored man at the executive mansion in white kid gloves, sparrow-tailed coat, patent leather boots, and alabaster cravat. Performing the ceremony, a very empty one, of introducing the aristocratic citizens of the Republic to the President of the United States. This was something entirely too much to be borne, 
and men ask themselves in view of it, to what is the world coming? And where will these things stop? Dreadful. Dreadful. It is creditable to the manliness of the American Senate, that it was moved by none of these things, and that it lost no time in the matter of my confirmation. I learn, and believe my information correct, that foremost among those who supported my confirmation against the objections made to it, was Honorable Roscoe Conkling of New York. His speech in executive session is said by the senators who heard it, to have been one of the most masterly and eloquent ever delivered on the floor of the Senate, and this too I readily believe, for Mr. Conkling possesses the ardor and fire of Henry Clay, the subtlety of Calhoun, and the massive grandeur of Daniel Webster. The effort to prevent my confirmation having failed, nothing could be done but to wait for some overt act to justify my removal, and for this my unfriends had not long to wait. In 469 the course of one or two months I was invited by a number of citizens of Baltimore to deliver a lecture in that city in Douglas Hall, a building named in honor of myself and devoted to educational purposes. With this invitation I complied, giving the same lecture which I had two years before delivered in the city of Washington, and which was at the time published in full in the newspapers, and very highly commended by them. The subject of the lecture was, Our National Capital, and in it I said many complimentary things of the city, which were as true as they were complimentary. I spoke of what it had been in the past, what it was at that time, and what I thought it destined to become in the future, giving it all credit for its good points, and calling attention to some of its ridiculous features. For this I got myself pretty roughly handled. The newspapers worked themselves up to a frenzy of passion, and committees were appointed to procure names to a petition to President Hayes demanding my removal. The tide of popular feeling was so violent, that I deemed it necessary to depart from my usual custom when assailed, so far as to write the following explanatory letter from which the reader will be able to measure the extent and quality of my offense. To the editor of the Washington Evening Star. Sir, you were mistaken in representing me as being off on a lecturing tour, and, by implication, neglecting my duties as United States Marshal of the District of Columbia. My absence from Washington during two days was due to an invitation by the managers to be present on the occasion of the inauguration of the International Exhibition in Philadelphia. In complying with this invitation, I found myself in company with other members of the government who went thither in obedience to the call of patriotism and civilization. No one interest of the marshal's office suffered by my temporary absence, as I had seen to it that those upon whom the duties of the office devolved were honest, capable, industrious, painstaking, and faithful. My deputy marshal is a man every way qualified for his position, and the citizens of Washington may rest assured that no unfaithful man will be retained in any position under me. Of course I can have nothing to say as to my own fitness for the position I hold. You have a right to say what you please on that point. Yet I think it would be only fair and generous to wait for some dereliction of duty on my part before I shall be adjudged as incompetent to fill the place. You will allow me to say also that the attacks upon me on account of the remarks alleged to have been made by me in Baltimore, strike me as both malicious and silly. Washington is a great city, not a village nor a hamlet, but the capital of a great nation, and the manners and habits of its various classes are proper subjects for presentation and criticism. And I very much mistake if this great city can be thrown into a tempest of passion by any humorous reflections I may take the liberty to utter. The city is too great to be small, and I think it will laugh at the ridiculous attempt to rouse it to a point of furious hostility to me for anything said in my Baltimore lecture. Had the reporters of that lecture been as careful to note what I said in praise of Washington as what I said, if you please, in disparagement of it, it would have been impossible to awaken any feeling against me in this community for what I said. It is the easiest thing in the world, as all editors know, to pervert the meaning and give a one-sided impression of a whole speech by simply giving isolated passages from the speech itself, without any qualifying connections. It would hardly be imagined from anything that has appeared here that I had said one word in that lecture in honor of Washington, and yet the lecture itself, as a whole, was decidedly in the interest of the national capital. I am not such a fool as to decry a city in which I have invested my money and made my permanent residence. After speaking of the power of the sentiment of patriotism I held this language, 
in the spirit of this noble sentiment I would have the American people view the national capital. It is our national center. It belongs to us. And whether it is mean or majestic, whether arrayed in glory or covered with shame, we cannot but share its character and its destiny. In the remotest section of the Republic, in the most distant parts of the globe, amid the splendors of Europe or the wilds of Africa, we are still held and firmly bound to this common center. Under the shadow of Bunker Hill Monument, in the peerless eloquence of his diction, I once heard the great Daniel Webster give welcome to all American citizens, assuring them that wherever else they might be strangers, they were all at home there. The same boundless welcome is given to all American citizens by Washington. Elsewhere we may belong to individual states, but here we belong to the whole United States. Elsewhere we may belong to a section, but here we belong to a whole country, and the whole country belongs to us. It is national territory, and the one place where no American is an intruder or a carpetbagger. The new comer is not less at home than the old resident. Under its lofty domes and stately pillars, as under the broad blue sky, all races and colors of men stand upon a footing of common equality. The wealth and magnificence which elsewhere might oppress the humble citizen has an opposite effect here. They are felt to be a part of himself and serve to ennoble him in his own eyes. He is an owner of the marble grandeur which he beholds about him, as much so as any of the forty millions of this great nation. Once in his life every American who can 471 should visit Washington, not as the Mahometan to Mecca. Not as the Catholic to Rome, not as the Hebrew to Jerusalem, nor as the Chinaman to the Flowery Kingdom, but in the spirit of enlightened patriotism, knowing the value of free institutions and how to perpetuate and maintain them. Washington should be contemplated not merely as an assemblage of fine buildings, not merely as the chosen resort of the wealth and fashion of the country. Not merely as the honored place where the statesmen of the nation assemble to shape the policy and frame the laws. Not merely as the point at which we are most visibly touched by the outside world, and where the diplomatic skill and talent of the old continent meet and match themselves against those of the new. But as the national flag itself, a glorious symbol of civil and religious liberty, leading the world in the race of social science, civilization, and renown. My lecture in Baltimore required more than an hour and a half for its delivery, and every intelligent reader will see the difficulty of doing justice to such a speech when it is abbreviated and compressed into a half or three quarters of a column. Such abbreviation and condensation has been resorted to in this instance. A few stray sentences, called out from their connections, would be deprived of much of their harshness if presented in the form and connection in which they were uttered. But I am taking up too much space, and will close with the last paragraph of the lecture, as delivered in Baltimore. No city in the broad world has a higher or more beneficent mission. Among all the great capitals of the world it is preeminently the capital of free institutions. Its fall would be a blow to freedom and progress throughout the world. Let it stand then where it does now stand, where the father of his country planted it, and where it has stood for more than half a century, no longer sandwiched between two slave states, no longer a contradiction to human progress. No longer the hotbed of slavery and the slave trade, no longer the home of the duelist, the gambler, and the assassin, no longer the frantic partisan of one section of the country against the other. No longer anchored to a dark and semi-barbarous past, but a redeemed city, beautiful to the eye and attractive to the heart, a bond of perpetual union, an angel of peace on earth and goodwill to men. A common ground upon which Americans of all races and colors, all sections, north and south, may meet and shake hands, not over a chasm of blood, but over a free, united, and progressive republic. I have already alluded to the fact that much of the opposition to my appointment to the office of United States Marshal of the District of Columbia was due to the possibility of my being called to attend President Hayes at the Executive Mansion upon state occasions. And having the honor to introduce the guests on such occasions. I now wish to refer to reproaches liberally showered upon me for holding the office 472 of Marshal while denied this distinguished honor, and to show that the complaint against me at this point is not a well-founded complaint. First. Because the office of United States Marshal is distinct and separate and complete in itself, 
and must be accepted or refused upon its own merits. If, when offered to any person, its duties are such as he can properly fulfill, he may very properly accept it, or, if otherwise, he may as properly refuse it. 2d. Because the duties of the office are clearly and strictly defined in the law by which it was created. And because nowhere among these duties is there any mention or intimation that the marshal may or shall attend upon the President of the United States at the Executive Mansion on state occasions. 3d. Because the choice as to who shall have the honor and privilege of such attendance upon the President belongs exclusively and reasonably to the President himself, and that therefore no one, however distinguished, or in whatever office, has any just cause to complain of the exercise by the President of this right of choice, or because he is not himself chosen. In view of these propositions, which I hold to be indisputable, I should have presented to the country a most foolish and ridiculous figure had I, as absurdly counseled by some of my colored friends, resigned the office of Marshal of the District of Columbia, because President Rutherford B. Hayes, for reasons that must have been satisfactory to his judgment, preferred some person other than myself to attend upon him at the executive mansion and perform the ceremony of introduction on state occasions. But it was said, that this statement did not cover the whole ground, that it was customary for the United States Marshal of the District of Columbia to perform this social office, and that the usage had come to have almost the force of law. I met this at the time, and I meet it now by denying the binding force of this custom. No former president has any right or power to make his example the 473 rule for his successor. The custom of inviting the marshal to do this duty was made by a president, and could be as properly unmade by a president. Besides, the usage is altogether a modern one, and had its origin in peculiar circumstances, and was justified by those circumstances. It was introduced in time of war by President Lincoln when he made his old law partner and intimate acquaintance marshal of the district, and was continued by General Grant when he appointed a relative of his, General Sharp, to the same office. But again it was said that President Hayes only departed from this custom because the marshal in my case was a colored man. The answer I made to this, and now make to it, is, that it is a gratuitous assumption and entirely begs the question. It may or may not be true that my complexion was the cause of this departure, but no man has any right to assume that position in advance of a plain declaration to that effect by President Hayes himself. Never have I heard from him any such declaration or intimation. In so far as my intercourse with him is concerned, I can say that I at no time discovered in him a feeling of aversion to me on account of my complexion, or on any other account, and, unless I am greatly deceived. I was ever a welcome visitor at the executive mansion on state occasions and all others, while Rutherford B. Hayes was President of the United States. I have further to say that I have many times during his administration had the honor to introduce distinguished strangers to him, both of native and foreign birth, and never had reason to feel myself slighted by himself or his amiable wife. And I think he would be a very unreasonable man who could desire for himself, or for any other, a larger measure of respect and consideration than this at the hands of a man and woman occupying the exalted positions of Mr. and Mrs. Hayes. I should not do entire justice to the Honorable Ex-President if I did not bear additional testimony to his noble and generous spirit. When all Washington was in an uproar, and a wild clamor rent the air for my removal from the office of 474 Marshal on account of the lecture delivered by me in Baltimore, when petitions were flowing in upon him demanding my degradation. He nobly rebuked the mad spirit of persecution by openly declaring his purpose to retain me in my place. One other word. During the tumult raised against me in consequence of this lecture on the national capital, Mr. Columbus Alexander, one of the old and wealthy citizens of Washington, who was on my bond for $20,000, was repeatedly besought to withdraw his name, and thus leave me disqualified. But like the President, both he and my other bondsmen, Mr. George Hill, Jr., were steadfast and immovable. I was not surprised that Mr. Hill stood bravely by me, for he was a Republican, but I was surprised and gratified that Mr. Alexander, a Democrat, and, I believe, once a slaveholder, had not only the courage, but the magnanimity to give me fair play in this fight. What I have said of these gentlemen, 
can be extended to very few others in this community, during that period of excitement, among either the white or colored citizens, for, with the exception of Dr. Charles B. Purvis, no colored man in the city uttered one public word in defense or extenuation of me or of my Baltimore speech. This violent hostility kindled against me was singularly evanescent. It came like a whirlwind, and like a whirlwind departed. I soon saw nothing of it either in the courts among the lawyers, or on the streets among the people, for it was discovered that there was really in my speech at Baltimore nothing which made me worthy of stripes or of bonds. Marshal at the inauguration of President Garfield. I can say from my experience in the office of United States Marshal of the District of Columbia, it was every way agreeable. When it was an open question whether I should take the office or not, it was apprehended and predicted if I should accept it in face of the opposition of the lawyers and judges of the courts, I should be subjected to numberless suits for damages. And so vexed and worried that the office would be rendered valueless to me. That it would not only eat up my salary, but possibly endanger what little I might have laid up 477 for a rainy day. I have now to report that this apprehension was in no sense realized. What might have happened had the members of the district bar been half as malicious and spiteful as they had been industriously represented as being, or if I had not secured as my assistant a man so capable, industrious, vigilant, and careful as Mr. L. P. Williams, of course I cannot know. But I am bound to praise the bridge that carries me safely over it. I think it will ever stand as a witness to my fitness for the position of marshal, that I had the wisdom to select for my assistant a gentleman so well instructed and competent. I also take pleasure in bearing testimony to the generosity of Mr. Phillips, the assistant marshal who preceded Mr. Williams in that office, in giving the new assistant valuable information as to the various duties he would be called upon to perform. I have further to say of my experience in the marshal's office, that while I have reason to know that the eminent Chief Justice of the District of Columbia and some of his associates were not well pleased with my appointment, I was always treated by them, as well as by the Chief Clerk of the Courts, Han. J. R. Meigs, and the subordinates of the latter, with a single exception, with the respect and consideration due to my office. Among the eminent lawyers of the district I believe I had many friends, and there were those of them to whom I could always go with confidence in an emergency for sound advice and direction, and this fact. After all the hostility felt in consequence of my appointment, and revived by my speech at Baltimore, is another proof of the vincibility of all feeling arising out of popular prejudices. In all my forty years of thought and labor to promote the freedom and welfare of my race, I never found myself more widely and painfully at variance with leading colored men of the country. Then when I opposed the effort to set in motion a wholesale exodus of colored people of the South to the northern states. And yet I never took a position in which I felt myself better fortified by reason and necessity. It was said 478 of me, that I had deserted to the old master class, and that I was a traitor to my race. That I had run away from slavery myself, and yet I was opposing others in doing the same. When my opponents condescended to argue, they took the ground that the colored people of the South needed to be brought into contact with the freedom and civilization of the North. That no emancipated and persecuted people ever had or ever could rise in the presence of the people by whom they had been enslaved, and that the true remedy for the ills which the freedmen were suffering was to initiate the Israelitish departure from our modern Egypt to a land abounding, if not in milk and honey, certainly in pork and hominy. Influenced, no doubt, by the dazzling prospects held out to them by the advocates of the Exodus movement, thousands of poor, hungry, naked, and destitute colored people were induced to quit the South amid the frosts and snows of a dreadful winter in search of a better country. I regret to say there was something sinister in this so-called exodus, for it transpired that some of the agents most active in promoting it had an understanding with certain railroad companies, by which they were to receive one dollar per head upon all such passengers. Thousands of these poor people, traveling only so far as they had money to bear their expenses, were dropped on the levees of St. Louis, in the extremist destitution. And their tales of woe were such as to move a heart much less sensitive to human suffering than mine. But while I felt for these poor deluded people, and did what I could to put a stop to their ill-advised and ill-arranged stampede, 
I also did what I could to assist such of them as were within my reach, who were on their way to this land of promise. Hundreds of these people came to Washington, and at one time there were from two to three hundred lodged here, unable to get further for the want of money. I lost no time in appealing to my friends for the means of assisting them. Conspicuous among these friends was Mrs. Elizabeth Thompson of New York City, the lady who, several years ago, made the nation a present of 479 Carpenter's great historical picture of the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, and who has expended large sums of her money in investigating the causes of yellow fever, and in endeavors to discover means for preventing its ravages in New Orleans and elsewhere. I found Mrs. Thompson consistently alive to the claims of humanity in this, as in other instances, for she sent me, without delay, a draft for two hundred and fifty dollars. And in doing so expressed the wish that I would promptly inform her of any other opportunity of doing good. How little justice was done me by those who accused me of indifference to the welfare of the colored people of the South on account of my opposition to the so-called exodus will be seen by the following extracts from a paper on that subject laid before the Social Science Congress at Saratoga. When that question was before the country. Important as manual labor is everywhere, it is nowhere more important and absolutely indispensable to the existence of society than in the more southern of the United States. Machinery may continue to do, as it has done, much of the work of the North, but the work of the South requires bone, sinew, and muscle of the strongest and most enduring kind for its performance. Labor in that section must know no pause. Her soil is pregnant and prolific with life and energy. All the forces of nature within her borders are wonderfully vigorous, persistent, and active. Aided by an almost perpetual summer abundantly supplied with heat and moisture, her soil readily and rapidly covers itself with noxious weeds, dense forests, and impenetrable jungles. Only a few years of non-tillage would be needed to give the sunny and fruitful south to the bats and owls of a desolate wilderness. From this condition, shocking for a southern man to contemplate, it is now seen that nothing less powerful than the naked iron arm of the negro, can save her. For him as a southern laborer, there is no competitor or substitute. The thought of filling his place by any other variety of the human family, will be found delusive and utterly impracticable. Neither Chinaman, German, Norwegian, nor Swede can drive him from the sugar and cotton fields of Louisiana and Mississippi. They would certainly perish in the black bottoms of these states if they could be induced, which they cannot, to try the experiment. Nature itself, in those states, comes to the rescue of the Negro, fights his battles, and enables him to exact conditions from those who would unfairly treat and oppress him. Besides being dependent upon the roughest and flintiest kind of labor, the climate of the South makes such labor uninviting 480 and harshly repulsive to the white man. He dreads it, shrinks from it, and refuses it. He shuns the burning sun of the fields and seeks the shade of the verandas. On the contrary, the negro walks, labors, and sleeps in the sunlight unharmed. The standing apology for slavery was based upon a knowledge of this fact. It was said that the world must have cotton and sugar, and that only the negro could supply this want, and that he could be induced to do it only under the beneficent whip of some bloodthirsty legree. The last part of this argument has been happily disproved by the large crops of these productions since emancipation but the first part of it stands firm, unassailed and unassailable. Even if climate and other natural causes did not protect the Negro from all competition in the labor market of the South, inevitable social causes would probably affect the same result. The slave system of that section has left behind it, as in the nature of the case it must, manners, customs, and conditions to which free white laboring men will be in no haste to submit themselves and their families. They do not emigrate from the free north, where labor is respected, to a lately enslaved south, where labor has been whipped, chained, and degraded for centuries. Naturally enough such emigration follows the lines of latitude in which they who compose it were born. Not from south to north, but from east to west the star of empire takes its way. Hence it is seen that the dependence of the planters, landowners, and old master class of the south upon the negro, however galling and humiliating to southern pride and power, is nearly complete and perfect. There is only one mode of escape for them, 
and that mode they will certainly not adopt. It is to take off their own coats, cease to whittle sticks and talk politics at crossroads, and go themselves to work in their broad and sunny fields of cotton and sugar. An invitation to do this is about as harsh and distasteful to all their inclinations as would be an invitation to step down into their graves. With the Negro, all this is different. Neither natural, artificial, or traditional causes stand in the way of the freedmen to labor in the South. Neither the heat nor the fever demon which lurks in her tangled and oozy swamps affright him, and he stands today the admitted author of whatever prosperity, beauty, and civilization are now possessed by the South. And the admitted arbiter of her destiny. This then, is the high vantage ground of the Negro, he has labor, the South wants it, and must have it or perish. Since he is free he can now give it or withhold it, use it where he is, or take it elsewhere as he pleases. His labor made him a slave, and his labor can, if he will, make him free, comfortable, and independent. It is more to him than fire, swords, ballot boxes, or bayonets. It touches the heart of the South through its pocket. This power served him well years ago, when in the bitterest extremity of destitution. But for it, he would have perished when he dropped out of slavery. It saved him then, and it will save him again. Emancipation came to him, surrounded by extremely unfriendly circumstances. It was not the choice 481 or consent of the people among whom he lived, but against their will, and a death struggle on their part to prevent it. His chains were broken in the tempest and whirlwind of civil war. Without food, without shelter, without land, without money, and without friends, he with his children, his sick, his aged and helpless ones, were turned loose and naked to the open sky. The announcement of his freedom was instantly followed by an order from his master to quit his old quarters, and to seek bread thereafter from the hands of those who had given him his freedom. A desperate extremity was thus forced upon him at the outset of his freedom, and the world watched with humane anxiety, to see what would become of him. His peril was imminent. Starvation and death stared him in the face and marked him for their victim. It will not soon be forgotten that at the close of a five-hour speech by the late Senator Sumner, in which he advocated with unequaled learning and eloquence the enfranchisement of the freedmen. The best argument with which he was met in the Senate, was that legislation at that point would be utterly superfluous. That the Negro was rapidly dying out, and must inevitably and speedily disappear and become extinct. Inhuman and shocking as was this consignment of millions of human beings to extinction, the extremity of the Negro, at that date, did not contradict, but favored, the prophecy. The policy of the old masterclass dictated by passion, pride, and revenge, was then to make the freedom of the Negro, a greater calamity to him, if possible, than had been his slavery. But happily, both for the old masterclass, and for the recently emancipated, there came then, as there will come now, the sober second thought. The old masterclass then found it had made a great mistake. It had driven away the means of its own support. It had destroyed the hands, and left the mouths. It had starved the Negro, and starved itself. Not even to gratify its own anger and resentment could it afford to allow its fields to go uncultivated, and its tables unsupplied with food. Hence the freedman, less from humanity than cupidity, less from choice than necessity, was speedily called back to labor and life. But now, after fourteen years of service, and fourteen years of separation from the visible presence of slavery, during which he has shown both disposition and ability to supply the labor market of the South, and that he could do so far better as a freedman than he ever did as a slave, that more cotton and sugar can be raised by the same hands, under the inspiration of liberty and hope, than can be raised under the influence of bondage and the whip, he is again, alas, in the deepest trouble. Again without a home, out under the open sky, with his wife and little ones. He lines the sunny banks of the Mississippi, fluttering in rags and wretchedness, mournfully imploring hard-hearted steamboat captains to take him on board. While the friends of the emigration movement are diligently soliciting funds all over the North to help him away from his old home to the new Canaan of Kansas. I am sorry to be obliged to omit the statement which here follows, of the reasons given for the Exodus movement, and my explanation of them. 
But from want of space I can present only such portions of the paper as express most vividly and in fewest words, my position in regard to the question. I go on to say. Bad as is the condition of the Negro today at the South, there was a time when it was flagrantly and incomparably worse. A few years ago he had nothing, he had not even himself. He belonged to somebody else, who could dispose of his person and his labor as he pleased. Now he has himself, his labor, and his right to dispose of one and the other as shall best suit his own happiness. He has more. He has a standing in the supreme law of the land, in the Constitution of the United States, not to be changed or affected by any conjunction of circumstances likely to occur in the immediate or remote future. The Fourteenth Amendment makes him a citizen and the Fifteenth makes him a voter. With power behind him, at work for him, and which cannot be taken from him, the Negro of the South may wisely bide his time. The situation at the moment is exceptional and transient. The permanent powers of the government are all on his side. What though for the moment the hand of violence strikes down the Negro's rights in the South, those rights will revive, survive, and flourish again. They are not the only people who have been, in a moment of popular passion, maltreated and driven from the poles. The Irish and Dutch have frequently been so treated. Boston, Baltimore, and New York have been the scenes of lawless violence. But those scenes have now disappeared. Without abating one jot of our horror and indignation at the outrages committed in some parts of the southern states against the Negro. We cannot but regard the present agitation of an African exodus from the South as ill-timed and in some respects hurtful. We stand today at the beginning of a grand and beneficent reaction. There is a growing recognition of the duty and obligation of the American people to guard, protect, and defend the personal and political rights of all the people of all the states. To uphold the principles upon which rebellion was suppressed, slavery abolished, and the country saved from dismemberment and ruin. We see and feel today, as we have not seen and felt before, that the time for conciliation and trusting to the honor of the late rebels and slaveholders has passed. The President of the United States himself, while still liberal, just, and generous toward the South, has yet sounded a halt in that direction, and has bravely, firmly, and ably asserted the constitutional authority to maintain the public peace in every state in the Union, and upon every day in the year, and has maintained this ground against all the powers of House and Senate. We stand at the gateway of a marked and decided change in the statesmanship 483 of our rulers. Every day brings fresh and increasing evidence that we are, and of right ought to be, a nation. That confederate notions of the nature and powers of our government ought to have perished in the rebellion which they supported, that they are anachronisms and superstitions and no longer fit to be above ground. At a time like this, so full of hope and courage, it is unfortunate that a cry of despair should be raised in behalf of the colored people of the South. Unfortunate that men are going over the country begging in the name of the poor colored man of the South, and telling the people that the government has no power to enforce the constitution and laws in that section. And that there is no hope for the poor Negro but to plant him in the new soil of Kansas or Nebraska. These men do the colored people of the South a real damage. They give their enemies an advantage in the argument for their manhood and freedom. They assume their inability to take care of themselves. The country will be told of the hundreds who go to Kansas, but not of the thousands who stay in Mississippi and Louisiana. It will be told of the destitute who require material aid, but not of the multitude who are bravely sustaining themselves where they are. In Georgia the Negroes are paying taxes upon six millions of dollars. In Louisiana upon forty or fifty millions, and upon unascertained sums elsewhere in the southern states. Why should a people who have made such progress in the course of a few years be humiliated and scandalized by exodus agents, begging money to remove them from their homes? Especially at a time when every indication favors the position that the wrongs and hardships which they suffer are soon to be redressed? Besides the objection thus stated, it is manifest that the public and noisy advocacy of a general stampede of the colored people from the South to the North is necessarily an abandonment of the great and paramount principle of protection to person and property in every state in the Union. It is an evasion of a solemn obligation and duty. 
The business of this nation is to protect its citizens where they are, not to transport them where they will not need protection. The best that can be said of this exodus in this respect is, that it is an attempt to climb up some other way. It is an expedient, a halfway measure, and tends to weaken in the public mind a sense of absolute right, power, and duty of the government, inasmuch as it concedes by implication at least. That on the soil of the South the law of the land cannot command obedience, the ballot box cannot be kept pure, peaceable elections cannot be held, the Constitution cannot be enforced. And the lives and liberties of loyal and peaceable citizens cannot be protected. It is a surrender, a premature disheartening surrender, since it would secure freedom and free institutions by migration rather than by protection, by flight rather than by right, by going into a strange land rather than by staying in one's own. It leaves the whole question of equal rights on the soil of the 484 South open and still to be settled, with the moral influence of Exodus against us. Since it is a confession of the utter impracticability of equal rights and equal protection in any state where those rights may be struck down by violence. It does not appear that the friends of freedom should spend either time or talent in furtherance of this exodus, as a desirable measure, either for the North or the South. If the people of this country cannot be protected in every state of the Union, the government of the United States is shorn of its rightful dignity and power, the late rebellion has triumphed, the sovereignty of the nation is an empty name. And the power and authority in individual states is greater than the power and authority of the United States. The colored people of the South, just beginning to accumulate a little property, and to lay the foundation of family, should not be in haste to sell that little and be off to the banks of the Mississippi. The habit of roaming from place to place in pursuit of better conditions of existence is never a good one. A man should never leave his home for a new one till he has earnestly endeavored to make his immediate surroundings accord with his wishes. The time and energy expended in wandering from place to place, if employed in making him a comfortable home where he is, will, in nine cases out of ten, prove the best investment. No people ever did much for themselves or for the world without the sense and inspiration of native land, of a fixed home, of familiar neighborhood and common associations. The fact of being to the manner born has an elevating power upon the mind and heart of a man. It is a more cheerful thing to be able to say I was born here and know all the people, than to say I am a stranger here and know none of the people. It cannot be doubted that in so far as this exodus tends to promote restlessness in the colored people of the South, to unsettle their feeling of home, and to sacrifice positive advantages where they are, for fancied ones in Kansas or elsewhere. It is an evil. Some have sold their little homes, their chickens, mules, and pigs, at a sacrifice, to follow the exodus. Let it be understood that you are going, and you advertise the fact that your mule has lost half its value. For your staying with him makes half his value. Let the colored people of Georgia offer their six millions worth of property for sale, with the purpose to leave Georgia, and they will not realize half its value. Land is not worth much where there are no people to occupy it, and a mule is not worth much where there is no one to drive him. It may be safely asserted that whether advocated and commended to favor on the ground that it will increase the political power of the Republican Party, and thus help to make a solid North against a solid South. Or upon the ground that it will increase the power and influence of the colored people as a political element, and enable them the better to protect their rights, and ensure their moral and social elevation, the exodus will prove a disappointment. A mistake, and a failure. Because, as to strengthening the 485 Republican Party, the emigrants will go only to those states where the Republican Party is strong and solid enough already with their votes. And in respect to the other part of the argument, it will fail because it takes colored voters from a section of the country where they are sufficiently numerous to elect some of their number to places of honor and profit. And places them in a country where their proportion to other classes will be so small as not to be recognized as a political element or entitled to be represented by one of themselves. And further, because go where they will, they must for a time inevitably carry with them poverty, ignorance, and other repulsive incidents. Inherited from their former condition as slaves, a circumstance which is about as likely to make votes for Democrats as for Republicans, and to raise up bitter prejudice against them as to raise up friends for them. 
Plainly enough, the exodus is less harmful as a measure than are the arguments by which it is supported. The one is the result of a feeling of outrage and despair, but the other comes of cool, selfish calculation. One is the result of honest despair, and appeals powerfully to the sympathies of men, the other is an appeal to our selfishness, which shrinks from doing right because the way is difficult. Not only is the South the best locality for the Negro, on the ground of his political powers and possibilities, but it is best for him as a field of labor. He is there, as he is nowhere else, an absolute necessity. He has a monopoly of the labor market. His labor is the only labor which can successfully offer itself for sale in that market. This fact, with a little wisdom and firmness, will enable him to sell his labor there on terms more favorable to himself than he can elsewhere. As there are no competitors or substitutes he can demand living prices with the certainty that the demand will be complied with. Exodus would deprive him of this advantage. The Negro, as already intimated, is preeminently a southern man. He is so both in constitution and habits, in body as well as mind. He will not only take with him to the north, southern modes of labor, but southern modes of life. The careless and improvident habits of the South cannot be set aside in a generation. If they are adhered to in the North, in the fierce winds and snows of Kansas and Nebraska, the emigration must be large to keep up their numbers. As an assertion of power by a people hitherto held in bitter contempt, as an emphatic and stinging protest against high-handed, greedy, and shameless injustice to the weak and defenseless. As a means of opening the blind eyes of oppressors to their folly and peril, the Exodus has done valuable service. Whether it has accomplished all of which it is capable in this direction, for the present is a question which may well be considered. With a moderate degree of intelligent leadership among the laboring class of the South, properly handling the justice of their cause, and wisely using the Exodus example, they can easily exact better terms for their labor than ever before. Exodus is medicine, not food, it is for disease, not health, it is not to be 486 taken from choice, but necessity. In anything like a normal condition of things, the South is the best place for the Negro. Nowhere else is there for him a promise of a happier future. Let him stay there if he can, and save both the South and himself to civilization. While, however, it may be the highest wisdom in the circumstances for the freedmen to stay where they are, no encouragement should be given to any measures of coercion to keep them there. The American people are bound, if they are or can be bound to anything, to keep the north gate of the south open to black and white and to all the people. The time to assert a right, Webster says, is when it is called in question. If it is attempted, by force or fraud to compel the colored people to stay there, they should by all means go, go quickly, and die if need be in the attempt. Chapter 16 Time Makes All Things Even Return to the, old master, a last interview, Captain Alt's admission, had I been in your place, I should have done as you did, speech at Easton, the old jail there, invited to a sale on the revenue cutter Guthrie, Honorable John L. Thomas, visit to the old plantation, home of Colonel Lloyd, kind reception and attentions, familiar scenes, old memories, burial ground, hospitality, gracious reception from Mrs. Buchanan, a little girl's floral gift, a promise of a good time coming, speech at Harper's Ferry, Decoration Day, 1881, Storer College, Honorable A. J. Hunter. The leading incidents to which it is my purpose to call attention and make prominent in the present chapter, will, I think, address the imagination of the reader with peculiar and poetic force, and might well enough be dramatized for the stage. They certainly afford another striking illustration of the trite saying, that truth is stranger than fiction. The first of these events occurred four years ago, when, after a period of more than forty years, I visited and had an interview with Captain Thomas Ald, at St. Michael's, Talbot County, Maryland. It will be remembered by those who have followed the thread of my story, that St. Michael's was at one time the place of my home, and the scene of some of my saddest experiences of slave life. And that I left there, or, rather, was compelled to leave there, because it was believed that I had written passes for several slaves to enable them to escape from slavery, and that prominent slaveholders in that neighborhood had. 
for this alleged offense, threatened to shoot me on sight, and to prevent the execution of this threat, my master had sent me to Baltimore. My return, therefore, to this place, in peace, among the 488 same people, was strange enough of itself, but that I should, when there, be formally invited by Captain. Thomas Ald, then over eighty years old, to come to the side of his dying bed, evidently with a view to a friendly talk over our past relations, was a fact still more strange, and one which, until its occurrence, I could never have thought possible. To me, Captain Ald had sustained the relation of master, a relation which I had held in extremist abhorrence, and which, for forty years, I had denounced in all bitterness of spirit and fierceness of speech. He had struck down my personality, had subjected me to his will, made property of my body and soul, reduced me to a chattel, hired me out to a noted slave-breaker to be worked like a beast and flogged into submission. He had taken my hard earnings, sent me to prison, offered me for sale, broken up my Sunday school, forbidden me to teach my fellow slaves to read on pain of nine and thirty lashes on my bare back. He had sold my body to his brother Hugh, and pocketed the price of my flesh and blood without any apparent disturbance of his conscience. I, on my part, had travelled through the length and breadth of this country and of England, holding up this conduct of his in common with that of other slaveholders to the reprobation of all men who would listen to my words. I had made his name and his deeds familiar to the world by my writings in four different languages, yet here we were after four decades once more face to face, he on his bed, aged and tremulous, drawing near the sunset of life, and I. His former slave, United States Marshal of the District of Columbia, holding his hand and in friendly conversation with him, in a sort of final settlement of past differences, preparatory to his stepping into his grave. Where all distinctions are at an end, and where the great and the small, the slave and his master, are reduced to the same level. Had I been asked in the days of slavery to visit this man, should have regarded the invitation as one to put fetters on my ankles and handcuffs on my wrists. It would have been an invitation to the auction block and the slave whip. I had no business with 489 this man under the old regime but to keep out of his way. But now that slavery was destroyed, and the slave and the master stood upon equal ground, I was not only willing to meet him, but was very glad to do so. The conditions were favorable for remembrance of all his good deeds, and generous extenuation of all his evil ones. He was to me no longer a slaveholder either in fact or in spirit, and I regarded him as I did myself, a victim of the circumstances of birth, education, law, and custom. Our courses had been determined for us, not by us. We had both been flung, by powers that did not ask our consent, upon a mighty current of life, which we could neither resist nor control. By this current he was a master, and I a slave. But now our lives were verging towards a point where differences disappear, where even the constancy of hate breaks down, where the clouds of pride, passion, and selfishness vanish before the brightness of infinite light. At such a time, and in such a place, when a man is about closing his eyes on this world and ready to step into the eternal unknown, no word of reproach or bitterness should reach him or fall from his lips. And on this occasion there was to this rule no transgression on either side. As this visit to Captain. Ald has been made the subject of mirth by heartless triflers, and regretted as a weakening of my lifelong testimony against slavery, by serious-minded men, and as the report of it, published in the papers immediately after it occurred. Was in some respects defective and colored, it may be proper to state exactly what was said and done at this interview. It should in the first place be understood that I did not go to St. Michael's upon Captain Ault's invitation, but upon that of my colored friend, Charles Caldwell, but when once there, Captain Ault sent Mr. Green, a man in constant attendance upon him during his sickness, to tell me he would be very glad to see me, and wished me to accompany Green to his house, with which request I complied. On reaching the house 490 I was met by Mr. William H. Brough, a son-in-law of Captain Ald, and Mrs. Louisa Brough, his daughter, and was conducted by them immediately to the bedroom of Captain Ald. We addressed each other simultaneously, he calling me, Marshal Douglas, and I, as I had always called him, Captain Ald. Hearing myself called by him, Marshal Douglas, I instantly broke up the formal nature of the meeting by saying, not Marshal, but Frederick to you as formerly. 
We shook hands cordially, and in the act of doing so, he, having been long stricken with palsy, shed tears as men thus afflicted will do when excited by any deep emotion. The sight of him, the changes which time had wrought in him, his tremulous hands constantly in motion, and all the circumstances of his condition affected me deeply, and for a time choked my voice and made me speechless. We both, however, got the better of our feelings, and conversed freely about the past. Though broken by age and palsy, the mind of Captain Ald was remarkably clear and strong. After he had become composed I asked him what he thought of my conduct in running away and going to the north. He hesitated a moment as if to properly formulate his reply, and said, Frederick, I always knew you were too smart to be a slave, and had I been in your place I should have done as you did. I said, Captain Ald, I am glad to hear you say this. I did not run away from you, but from slavery, it was not that I loved Caesar less, but Rome more. I told him that I had made a mistake in my narrative, a copy of which I had sent him, in attributing to him ungrateful and cruel treatment of my grandmother. That I had done so on the supposition that in the division of the property of my old master, Mr. Aaron Anthony, my grandmother had fallen to him, and that he had left her in her old age, when she could be no longer of service to him, to pick up her living in solitude with none to help her. Or in other words had turned her out to die like an old horse. Ah, he said, that was a mistake, I never owned your grandmother, she in the division of the slaves was awarded to my brother-in-law, for ninety-one Andrew Anthony, but, he added quickly, I brought her down here and took care of her as long as she lived. The fact is, that after writing my narrative describing the condition of my grandmother, Captain Alt's attention being thus called to it, he rescued her from her destitution. I told him that this mistake of mine was corrected as soon as I discovered it, and that I had at no time any wish to do him injustice, that I regarded both of us as victims of a system. Oh, I never liked slavery, he said, and I meant to emancipate all of my slaves when they reached the age of twenty-five years. I told him I had always been curious to know how old I was, that it had been a serious trouble to me, not to know when was my birthday. He said he could not tell me that, but he thought I was born in February, 1818. This date made me one year younger than I had supposed myself from what was told me by Mistress Lucretia, Captain Ald's former wife, when I left Lloyd's for Baltimore in the spring of 1825, she having then said that I was eight, going on nine. I know that it was in the year 1825 that I went to Baltimore, because it was in that year that Mr. James Beecham built a large frigate at the foot of Aliciana Street, for one of the South American governments. Judging from this, and from certain events which transpired at Colonel Lloyd's, such as a boy without any knowledge of books, under eight years old, would hardly take cognizance of, I am led to believe that Mrs. Lucretia was nearer right as to my age than her husband. Before I left his bedside Captain Ald spoke with a cheerful confidence of the great change that awaited him, and felt himself about to depart in peace. Seeing his extreme weakness I did not protract my visit. The whole interview did not last more than twenty minutes, and we parted to meet no more. His death was soon after announced in the papers, and the fact that he had once owned me as a slave was cited as rendering that event noteworthy. It may not, perhaps, be quite artistic to speak in this connection of another incident of something of the same nature 492 as that which I have just narrated, and yet it quite naturally finds place here. And that is, my visit to the town of Easton, county seat of Talbot County, two years later, to deliver an address in the courthouse, for the benefit of some association in that place. This visit was made interesting to me, by the fact that forty-five years before I had, in company with Henry and John Harris, been dragged to Easton behind horses, with my hands tied, put in jail, and offered for sale. For the offense of intending to run away from slavery. It may easily be seen that this visit, after this lapse of time, brought with it feelings and reflections such as only unusual circumstances can awaken. There stood the old jail, with its whitewashed walls and iron gratings, as when in my youth I heard its heavy locks and bolts clank behind me. Strange too, Mr. Joseph Graham, who was then sheriff of the county, and who locked me in this gloomy place, was still living, though verging towards eighty, and was one of the gentlemen who now gave me a warm and friendly welcome. 
and was among my hearers when I delivered my address at the courthouse. There too in the same old place stood Seoul. Law's Tavern, where once the slave traders were wont to congregate, and where I now took up my abode and was treated with a hospitality and consideration undreamed of as possible by me in the olden time. When one has advanced far in the journey of life, when he has seen and travelled over much of this great world, and has had many and strange experiences of shadow and sunshine. When long distances of time and space have come between him and his point of departure, it is natural that his thoughts should return to the place of his beginning. And that he should be seized with a strong desire to revisit the scenes of his early recollection, and live over in memory the incidents of his childhood. At least such for several years have been my thoughts and feeling in respect of Colonel Lloyd's plantation on Y River, Talbot County, Maryland, for I had never been there since I left it, when eight years old, in 1825. While slavery continued, of course this very natural desire could not be safely gratified, for my presence among slaves was dangerous to the public peace, and could no more be tolerated than could a wolf among sheep or fire in a magazine. But now that the results of the war had changed all this, I had for several years determined to return to my old home upon the first opportunity. Speaking of this desire of mine last winter, to Honorable John L. Thomas, the efficient collector at the Port of Baltimore, and a leading Republican of the State of Maryland, he urged me very much to go, and added that he often took a trip to the eastern shore in his revenue cutter, Guthrie. Otherwise known in time of war as the Ewing, and would be much pleased to have me accompany him on one of these trips. I expressed some doubt as to how such a visit would be received by the present Colonel Edward Lloyd, now proprietor of the old place, and grandson of Governor Ed Lloyd whom I remembered. Mr. Thomas promptly assured me that from his own knowledge I need have no trouble on that score. Mr. Lloyd was a liberal-minded gentleman, and he had no doubt would take a visit from me very kindly. I was very glad to accept the offer. The opportunity for the trip however did not occur till the 12th of June, and on that day, in company with Messrs. Thomas, Thompson, and Chamberlain, on board the cutter, we started for the contemplated visit. In four hours after leaving Baltimore, we were anchored in the river off the Lloyd Estate. And from the deck of our vessel I saw once more the stately chimneys of the grand old mansion which I had last seen from the deck of the Sally Lloyd when a boy. I left there as a slave, and returned as a freeman, I left there unknown to the outside world, and returned well known, I left there on a freight boat and returned on a revenue cutter, I left on a vessel belonging to Colonel Edward Lloyd, and returned on one belonging to the United States. As soon as we had come to anchor, Mr. Thomas dispatched a note to Colonel Edward Lloyd, announcing my presence on 494 board his cutter, and inviting him to meet me, informing him it was my desire, if agreeable to him, to revisit my old home. In response to this note, Mr. Howard Lloyd, a son of Colonel Lloyd, a young gentleman of very pleasant address, came on board the cutter, and was introduced to the several gentlemen and myself. He told us that his father was gone to Easton on business, expressed his regret at his absence, hoped he would return before we should leave, and in the meantime received us cordially and invited us ashore, escorted us over the grounds, and gave us as hearty a welcome as we could have wished. I hope I shall be pardoned for speaking of this incident with much complacency. It was one which could happen to but few men, and only once in the lifetime of any. The span of human life is too short for the repetition of events which occur at the distance of fifty years. That I was deeply moved, and greatly affected by it, can be easily imagined. Here I was, being welcomed and escorted by the great-grandson of Colonel Edward Lloyd, a gentleman I had known well fifty-six years before, and whose form and features were as vividly depicted on my memory as if I had seen him but yesterday. He was a gentleman of the olden time, elegant in his apparel, dignified in his deportment, a man of few words and of weighty presence. And I can easily conceive that no governor of the state of Maryland ever commanded a larger measure of respect than did this great-grandfather of the young gentleman now before me. In company with Mr. Howard was his little brother Dacosa, a bright boy of eight or nine years, disclosing his aristocratic descent in the lineaments of his face, and in all his modest and graceful movements. 
As I looked at him I could not help the reflections naturally arising from having seen so many generations of the same family on the same estate. I had seen the elder Lloyd, and was now walking around with the youngest member of that name. In respect to the place itself, I was most agreeably surprised to find that time had dealt so gently with it, and that in all its appointments it was so little 495 changed from what it was when I left it, and from what I have elsewhere described it. Very little was missing except the squads of little black children which were once seen in all directions, and the great number of slaves on its fields. Colonel Lloyd's estate comprised 27,000 acres, and the home farm 7,000. In my boyhood sixty men were employed in cultivating the home farm alone. Now, by the aid of machinery, the work is accomplished by ten men. I found the buildings, which gave it the appearance of a village, nearly all standing, and I was astonished to find that I had carried their appearance and location so accurately in my mind during so many years. There was the long quarter, the quarter on the hill, the dwelling house of my old master, Baron Anthony, the overseer's house, once occupied by William Severe, Austin Gore, James Hopkins, and other overseers. In connection with my old master's house was the kitchen where Aunt Katie presided, and where my head had received many a thump from her unfriendly hand. I looked into this kitchen with peculiar interest, and remembered that it was there I last saw my mother. I went round to the window at which Miss Lucretia used to sit with her sewing, and at which I used to sing when hungry, a signal which she well understood, and to which she readily responded with bread. The little closet in which I slept in a bag had been taken into the room, the dirt floor, too, had disappeared under plank. But upon the whole, the house is very much as it was in the olden time. Not far from it was the stable formerly in charge of old Barney. The storehouse at the end of it, of which my master carried the keys, had been removed. The large carriage house, too, which in my boy days contained two or three fine coaches, several phaetons, gigs, and a large sleigh, for the latter there was seldom any use, was gone. This carriage house was of much interest to me because Colonel Lloyd sometimes allowed his servants the use of it for festal occasions, and in it there was at such times music and dancing. With these two exceptions, the houses of the estate remained. For ninety-six there was the shoemaker's shop, where Uncle Abe made and mended shoes, and there the blacksmith's shop, where Uncle Tony hammered iron, and the weekly closing of which first taught me to distinguish Sundays from other days. The old barn, too, was there, time-worn, to be sure, but still in good condition, a place of wonderful interest to me in my childhood, for there I often repaired to listen to the chatter and watch the flight of swallows among its lofty beams. And under its ample roof. Time had wrought some changes in the trees and foliage. The Lombardy poplars, in the branches of which the red-winged blackbirds used to congregate and sing, and whose music awakened in my young heart sensations and aspirations deep and undefinable, were gone. But the oaks and elms where young Daniel, the uncle of the present Edward Lloyd, used to divide with me his cakes and biscuits, were there as umbrageous and beautiful as ever. I expressed a wish to Mr. Howard to be shown into the family burial ground, and thither we made our way. It is a remarkable spot, the resting place for all the deceased Lloyds for two hundred years, for the family have been in possession of the estate since the settlement of the Maryland colony. The tombs there remind one of what may be seen in the grounds of moss-covered churches in England. The very names of those who sleep within the oldest of them are crumbled away and become undecipherable. Everything about it is impressive, and suggestive of the transient character of human life and glory. No one could stand under its weeping willows, amidst its creeping ivy and myrtle, and look through its somber shadows, without a feeling of unusual solemnity. The first interment I ever witnessed was in this place. It was the great-great-grandmother, brought from Annapolis in a mahogany coffin, and quietly, without ceremony, deposited in this ground. While here, Mr. Howard gathered for me a bouquet of flowers and evergreens from the different graves around us, and which I carefully brought to my home for preservation. Revisits his old home. Notable among the tombs were those of Admiral Buchanan, who commanded the Merrimack in the action at Hampton Roads with the Monitor, March 8, 1862, and that of General Winder of the Confederate Army, both sons-in-law of the Elder Lloyd. 
There was also pointed out to me the grave of a Massachusetts man, a Mr. Page, a teacher in the family, whom I had often seen and wondered what he could be thinking about as he silently paced up and down the garden walks, always alone, for he associated neither with Captain Anthony, Mr. McDermott, nor the overseers. He seemed to be one by himself. I believe he originated somewhere near Greenfield, Massachusetts, and members of his family will perhaps learn for the first time, from these lines, the place of his burial. For I have had intimation that they knew little about him after he once left home. We then visited the garden, still kept in fine condition, but not as in the days of the elder Lloyd, for then it was tended constantly by Mr. McDermott, a scientific gardener, and four experienced hands, and formed, perhaps, the most beautiful feature of the place. From this we were invited to what was called by the slaves the Great House, the mansion of the Lloyds, and were helped to chairs upon its stately veranda, where we could have a full view of its garden, with its broad walks. Hedged with box and adorned with fruit trees and flowers of almost every variety. A more tranquil and tranquilizing scene I have seldom met in this or any other country. We were soon invited from this delightful outlook into the large dining room, with its old-fashioned furniture, its mahogany sideboard, its cut-glass chandeliers, decanters, tumblers, and wine glasses. And cordially invited to refresh ourselves with wine of most excellent quality. To say that our reception was every way gratifying is but a feeble expression of the feeling of each and all of us. Leaving the great house, my presence became known to the colored people, some of whom were children of those I had known when a boy. They all seemed delighted to see five hundred me, and were pleased when I called over the names of many of the old servants, and pointed out the cabin where Dr. Copper, an old slave, used to teach us with a hickory stick in hand, to say the Lord's Prayer. After spending a little time with these, we bade goodbye to Mr. Howard Lloyd, with many thanks for his kind attentions, and steamed away to St. Michael's, a place of which I have already spoken. The next part of this memorable trip took us to the home of Mrs. Buchanan, the widow of Admiral Buchanan, one of the two only living daughters of old Governor Lloyd, and here my reception was as kindly as that received at the great house, where I had often seen her when a slender young lady of eighteen. She is now about seventy-four years, but marvelously well preserved. She invited me to a seat by her side, introduced me to her grandchildren. Conversed with me as freely and with as little embarrassment as if I had been an old acquaintance and occupied an equal station with the most aristocratic of the Caucasian race. I saw in her much of the quiet dignity as well as the features of her father. I spent an hour or so in conversation with Mrs. Buchanan, and when I left a beautiful little granddaughter of hers, with a pleasant smile on her face, handed me a bouquet of many-colored flowers. I never accepted such a gift with a sweeter sentiment of gratitude than from the hand of this lovely child. It told me many things, and among them that a new dispensation of justice, kindness, and human brotherhood was dawning not only in the North, but in the South. That the war and the slavery that caused the war were things of the past, and that the rising generation are turning their eyes from the sunset of decayed institutions to the grand possibilities of a glorious future. The next, and last noteworthy incident in my experience, and one which further and strikingly illustrates the idea with which this chapter sets out, is my visit to Harper's Ferry on 30th of May, of this year, and my address on John Brown. Delivered in that place before Storer College, an institution 501 established for the education of the children of those whom John Brown endeavored to liberate. It is only a little more than twenty years ago when the subject of my discourse, as will be seen elsewhere in this volume, made a raid upon Harper's Ferry. When its people, and we may say the whole nation, were filled with astonishment, horror, and indignation at the mention of his name. When the government of the United States cooperated with the state of Virginia in efforts to arrest and bring to capital punishment all persons in any way connected with John Brown and his enterprise. When United States Marshals visited Rochester and elsewhere in search of me, with a view to my apprehension and execution, for my supposed complicity with Brown. When many prominent citizens of the North were compelled to leave the country to avoid arrest, and men were mobbed, even in Boston, for daring to speak a word in vindication or extenuation of what was considered Brown's stupendous crime. 
And yet here I was, after two decades upon the very soil he had stained with blood, among the very people he had startled and outraged, and who a few years ago would have hanged me to the first tree, in open daylight, allowed to deliver an address. Not merely defending John Brown, but extolling him as a hero and martyr to the cause of liberty, and doing it with scarcely a murmur of disapprobation. I confess that as I looked out upon the scene before me and the towering heights around me, and remembered the bloody drama there enacted, saw the log house in the distance where John Brown collected his men, saw the little engine house where the brave old Puritan fortified himself against a dozen companies of Virginia militia, and the place where he was finally captured by United States troops under Colonel Robert E. Lee, I was a little shocked at my own boldness in attempting to deliver an address in such presence, and of the character advertised in advance of my coming. But there was no cause of apprehension. The people of Harper's Ferry have made wondrous progress in their ideas of freedom, of thought, and speech. The abolition 502 of slavery has not merely emancipated the Negro, but liberated the whites. Taken the lock from their tongues, and the fetters from their press. On the platform from which I spoke, sat Honorable Andrew J. Hunter, the prosecuting attorney for the state of Virginia, who conducted the cause of the state against John Brown, that consigned him to the gallows. This man, now well stricken in years, greeted me cordially, and in conversation with me after the address, bore testimony to the manliness and courage of John Brown, and though he still disapproved of the raid made by him upon Harper's Ferry. He commended me for my address, and gave me a pressing invitation to visit Charlestown, where he lives, and offered to give me some facts which might prove interesting to me. As to the sayings and conduct of Captain Brown while in prison and on trial, up to the time of his execution. I regret that my engagements and duties were such that I could not then and there accept his invitation, for I could not doubt the sincerity with which it was given, or fail to see the value of compliance. Mr. Hunter not only congratulated me upon my speech, but at parting, gave me a friendly grip, and added that if Robert E. Lee were alive and present, he knew he would give me his hand also. This man's presence added much to the interest of the occasion by his frequent interruptions, approving, and condemning my sentiments as they were uttered. I only regret that he did not undertake a formal reply to my speech, but this, though invited, he declined to do. It would have given me an opportunity of fortifying certain positions in my address which were perhaps insufficiently defended. Upon the whole, taking the visit to Captain Ald, to Easton with its old jail, to the home of my old master at Colonel Lloyd's, and this visit to Harper's Ferry, with all their associations, they fulfill the expectation created at the beginning of this chapter. Chapter 17 Incidents and Events Honorable Garrett Smith and Mr. E. C. Delevin, Experiences at Hotels and on Steamboats and Other Modes of Travel, Honorable Edward Marshall, Grace Greenwood, Honorable Moses Norris, Rob J. Ingersoll, Reflections and Conclusions, Compensations. In escaping from the South, the reader will have observed that I did not escape from its widespread influence in the North. That influence met me almost everywhere outside of pronounced anti-slavery circles, and sometimes even within them. It was in the air, and men breathed it and were permeated by it, often when they were quite unconscious of its presence. I might recount many occasions when I have encountered this feeling, some painful and melancholy, some ridiculous and amusing. It has been a part of my mission to expose the absurdity of this spirit of caste and in some measure help to emancipate men from its control. Invited to accompany Honorable Garrett Smith to dine with Mr. E. C. Delevin, at Albany many years ago, I expressed to Mr. Smith, my awkwardness and embarrassment in the society I was likely to meet there. Ah! said that good man, you must go, Douglas, it is your mission to break down the walls of separation between the two races. I went with Mr. Smith, and was soon made at ease by Mr. Delevin and the ladies and gentlemen there. They were among the most refined and brilliant people I had ever met. I felt somewhat surprised that I could be so much at ease in such company, but I found it then, as I have since, that the higher the gradation in intelligence and refinement, the farther removed 504 are all artificial distinctions. And restraints of mere caste or color. 
In one of my anti-slavery campaigns in New York, five and thirty years ago, I had an appointment at Victor, a town in Ontario County. I was compelled to stop at the hotel. It was the custom at that time, to seat the guests at a long table running the length of the dining room. When I entered I was shown a little table off in a corner. I knew what it meant, but took my dinner all the same. When I went to the desk to pay my bill, I said, Now, landlord, be good enough to tell me just why you gave me my dinner at the little table in the corner by myself. He was equal to the occasion, and quickly replied, Because you see, I wish to give you something better than the others. The cool reply staggered me, and I gathered up my change, muttering only that I did not want to be treated better than other people, and bade him good morning. On an anti-slavery tour through the West, in company with H. Ford Douglas, a young colored man of fine intellect and much promise, and my old friend John Jones, both now deceased, we stopped at a hotel in Janesville, and were seated by ourselves to take our meals. Where all the barroom loafers of the town could stare us. Thus seated I took occasion to say, loud enough for the crowd to hear me, that I had just been out to the stable and had made a great discovery. Asked by Mr. Jones what my discovery was, I said that I saw there, black horses and white horses eating together from the same trough in peace, from which I inferred that the horses of Janesville were more civilized than its people. The crowd saw the hit, and broke out into a good-natured laugh. We were afterwards entertained at the same table with other guests. Many years ago, on my way from Cleveland to Buffalo, on one of the lake steamers, the gong sounded for supper. There was a rough element on board, such as at that time might be found anywhere between Buffalo and Chicago. It 505 was not to be trifled with especially when hungry. At the first sound of the gong there was a furious rush for the table. From prudence, more than from lack of appetite, I waited for the second table, as did several others. At this second table I took a seat far apart from the few gentlemen scattered along its side, but directly opposite a well-dressed, finely featured man, of the fairest complexion, high forehead, golden hair and light beard. His whole appearance told me he was somebody. I had been seated but a minute or two, when the steward came to me, and roughly ordered me away. I paid no attention to him, but proceeded to take my supper, determined not to leave, unless compelled to do so by superior force, and being young and strong I was not entirely unwilling to risk the consequences of such a contest. A few moments passed, when on each side of my chair, there appeared a stalwart of my own race. I glanced at the gentleman opposite. His brow was knit, his color changed from white to scarlet, and his eyes were full of fire. I saw the lightning flash, but I could not tell where it would strike. Before my sable brethren could execute their captain's order, and just as they were about to lay violent hands upon me, a voice from that man of golden hair and fiery eyes resounded like a clap of summer thunder. Let the gentleman alone. I am not ashamed to take my tea with Mr. Douglas. His was a voice to be obeyed, and my right to my seat and my supper was no more disputed. I bowed my acknowledgments to the gentleman, and thanked him for his chivalrous interference and as modestly as I could, asked him his name. I am Edward Marshall of Kentucky, now of California, he said. Sir, I am very glad to know you, I have just been reading your speech in Congress, I said. Supper over, we passed several hours in conversation with each other, during which he told me of his political career in California, of his election to Congress, and that he was a Democrat, but had no prejudice against color. He was then just coming from Kentucky where he had been in part 506 to see his black mammy, for, said he, I nursed at the breasts of a colored mother. I asked him if he knew my old friend John H. Collins in California. Oh, yes, he replied, he is a smart fellow, he ran against me for Congress. I charged him with being an abolitionist, but he denied it, so I sent off and got the evidence of his having been general agent of the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society, and that settled him. During the passage, Mr. Marshall invited me into the barroom to take a drink. I excused myself from drinking, but went down with him. There were a number of thirsty-looking individuals standing around, to whom Mr. Marshall said, Come, boys, take a drink. 
When the drinking was over, he threw down upon the counter a twenty-dollar gold piece, at which the barkeeper made large eyes, and said he could not change it. Well, keep it, said the gallant marshal, it will all be gone before morning. After this, we naturally fell apart, and he was monopolized by other company, but I shall never fail to bear willing testimony to the generous and manly qualities of this brother of the gifted and eloquent Thomas Marshall of Kentucky. In 1842 I was sent by the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society to hold a Sunday meeting in Pittsfield, N. H., and was given the name of Mr. Hillis, a subscriber to the Liberator. It was supposed that any man who had the courage to take and read the Liberator, edited by William Lloyd Garrison, or the Herald of Freedom, edited by Nathaniel P. Rogers, would gladly receive and give food and shelter to any colored brother laboring in the cause of the slave. As a general rule this was very true. There were no railroads in New Hampshire in those days, so I reached Pittsfield by stage, glad to be permitted to ride upon the top thereof, for no colored person could be allowed inside. This was many years before the days of civil rights bills, black congressmen, colored United States marshals, and such like. Arriving at Pittsfield, I was asked by the driver where I would stop. I gave him the name of my subscriber to the Liberator. That is two miles beyond, he said. So after landing his other passengers, he took me on to the house of Mr. Hillis. I confess I did not seem a very desirable visitor. The day had been warm, and the road dusty. I was covered with dust, and then I was not of the color fashionable in that neighborhood, for colored people were scarce in that part of the old granite state. I saw in an instant, that though the weather was warm, I was to have a cool reception, but cool or warm, there was no alternative left me but to stay and take what I could get. Mr. Hillis scarcely spoke to me, and from the moment he saw me jump down from the top of the stage, carpet bag in hand, his face wore a troubled look. His good wife took the matter more philosophically, and evidently thought my presence there for a day or two could do the family no especial harm. But her manner was restrained, silent, and formal, wholly unlike that of anti-slavery ladies I had met in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. When tea time came, I found that Mr. Hillis had lost his appetite, and could not come to the table. I suspected his trouble was color phobia, and though I regretted his malady, I knew his case was not necessarily dangerous, and I was not without some confidence in my skill and ability in healing diseases of that type. I was, however, so affected by his condition that I could not eat much of the pie and cake before me, and felt so little in harmony with things about me that I was, for me, remarkably reticent during the evening. Both before and after the family worship, for Mr. Hillis was a pious man. Sunday morning came, and in due season the hour for meeting. I had arranged a good supply of work for the day. I was to speak four times, at ten o'clock a.m., at one p.m., at five, and again at half past seven in the evening. When meeting time came, Mr. Hillis brought his fine phaeton to the door, assisted his wife in, and, although there were two vacant seats in his carriage, there was no room in it for me. On driving off from his door, he merely said, addressing me, you can find your way to the town hall, I suppose. I suppose I can, I replied, and started along behind his carriage on the dusty road toward the village. I found the hall, and was very glad to see in my small audience the face of good Mrs. Hillis. Her husband was not there, but had gone to his church. There was no one to introduce me, and I proceeded with my discourse without introduction. I held my audience till twelve o'clock, noon, and then took the usual recess of Sunday meetings in country towns, to allow the people to take their lunch. No one invited me to lunch, so I remained in the town hall till the audience assembled again, when I spoke till nearly three o'clock, when the people again dispersed and left me as before. By this time I began to be hungry, and seeing a small hotel near, I went into it, and offered to buy a meal, but I was told, they did not entertain niggers there. I went back to the old town hall hungry and chilled, for an infant, New England Northeaster, was beginning to chill the air, and a drizzling rain to fall. I saw that my movements were being observed, from the comfortable homes around, with apparently something of the feeling that children might experience in seeing a bear prowling about town. 
There was a graveyard near the town hall, and attracted thither, I felt some relief in contemplating the resting places of the dead, where there was an end to all distinctions between rich and poor, white and colored, high and low. While thus meditating on the vanities of the world and my own loneliness and destitution, and recalling the sublime pathos of the saying of Jesus, the foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head, I was approached rather hesitatingly by a gentleman, who inquired my name. My name is Douglas, I replied. You do not seem to have any place to stay 509 while in town. I told him I had not. Well, said he, I am no abolitionist, but if you will go with me I will take care of you. I thanked him, and turned with him towards his fine residence. On the way I asked him his name. Moses Norris, he said. What? Honorable Moses Norris? I asked. Yes, he answered. I did not for a moment know what to do, for I had read that this same man had literally dragged the Reverend George Storrs from the pulpit, for preaching abolitionism. I, however, walked along with him and was invited into his house, when I heard the children running and screaming, Mother, Mother, there is a nigger in the house, there's a nigger in the house, and it was with some difficulty that Mr. Norris succeeded in quieting the tumult. I saw that Mrs. Norris, too, was much disturbed by my presence, and I thought for a moment of beating a retreat, but the kind assurances of Mr. Norris decided me to stay. When quiet was restored, I ventured the experiment of asking Mrs. Norris to do me a kindness. I said, Mrs. Norris, I have taken cold, and am hoarse from speaking, and I have found that nothing relieves me so readily as a little loaf sugar and cold water. The lady's manner changed, and with her own hands she brought me the water and sugar. I thanked her with genuine earnestness, and from that moment I could see that her prejudices were more than half gone, and that I was more than half welcome at the fireside of this democratic senator. I spoke again in the evening, and at the close of the meeting there was quite a contest between Mrs. Norris and Mrs. Hillis, as to which I should go home with. I considered Mrs. Hillis' kindness to me, though her manner had been formal. I knew the cause, and I thought, especially as my carpet bag was there, I would go with her. So giving Mr. and Mrs. Norris many thanks, I bade them goodbye, and went home with Mr. and Mrs. Hillis, where I found the atmosphere wondrously and most agreeably changed. Next day, Mr. Hillis took me in the same carriage in which I did not ride on Sunday, to my next appointment, and on the way 510 told me he felt more honored by having me in it than he would be if he had the President of the United States. This compliment would have been a little more flattering to my self-esteem, had not John Tyler then occupied the presidential chair. In those unhappy days of the Republic, when all presumptions were in favor of slavery, and a colored man as a slave met less resistance in the use of public conveyances than a colored man as a freeman, I happened to be in Philadelphia. And was afforded an opportunity to witness this preference. I took a seat in a street car by the side of my friend Mrs. Amy Post, of Rochester, New York, who, like myself, had come to Philadelphia to attend an anti-slavery meeting. I had no sooner seated myself when the conductor hastened to remove me from the car. My friend remonstrated, and the amazed conductor said, Lady, does he belong to you? He does, said Mrs. Post, and there the matter ended. I was allowed to ride in peace, not because I was a man, and had paid my fare, but because I belonged to somebody. My color was no longer offensive when it was supposed that I was not a person, but a piece of property. Another time, in the same city, I took a seat, unobserved, far up in the street car, among the white passengers. All at once I heard the conductor, in an angry tone, order another colored man, who was modestly standing on the platform of the rear end of the car, to get off, and actually stopped the car to push him off, when I, from within. With all the emphasis I could throw into my voice, in imitation of my chivalrous friend Marshall of Kentucky, sung out, Go on. Let the gentleman alone, no one here objects to his writing. Unhappily the fellow saw where the voice came from, and turned his wrathful attention to me, and said, You shall get out also. I told him I would do no such thing, and if he attempted to remove me by force he would do it at his peril. 
Whether the young man was afraid to tackle me, or did not wish to disturb the passengers, I do not know. At any rate he did not attempt 5.11 to execute his threat, and I rode on in peace till I reached Chestnut Street, when I got off and went about my business. On my way down the Hudson River, from Albany to New York, at one time, on the steamer Alida, in company with some English ladies who had seen me in their own country, received and treated me as a gentleman, I ventured, like any other passenger. To go, at the call of the dinner bell, into the cabin and take a seat at the table. But I was forcibly taken from it and compelled to leave the cabin. My friends, who wished to enjoy a day's trip on the beautiful Hudson, left the table with me, and went to New York hungry and not a little indignant and disgusted at such barbarism. There were influential persons on board the Alida, on this occasion, a word from whom might have spared me this indignity, but there was no Edward Marshall among them to defend the weak and rebuke the strong. When Miss Sarah Jane Clark, one of America's brilliant literary ladies, known to the world under the nom de plume of Grace Greenwood, was young, and as brave as she was beautiful. I encountered a similar experience to that on the Alida on one of the Ohio River steamers. And that lady, being on board, arose from her seat at the table, expressed her disapprobation, and moved majestically away with her sister to the upper deck. Her conduct seemed to amaze the lookers-on, but it filled me with grateful admiration. When on my way to attend the Great Free Soil Convention at Pittsburgh, in 1852, which nominated John P. Hale for president, and George W. Julian for vice president, the train stopped for dinner at Alliance, Ohio, and I attempted to enter the hotel with the other delegates, but was rudely repulsed, when many of them, learning of it, rose from the table, and denounced the outrage. And refused to finish their dinners. In anticipation of our return, at the close of the convention, Mr. Sam. Beck, the proprietor of the hotel, prepared dinner for three hundred guests, but when the train arrived, not one of the large company went into his place, and his dinner was left to spoil. A dozen years ago, or more, on one of the frostiest and coldest nights I ever experienced, I delivered a lecture in the town of Elmwood, Illinois, twenty miles distant from Peoria. It was one of those bleak and flinty nights, when prairie winds pierce like needles, and a step on the snow sounds like a file on the steel teeth of a saw. My next appointment after Elmwood was on Monday night, and in order to reach it in time, it was necessary to go to Peoria the night previous, so as to take an early morning train. And I could only accomplish this by leaving Elmwood after my lecture at midnight, for there was no Sunday train. So a little before the hour at which my train was expected at Elmwood, I started for the station with my friend Mr. Brown, the gentleman who had kindly entertained me during my stay. On the way I said to him, I am going to Peoria with something like a real dread of the place. I expect to be compelled to walk the streets of that city all night to keep from freezing. I told him that the last time I was there I could obtain no shelter at any hotel, and that I feared I should meet a similar exclusion tonight. Mr. Brown was visibly affected by the statement, and for some time was silent. At last, as if suddenly discovering a way out of a painful situation, he said, I know a man in Peoria, should the hotels be closed against you there, who would gladly open his doors to you, a man who will receive you at any hour of the night. And in any weather, and that man is Robert J. Ingersoll. Why, said I, it would not do to disturb a family at such a time as I shall arrive there, on a night so cold as this. No matter about the hour, he said. Neither he nor his family would be happy if they thought you were shelterless on such a night. I know Mr. Ingersoll, and that he will be glad to welcome you at midnight or at cockcrow. I became much interested by this description of Mr. Ingersoll. Fortunately I had no occasion for disturbing him or his family. I found quarters at the best hotel in the city for the night. In the morning I resolved to know more of this now famous and noted infidel. I gave him an early 513 call, for I was not so abundant in cash as to refuse hospitality in a strange city when on a mission of goodwill to men. The experiment worked admirably. Mr. Ingersoll was at home, and if I have ever met a man with real living human sunshine in his face, and honest, manly kindness in his voice, I met one who possessed these qualities that morning. 
I received a welcome from Mr. Ingersoll and his family which would have been a cordial to the bruised heart of any proscribed and storm-beaten stranger, and one which I can never forget or fail to appreciate. Perhaps there were Christian ministers and Christian families in Peoria at that time by whom I might have been received in the same gracious manner. In charity I am bound to say there probably were such ministers and such families, but I am equally bound to say that in my former visits to this place I had failed to find them. Incidents of this character have greatly tended to liberalize my views as to the value of creeds in estimating the character of men. They have brought me to the conclusion that genuine goodness is the same, whether found inside or outside the church, and that to be an infidel no more proves a man to be selfish, mean, and wicked, than to be evangelical proves him to be honest, just, and humane. It may possibly be inferred from what I have said of the prevalence of prejudice, and the practice of prescription, that I have had a very miserable sort of life, or that I must be remarkably insensible to public aversion. Neither inference is true. I have neither been miserable because of the ill feeling of those about me, nor indifferent to popular approval, and I think, upon the whole, I have passed a tolerably cheerful and even joyful life. I have never felt myself isolated since I entered the field to plead the cause of the slave, and demand equal rights for all. In every town and city where it has been my lot to speak, there have been raised up for me friends of both colors to cheer and strengthen me in my work. I have always felt, too, that I had on my side all the invisible forces of the moral government of the universe. 514 Happily for me I have had the wit to distinguish between what is merely artificial and transient and what is fundamental and permanent, and resting on the latter, I could cheerfully encounter the former. How do you feel, said a friend to me, when you are hooted and jeered on the street on account of your color. I feel as if an ass had kicked but had hit nobody, was my answer. I have been greatly helped to bear up under unfriendly conditions, too, by a constitutional tendency to see the funny sides of things which has enabled me to laugh at follies that others would soberly resent. Besides, there were compensations as well as drawbacks in my relations to the white race. A passenger on the deck of a Hudson River steamer, covered with a shawl, well-worn and dingy, I was addressed by a remarkably religiously missionary-looking man in black coat and white cravat. Who took me for one of the noble red men of the far west, with, from away back. I was silent, and he added, Indian, Indian. No, no, I said, I am a negro. The dear man seemed to have no missionary work with me, and retreated with evident marks of disgust. On another occasion, Traveling by a night train on the New York Central Railroad, when the cars were crowded and seats were scarce, and I was occupying a whole seat, the only luxury my color afforded me in traveling. I had laid down with my head partly covered, thinking myself secure in my possession, when a well-dressed man approached and wished to share the seat with me. Slightly rising, I said, Don't sit down here, my friend, I am a nigger. I don't care who the devil you are, he said, I mean to sit with you. Well, if it must be so, I said, I can stand it if you can, and we at once fell into a very pleasant conversation, and passed the hours on the road very happily together. These two incidents illustrate my career in respect of popular prejudice. If I have had kicks, I have also had kindness. If cast down, I have been exalted, and the latter experience has, after all, far exceeded the former. During a quarter of a century I resided in the city of Rochester, N.Y. When I removed from there, my friends caused a marble bust to be made from me, and have since honored it with a place in Sibley Hall, of Rochester University. Less in a spirit of vanity than that of gratitude, I copy here the remarks of the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle on the occasion. And on my letter of thanks for the honor done me by my friends and fellow citizens of that beautiful city. Rochester, June 28, 1879. Frederick Douglass. It will be remembered that a bust of Frederick Douglass was recently placed in Sibley Hall of the University of Rochester. The ceremonies were quite informal, too informal, we think, as commemorating a deserved tribute from the people of Rochester to one who will always rank as among her most distinguished citizens. Mr. Douglass himself was not notified officially of the event and therefore could, in no public manner, take notice of it. He was, however, 
informed privately of it by the gentleman whose address is given below, and responded to it most happily, as will be seen by the following letter which we are permitted to publish. Then follows the letter which I omit, and add the further comments of the chronicle. It were alone worth all the efforts of the gentlemen who united in the fitting recognition of the public services and the private worth of Frederick Douglass, to have inspired a letter thus tender in its sentiment. And so suggestive of the various phases of a career than which the Republic has witnessed none more strange or more noble. Frederick Douglass can hardly be said to have risen to greatness on account of the opportunities which the Republic offers to self-made men, and concerning which we are apt to talk with an abundance of self-gratulation. It sought to fetter his mind equally with his body. For him it builded no schoolhouse, and for him it erected no church. So far as he was concerned freedom was a mockery, and law was the instrument of tyranny. In spite of law and gospel, despite of statutes which thralled him and opportunities which jeered at him, he made himself by trampling on the law and breaking through the thick darkness that encompassed him. There is no sadder commentary upon American slavery than the life of Frederick Douglass. He put it under his feet and stood erect in the majesty of his intellect. But how many intellects as brilliant and as powerful as his it stamped upon and crushed, no mortal can tell until the secrets of its terrible despotism are fully revealed. Thanks to the conquering might of American freemen, such sad beginnings of such illustrious lives as that of Frederick Douglass are no longer possible. And that they are no longer possible, is largely due to him who, when his lips were unlocked, became a deliverer of his people. Not alone did his voice proclaim emancipation. 516 eloquent as was that voice, his life in its pathos and in its grandeur, was more eloquent still. And where shall be found, in the annals of humanity, a sweeter rendering of poetic justice than that he, who has passed through such vicissitudes of degradation and exaltation, has been permitted to behold the redemption of his race. Rochester is proud to remember that Frederick Douglass was, for many years, one of her citizens. He who pointed out the house where Douglass lived, hardly exaggerated when he called it the residence of the greatest of our citizens. For Douglass must rank as among the greatest men, not only of this city, but of the nation as well, great in gifts, greater in utilizing them, great in his inspiration, greater in his efforts for humanity, great in the persuasion of his speech. Greater in the purpose that informed it. Rochester could do nothing more graceful than to perpetuate in marble the features of this citizen in her hall of learning, and it is pleasant for her to know that he so well appreciates the esteem in which he is held here. It was a thoughtful thing for Rochester to do, and the response is as heartfelt as the tribute is appropriate. Chapter 18 Honor to Whom Honor Grateful Recognition Friends in Need, Lucretia Mott, Lydia Maria Child, Sarah and Angelina Grimke, Abby Kelly, H. Beecher Stowe, Other Friends, Woman Suffrage. Gratitude to benefactors is a well-recognized virtue, and to express it in some form or other, however imperfectly, is a duty to ourselves as well as to those who have helped us. Never reluctant or tardy, I trust, in the discharge of this duty, I have seldom been satisfied with the manner of its performance. When I have made my best effort in this line, my words have done small justice to my feelings. And now, in mentioning my obligations to my special friends, and acknowledging the help I received from them in the days of my need, I can hope to do no better than give a faint hint of my sense of the value of their friendship and assistance. I have sometimes been credited with having been the architect of my own fortune, and have pretty generally received the title of a self-made man. And while I cannot altogether disclaim this title, when I look back over the facts of my life, and consider the helpful influences exerted upon me, by friends more fortunately born and educated than myself, I am compelled to give them at least an equal measure of credit, with myself, for the success which has attended my labors in life. The little energy, industry, and perseverance which have been mine, would hardly have availed me, in the absence of thoughtful friends and highly favoring circumstances. Without these, the last forty years of my life might have been spent on the wharves of New Bedford, rolling oil casks, loading ships for whaling voyages, sawing wood, putting in coal, picking up a job here and there, wherever I could find one. Holding 518 my own with difficulty against gaunt-sided poverty, in the race for life and bread. 
I never see one of my old companions of the lower strata, begrimed by toil, hard-handed, and dust-covered, receiving for wages scarcely enough to keep the wolf at a respectful distance from his door and hearthstone. Without a fellow feeling and the thought that I have been separated from him only by circumstances other than those of my own making. Much to be thankful for, but little room for boasting here. It was mine to take the tide at its flood. It was my good fortune to get out of slavery at the right time, and to be speedily brought into contact with that circle of highly cultivated men and women, banded together for the overthrow of slavery, of which W.M. Lloyd Garrison was the acknowledged leader. To these friends, earnest, courageous, inflexible, ready to own me as a man and brother, against all the scorn, contempt, and derision of a slavery-polluted atmosphere, I owe my success in life. The story is simple, and the truth plain. They thought that I possessed qualities that might be made useful to my race, and through them I was brought to the notice of the world, and gained a hold upon the attention of the American people, which I hope remains unbroken to this day. The list of these friends is too long certainly to be inserted here, but I cannot forbear to recall in this connection the names of Francis Jackson, Joseph Southwick, Samuel E. Sewell, Samuel J. May, John Pierpont, Henry I. Bowditch, Theodore Parker, Wendell Phillips, Edmund Quincy, Isaac T. Hopper, James N. Buffum, Ellis Gray Loring, Andrew Robeson, Seth Hunt, Arnold Buffum, Nathaniel B. Borden, Boone Spooner, William Thomas, John Milton Earl, John Curtis, George Foster, Clother Gifford, John Bailey, Nathaniel P. Rogers, Stephen S. Foster, Parker Pillsbury, The Hutchinson Family, Dar. Peleg Clark, The Burley Brothers, William Chase, Samuel and Harvey Chase, John Brown, C. C. Eldridge, Daniel Mitchell, William Adams, Isaac Kenyon, Joseph Sisson, Daniel Gould, Kelton Brothers, Geo. James Adams, Martin Cheney, Edward Harris, Robert 519 Shove, Alpheus Jones, Asa Fairbanks, General Sam L. Fessenden, William Applin, John Clark, Thomas Davis, George L. Clark. These all took me to their hearts and homes, and inspired me with an incentive which a confiding and helpful friendship can alone impart. Nor were my influential friends all of the Caucasian race. While many of my own people thought me unwise and somewhat fanatical in announcing myself a fugitive slave, and in practically asserting the rights of my people, on all occasions, in season and out of season. There were brave and intelligent men of color all over the United States who gave me their cordial sympathy and support. Among these, and foremost, I placed the name of Dr. James McCune Smith. Educated in Scotland, and breathing the free air of that country, he came back to his native land with ideas of liberty which placed him in advance of most of his fellow citizens of African descent. He was not only a learned and skillful physician, but an effective speaker, and a keen and polished writer. In my newspaper enterprise, I found in him an earnest and effective helper. The cause of his people lost an able advocate when he died. He was never among the timid who thought me too aggressive and wished me to tone down my testimony to suit the times. A brave man himself, he knew how to esteem courage in others. Of David Ruggles I have already spoken. He gave me my send-off from New York to New Bedford, and when I came into public life, he was among the first with words of cheer. Jehiel C. Beeman too, a noble man, kindly took me by the hand. Thomas Van Rouselier was among my fast friends. No young man, starting in an untried field of usefulness, and needing support, could find that support in larger measure than I found it, in William Whipper, Robert Purvis, William P. Powell, Nathan Johnson, Charles B. Ray, Thomas Downing, Theodore S. Wright, Charles L. Friesen. Notwithstanding what I have said of my treatment, at times, by people of my own color, when traveling, I am bound to say that their 520 is another and brighter side to that picture. Among the waiters and attendants on public conveyances, I have often found real gentlemen, intelligent, aspiring, and those who fully appreciated all my efforts in behalf of our common cause. Especially have I found this to be the case in the East. A more gentlemanly and self-respecting class of men it would be difficult to find, than those to be met on the various lines between New York and Boston. 
I have never wanted for kind attention, or any effort they could make to render my journeying with them smooth and pleasant. I owe this solely to my work in our common cause, and to their intelligent estimate of the value of that work. Republics are said to be ungrateful, but ingratitude is not among the weaknesses of my people. No people ever had a more lively sense of the value of faithful endeavor to serve their interests than they. But for this feeling towards me on their part, I might have passed many nights hungry and cold, and without any place to lay my head. I need not name my colored friends to whom I am thus indebted. They do not desire such mention, but I wish any who have shown me kindness, even so much as to give me a cup of cold water, to feel themselves included in my thanks. It is also due to myself, to make some more emphatic mention than I have yet done, of the honorable women, who have not only assisted me, but who according to their opportunity and ability, have generously contributed to the abolition of slavery and the recognition of the equal manhood of the colored race. When the true history of the anti-slavery cause shall be written, woman will occupy a large space in its pages, for the cause of the slave has been peculiarly woman's cause. Her heart and her conscience have supplied in large degree its motive and mainspring. Her skill, industry, patience, and perseverance have been wonderfully manifest in every trial hour. Not only did her feet run on willing errands, and her fingers do the work which in large degree supplied the sinews of war, but her deep moral convictions, and her tender 521 human sensibilities, found convincing and persuasive expression by her pen and her voice. Foremost among these notable American women, who in point of clearness of vision, breadth of understanding, fullness of knowledge, catholicity of spirit, weight of character, and widespread influence, was Lucretia Mott of Philadelphia. Great as this woman was in speech, and persuasive as she was in her writings, she was incomparably greater in her presence. She spoke to the world through every line of her countenance. In her there was no lack of symmetry, no contradiction between her thought and act. Seated in an anti-slavery meeting, looking benignantly around upon the assembly, her silent presence made others eloquent, and carried the argument home to the heart of the audience. The known approval of such a woman of any cause, went far to commend it. I shall never forget the first time I ever saw and heard Lucretia Mott. It was in the town of Lynn, Massachusetts. It was not in a magnificent hall, where such as she seemed to belong, but in a little hall over Jonathan Buffum's store, the only place then open, even in that so-called radical anti-slavery town, for an anti-slavery meeting on Sunday. But in this day of small things, the smallness of the place was no matter of complaint or murmuring. It was a cause of rejoicing that any kind of place could be had for such a purpose. But Jonathan Buffum's courage was equal to this and more. The speaker was attired in the usual Quaker dress, free from startling colors, plain, rich, elegant, and without superfluity, the very sight of her a sermon. In a few moments after she began to speak, I saw before me no more a woman, but a glorified presence, bearing a message of light and love from the infinite to a benighted and strangely wandering world. Straying away from the paths of truth and justice into the wilderness of pride and selfishness, where peace is lost and true happiness is sought in vain. I heard Mrs. Mott thus, 522 when she was comparatively young. I have often heard her since, sometimes in the solemn temple, and sometimes under the open sky, but whenever and wherever I have listened to her, my heart was always made better, and my spirit raised by her words. And in speaking thus for myself I am sure I am expressing the experience of thousands. Kindred in spirit with Mrs. Mott was Lydia Maria Child. They both exerted an influence with a class of the American people which neither Garrison, Phillips, nor Garrett Smith could reach. Sympathetic in her nature, it was easy for her to remember those in bonds as bound with them. And her appeal for that class of Americans called Africans, issued, as it was, at an early stage in the anti-slavery conflict, was one of the most effective agencies in arousing attention to the cruelty and injustice of slavery. When with her husband, David Lee Child, she edited the National Anti-Slavery Standard, that paper was made attractive to a broad circle of readers, from the circumstance that each issue contained a letter from New York. Written by her on some passing subject of the day, in which she always managed to infuse a spirit of brotherly love and goodwill, 
with an abhorrence of all that was unjust, selfish, and mean. And in this way won many hearts to anti-slavery who else would have remained cold and indifferent. Of Sarah and Angelina Grimke I knew but little personally. These brave sisters from Charleston, South Carolina, had inherited slaves, but in their conversion from Episcopacy to Quakerism, in 1828, became convinced that they had no right to such inheritance. They emancipated their slaves and came north and entered at once upon the pioneer work in the advancing education of woman, though they saw then in their course only their duty to the slave. They had fought the good fight before I came into the ranks, but by their unflinching testimony and unwavering courage, they had opened the way and made it possible, if not easy, for other women to follow their example. It is memorable of them that their public advocacy of anti-slavery was made the occasion of the issuing of a papal bull in the form of a pastoral letter, by the evangelical clergy of Boston, in which the churches and all God-fearing people were warned against their influence. For solid, persistent, indefatigable work for the slave, Abby Kelly was without rival. In the History of Woman Suffrage, just published by Mrs. Stanton, Miss Anthony, and Mrs. Goslin Gage, there is this fitting tribute to her, Abby Kelly was the most untiring and most persecuted of all the women who labored throughout the anti-slavery struggle. She traveled up and down, alike in winter's cold and summer's heat, with scorn, ridicule, violence, and mobs accompanying her, suffering all kinds of persecutions, still speaking whenever and wherever she gained an audience, in the open air. In schoolhouse, barn, depot, church, or public hall, on weekday or Sunday, as she found opportunity. And, incredible as it will soon seem, if it does not appear so already, for listening to her on Sunday many men and women were expelled from their churches. When the abolitionists of Rhode Island were seeking to defeat the restricted constitution of the Door Party, already referred to in this volume, Abby Kelly was more than once mobbed in the old town hall in the city of Providence. And pelted with bad eggs. And what can be said of the gifted authoress of Uncle Tom's Cabin, Harriet Beecher Stowe? Happy woman must she be, that to her was given the power, in such unstinted measure, to touch and move the popular heart. More than to reason or religion are we indebted to the influence which this wonderful delineation of American chattel slavery produced on the public mind. Nor must I omit to name the daughter of the excellent Myron Holly, who in her youth and beauty espoused the cause of the slave, nor of Lucy Stone and Antoinette Brown. For when the slave had few friends and advocates they were noble enough to speak their best word in his behalf. Others there were, who, though they were not known on the platform, were none the less earnest and effective for anti-slavery in their more retired lives. There were many such to greet me, and welcome me to my newly found heritage of freedom. They met me as a brother, and by their kind consideration did much to make endurable the rebuffs I encountered elsewhere. At the anti-slavery office in Providence, Rhode Island, I remember with a peculiar interest Lucinda Wilmarth, whose acceptance of life's duties and labors, and whose heroic struggle with sickness and death, taught me more than one lesson. And Amarency Payne, never weary in performing any service, however arduous, which fidelity to the slave demanded of her. Then there was Phoebe Jackson, Elizabeth Chase, the Sisson sisters, the Chases, the Greens, the Browns, the Goulds, the Shoves, the Anthonys, the Roses, the Fairweathers, the Motts, the Earls, the Spooners, the Southwicks, the Buffums, the Fords. The Wilbers, the Henshaws, the Burgesses, and others whose names are lost, but whose deeds are living yet in the regenerated life of our new republic, cleansed from the curse and sin of slavery. Observing woman's agency, devotion, and efficiency in pleading the cause of the slave, gratitude for this high service early moved me to give favorable attention to the subject of what is called woman's rights. And caused me to be denominated a woman's rights man. I am glad to say I have never been ashamed to be thus designated. Recognizing not sex, nor physical strength, but moral intelligence and the ability to discern right from wrong, good from evil, and the power to choose between them, as the true basis of republican government, to which all are alike subject. And bound alike to obey, I was not long in reaching the conclusion that there was no foundation in reason or justice for woman's exclusion from the right of choice in the selection of the persons who should frame the laws. 
and thus shape the destiny of all the people, irrespective of sex. In a conversation with Mrs. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, when she was yet a young lady, and an earnest abolitionist, she was 525 at the pains of setting before me, in a very strong light, the wrong and injustice of this exclusion. I could not meet her arguments except with the shallow plea of custom, natural division of duties, indelicacy of woman's taking part in politics, the common talk of woman's sphere, and the like, all of which that able woman, who was then no less logical than now, brushed away by those arguments which she has so often and effectively used since, and which no man has yet successfully refuted. If intelligence is the only true and rational basis of government, it follows that that is the best government which draws its life and power from the largest sources of wisdom, energy, and goodness at its command. The force of this reasoning would be easily comprehended and readily assented to in any case involving the employment of physical strength. We should all see the folly and madness of attempting to accomplish with a part what could only be done with the united strength of the whole. Though this folly may be less apparent, it is just as real, when one half of the moral and intellectual power of the world is excluded from any voice or vote in civil government. In this denial of the right to participate in government, not merely the degradation of woman and the perpetuation of a great injustice happens. But the maiming and repudiation of one half of the moral and intellectual power for the government of the world. Thus far all human governments have been failures, for none have secured, except in a partial degree, the ends for which governments are instituted. War, slavery, injustice, and oppression, and the idea that might makes right, have been uppermost in all such governments. And the weak, for whose protection governments are ostensibly created, have had practically no rights which the strong have felt bound to respect. The slayers of thousands have been exalted into heroes, and the worship of mere physical force has been considered glorious. Nations have been and still are but armed camps, expending their wealth and strength and ingenuity in forging weapons of destruction 526 against each other. And while it may not be contended that the introduction of the feminine element in government would entirely cure this tendency to exalt might over right. Many reasons can be given to show that woman's influence would greatly tend to check and modify this barbarous and destructive tendency. At any rate, seeing that the male governments of the world have failed, it can do no harm to try the experiment of a government by man and woman united. But it is not my purpose to argue the question here, but simply to state, in a brief way, the ground of my espousal of the cause of woman's suffrage. I believed that the exclusion of my race from participation in government was not only a wrong, but a great mistake, because it took from that race motives for high thought and endeavor, and degraded them in the eyes of the world around them. Man derives a sense of his consequence in the world not merely subjectively, but objectively. If from the cradle through life the outside world brands a class as unfit for this or that work, the character of the class will come to resemble and conform to the character described. To find valuable qualities in our fellows, such qualities must be presumed and expected. I would give woman a vote, give her a motive to qualify herself to vote, precisely as I insisted upon giving the colored man the right to vote. In order that he should have the same motives for making himself a useful citizen as those in force in the case of other citizens. In a word, I have never yet been able to find one consideration, one argument, or suggestion in favor of man's right to participate in civil government which did not equally apply to the right of woman. Chapter 19 Retrospection Meeting of colored citizens in Washington to express their sympathy at the great national bereavement, the death of President Garfield, concluding reflections and convictions. On the day of the interment of the late James A. Garfield, at Lakeview Cemetery, Cleveland, Ohio, a day of gloom long to be remembered as the closing scene in one of the most tragic and startling dramas ever witnessed in this, or in any other country. The colored people of the District of Columbia assembled in the 15th Street Presbyterian Church, and expressed by appropriate addresses and resolutions, their respect for the character and memory of the illustrious deceased. On that occasion I was called on to preside, and by way of introducing the subsequent proceedings, leaving to others the grateful office of delivering eulogies, made the following brief reference to the solemn and touching event. Friends and Fellow Citizens 
Today our common mother earth has closed over the mortal remains of James A. Garfield, at Cleveland, Ohio. The light of no day in our national history has brought to the American people a more intense bereavement, a deeper sorrow, or a more profound sense of humiliation. It seems only as yesterday, that in my quality as United States Marshal of the District of Columbia, it was made my duty and privilege to walk at the head of the column in advance of this our President-elect. From the crowded Senate chamber of the National Capitol, through the long corridors, and the grand rotunda, beneath the majestic dome, to the platform on the portico, where amid a sea of transcendent pomp and glory, he who is now dead, was hailed with tumultuous applause from uncounted thousands of his fellow citizens, and was inaugurated Chief Magistrate of the United States. The scene was one never to be forgotten by those who beheld it. It was a great day for the nation, glad and proud to do honor to their 528 chosen ruler. It was a glad day for James A. Garfield. It was a glad day for me, that I, one of the proscribed race, was permitted to bear so prominent a part in its august ceremonies. Mr. Garfield was then in the midst of his years, in the fullness and vigor of his manhood, covered with honors beyond the reach of princes, entering upon a career more abundant in promise than ever invited president or potentate before. Alas, what a contrast, as he lay in state under the same broad dome, viewed by sorrowful thousands day after day. What is the life of man? What are all his plans, purposes, and hopes? What are the shouts of the multitude, the pride and pomp of this world? How vain and unsubstantial, in the light of this sad and shocking experience, do they all appear? Who can tell what a day or an hour will bring forth? Such reflections inevitably present themselves, as most natural and fitting on an occasion like this. Fellow citizens, we are here to take suitable notice of the sad and appalling event of the hour. We are here, not merely as American citizens, but as colored American citizens. Although our hearts have gone along with those of the nation at large, with every expression, with every token and demonstration of honor to the dead, sympathy with the living, and abhorrence for the horrible deed which has at last done its final work. Though we have watched with beating hearts, the long and heroic struggle for life, and endured all the agony of suspense and fear, we have felt that something more, something more specific and distinctive, was due from us. Our relation to the American people makes us in some sense a peculiar class, and unless we speak separately, our voice is not heard. We therefore propose to put on record tonight our sense of the worth of President Garfield, and of the calamity involved in his death. Called to preside on this occasion, my part in the speaking shall be brief. I cannot claim to have been on intimate terms with the late President. There are other gentlemen here, who are better qualified to speak of his character than myself. I may say, however, that 529 soon after he came to Washington, I had a conversation with him of much interest to the colored people, since it indicated his just and generous intentions towards them. And goes far to present him in the light of a wise and patriotic statesman, and a friend of our race. I called at the executive mansion, and was received very kindly by Mr. Garfield, who, in the course of the conversation said, that he felt the time had come when a step should be taken in advance, in recognition of the claims of colored citizens. And expressed his intention of sending some colored representatives abroad to other than colored nations. He inquired of me how I thought such representations would be received. I assured him that I thought they would be well received. That in my own experience abroad, I had observed that the higher we go in the gradations of human society, the farther we get from prejudice of race or color. I was greatly pleased with the assurance of his liberal policy towards us. I remarked to him, that no part of the American people would be treated with respect, if systematically ignored by the government, and denied all participation in its honors and emoluments. To this he assented, and went so far as to propose my going in a representative capacity to an important post abroad, a compliment which I gratefully acknowledged, but respectfully declined. To say the truth, I wished to remain at home, and retain the office of United States Marshal of the District of Columbia. It is a great thing for Han. John Mercer Langston to represent this republic at Port-au-Prince, and for Henry Highland Garnet to represent us in Liberia, but it would be indeed a step in advance, 
to have some colored men sent to represent us in white nationalities. And we have reason for profound regret that Mr. Garfield could not have lived to carry out his just and wise intentions towards us. I might say more of this conversation, but I will not detain you except to say, that America has had many great men, but no man among them all has had better things said of him. Then he who has been reverently committed to the dust in Cleveland today. Mr. Douglas then called upon Professor Greener, who read a series of resolutions eloquently expressive of their sense of the great loss that had been sustained, and their sympathy with the family of the late president. Prof. Greener then spoke briefly and was followed by Professor John M. Langston and Rev. W. W. Hicks. All the speakers expressed their confidence in President Arthur and in his ability to give the country a wise and beneficial administration. Conclusion As far as this volume can reach that point I have now brought my readers to the end of my story. What may remain of life to me, through what experiences I may pass, what heights I may attain, into what depths I may fall, what good or ill may come to me, or proceed from me in this breathing world, where all is change, uncertainty. And largely at the mercy of powers over which the individual man has no absolute control, if thought worthy and useful, will probably be told by others when I have passed from the busy stage of life. I am not looking for any great changes in my fortunes or achievements in the future. The most of the space of life is behind me, and the sun of my day is nearing the horizon. Notwithstanding all that is contained in this book my day has been a pleasant one. My joys have far exceeded my sorrows, and my friends have brought me far more than my enemies have taken from me. I have written out my experience here, not to exhibit my wounds and bruises to awaken and attract sympathy to myself personally, but as a part of the history of a profoundly interesting period in American life and progress. I have meant it to be a small individual contribution to the sum of knowledge of this special period, to be handed down to after-coming generations which may want to know what things were allowed and what prohibited. What moral, social, and political relations subsisted between the different varieties of the American people down to the last quarter of the 19th century, and by what means they were modified and changed. The time is at hand when the last American slave, and the 531 last American slaveholder will disappear behind the curtain which separates the living from the dead. And when neither master nor slave will be left to tell the story of their respective relations, and what happened in those relations to either. My part has been to tell the story of the slave. The story of the master never wanted for narrators. They have had all the talent and genius that wealth and influence could command to tell their story. They have had their full day in court. Literature, theology, philosophy, law, and learning, have come willingly to their service, and if condemned they have not been condemned unheard. It will be seen in these pages that I have lived several lives in one. First, the life of slavery. Secondly, the life of a fugitive from slavery. Thirdly, the life of comparative freedom. Fourthly, the life of conflict and battle. And, fifthly, the life of victory, if not complete at least assured. To those who have suffered in slavery, I can say I too have suffered. To those who have taken some risks and encountered hardships in the flight from bondage, I can say I too have endured and risked. To those who have battled for liberty, brotherhood, and citizenship, I can say I too have battled, and to those who have lived to enjoy the fruits of victory, I can say I too live and rejoice. If I have pushed my example too prominently for the good taste of my Caucasian readers I beg them to remember that I have written in part for the encouragement of a class whose aspirations need the stimulus of success. I have aimed to assure them that knowledge can be obtained under difficulties, that poverty may give place to competency. That obscurity is not an absolute bar to distinction, and that a way is open to welfare and happiness to all who will resolutely and wisely pursue that way. That neither slavery, stripes, imprisonment, or proscription, need extinguish self-respect, crush manly ambition, or paralyze effort. That no power outside of himself can prevent a man from sustaining an honorable character and a useful relation to his day and generation, that neither institutions nor friends can make a race to stand unless it has strength in its own legs. That 532 there is no power in the world which can be relied upon to help the weak against the strong, the simple against the wise, 
that races like individuals must stand or fall by their own merits. That all the prayers of Christendom cannot stop the force of a single bullet, divest arsenic of poison, or suspend any law of nature. In my communication with the colored people I have endeavored to deliver them from the power of superstition, bigotry, and priestcraft. In theology I have found them strutting about in the old clothes of the masters, just as the masters strut about in the old clothes of the past. The falling power remains among them long since it has ceased to be the religious fashion of our refined and elegant white churches. I have taught that the fault is not in our stars but in ourselves that we are underlings, that, who would be free, themselves must strike the blow. I have urged upon them self-reliance, self-respect, industry, perseverance, and economy, to make the best of both worlds, but to make the best of this world first because it comes first. And that he who does not improve himself by the motives and opportunities afforded by this world gives the best evidence that he would not improve in any other world. Schooled as I have been among the abolitionists of New England, I recognize that the universe is governed by laws which are unchangeable and eternal, that what men so they will reap. And that there is no way to dodge or circumvent the consequences of any act or deed. My views at this point receive but limited endorsement among my people. They for the most part think they have means of procuring special favor and help from the Almighty, and as their faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. They find much in this expression which is true to faith but utterly false to fact. But I meant here only to say a word in conclusion. Forty years of my life have been given to the cause of my people, and if I had forty years more they should all be sacredly given to the great cause. If I have done something for that cause, I am after all more a debtor to it than it is debtor to me. Appendix Oration by Frederick Douglass, delivered on the occasion of the unveiling of the Freedmen's Monument, in memory of Abraham Lincoln, in Lincoln Park, Washington, D.C., April 14, 1876. Friends and Fellow Citizens I warmly congratulate you upon the highly interesting object which has caused you to assemble in such numbers and spirit as you have today. This occasion is in some respects remarkable. Wise and thoughtful men of our race, who shall come after us, and study the lesson of our history in the United States, who shall survey the long and dreary spaces over which we have traveled. Who shall count the links in the great chain of events by which we have reached our present position, will make a note of this occasion, they will think of it and speak of it with a sense of manly pride and complacency. I congratulate you, also, upon the very favorable circumstances in which we meet today. They are high, inspiring, and uncommon. They lend grace, glory, and significance to the object for which we have met. Nowhere else in this great country, with its uncounted towns and cities, unlimited wealth, and immeasurable territory extending from sea to sea, could conditions be found more favorable to the success of this occasion than here. We stand today at the National Center to perform something like a national act, an act which is to go into history, and we are here where every pulsation of the national heart can be heard, felt, and reciprocated. A thousand wires, fed 534 with thought and winged with lightning, put us in instantaneous communication with the loyal and true men all over this country. Few facts could better illustrate the vast and wonderful change which has taken place in our condition as a people, than the fact of our assembling here for the purpose we have today. Harmless, beautiful, proper, and praiseworthy as this demonstration is, I cannot forget that no such demonstration would have been tolerated here twenty years ago. The spirit of slavery and barbarism, which still lingers to blight and destroy in some dark and distant parts of our country, would have made our assembling here the signal and excuse for opening upon us all the floodgates of wrath and violence. That we are here in peace today is a compliment and a credit to American civilization, and a prophecy of still greater national enlightenment and progress in the future. I refer to the past not in malice, for this is no day for malice but simply to place more distinctly in front the gratifying and glorious change which has come both to our white fellow citizens and ourselves, and to congratulate all upon the contrast between now and then. The new dispensation of freedom with its thousand blessings to both races, and the old dispensation of slavery with its ten thousand evils to both races, white and black. In view, then, of the past, the present, and the future, 
with the long and dark history of our bondage behind us, and with liberty, progress, and enlightenment before us, I again congratulate you upon this auspicious day and hour. Friends and fellow citizens, the story of our presence here is soon and easily told. We are here in the District of Columbia, here in the city of Washington, the most luminous point of American territory. A city recently transformed and made beautiful in its body and in its spirit, we are here in the place where the ablest and best men of the country are sent to devise the policy, enact the laws, and shape the destiny of the Republic. We are here, with the stately pillars and majestic dome of the capital of the nation looking down 535 upon us. We are here, with the broad earth freshly adorned with the foliage and flowers of spring for our church, and all races, colors, and conditions of men for our congregation, in a word, we are here to express, as best we may. By appropriate forms and ceremonies, our grateful sense of the vast, high, and preeminent services rendered to ourselves, to our race, to our country, and to the whole world by Abraham Lincoln. The sentiment that brings us here today is one of the noblest that can stir and thrill the human heart. It has crowned and made glorious the high places of all civilized nations with the grandest and most enduring works of art, designed to illustrate the characters and perpetuate the memories of great public men. It is the sentiment which from year to year adorns with fragrant and beautiful flowers the graves of our loyal, brave, and patriotic soldiers who fell in defense of the Union and Liberty. It is the sentiment of gratitude and appreciation, which often, in the presence of many who hear me, has filled yonder heights of Arlington with the eloquence of eulogy and the sublime enthusiasm of poetry and song. A sentiment which can never die while the Republic lives. For the first time in the history of our people, and in the history of the whole American people, we join in this high worship, and march conspicuously in the line of this time-honored custom. First things are always interesting, and this is one of our first things. It is the first time that, in this form and manner, we have sought to do honor to an American great man, however deserving and illustrious. I commend the fact to notice. Let it be told in every part of the Republic, let men of all parties and opinions hear it. Let those who despise us, not less than those who respect us, know that now and here, in the spirit of liberty, loyalty, and gratitude, let it be known everywhere. And by everybody who takes an interest in human progress and in the amelioration of the condition of mankind, that, in the presence and with the approval of the members of the American House of Representatives. 536 Reflecting the general sentiment of the country, that in the presence of that august body, the American Senate, representing the highest intelligence and the calmest judgment in the country. In presence of the Supreme Court and Chief Justice of the United States, to whose decisions we all patriotically bow. In the presence and under the steady eye of the honored and trusted President of the United States, with the members of his wise and patriotic cabinet, we, the colored people, newly emancipated and rejoicing in our blood-bought freedom. Near the close of the first century in the life of this republic, have now and here unveiled, set apart, and dedicated a monument of enduring granite and bronze, in every line, feature, and figure of which the men of this generation may read and those of aftercoming generations may read, something of the exalted character and great works of Abraham Lincoln, the first martyr president of the United States. Fellow citizens, in what we have said and done today, and in what we may say and do hereafter, we disclaim everything like arrogance and assumption. We claim for ourselves no superior devotion to the character, history, and memory of the illustrious name whose monument we have here dedicated today. We fully comprehend the relation of Abraham Lincoln both to ourselves and to the white people of the United States. Truth is proper and beautiful at all times and in all places. And it is never more proper and beautiful in any case than when speaking of a great public man whose example is likely to be commended for honor and imitation long after his departure to the solemn shades, the silent continents of eternity. It must be admitted, truth compels me to admit, even here in the presence of the monument we have erected to his memory, Abraham Lincoln was not, in the fullest sense of the word, either our man or our model. In his interests, in his associations, in his habits of thought, and in his prejudices, he was a white man. He was preeminently the white man's president, entirely 537 devoted to the welfare of white men. 
He was ready and willing at any time during the first years of his administration to deny, postpone, and sacrifice the rights of humanity in the colored people to promote the welfare of the white people of this country. In all his education and feeling he was an American of the Americans. He came into the presidential chair upon one principle alone, namely, opposition to the extension of slavery. His arguments in furtherance of this policy had their motive and mainspring in his patriotic devotion to the interests of his own race. To protect, defend, and perpetuate slavery in the states where it existed Abraham Lincoln was not less ready than any other president to draw the sword of the nation. He was ready to execute all the supposed constitutional guarantees of the United States Constitution in favor of the slave system anywhere inside the slave states. He was willing to pursue, recapture, and send back the fugitive slave to his master, and to suppress a slave rising for liberty, though his guilty master were already in arms against the government. The race to which we belong were not the special objects of his consideration. Knowing this, I concede to you, my white fellow citizens, a preeminence in this worship at once full and supreme. First, midst, and last, you and yours were the objects of his deepest affection and his most earnest solicitude. You are the children of Abraham Lincoln. We are at best only his stepchildren. Children by adoption, children by force of circumstances and necessity. To you it especially belongs to sound his praises, to preserve and perpetuate his memory, to multiply his statues, to hang his pictures high upon your walls, and commend his example, for to you he was a great and glorious friend and benefactor. Instead of supplanting you at this altar, we would exhort you to build high his monuments, let them be of the most costly material, of the most cunning workmanship, let their forms be symmetrical, beautiful, and perfect. Let their bases be upon solid rocks, and their summits lean against the unchanging blue, overhanging sky, and let them 538 endure forever. But while in the abundance of your wealth, and in the fullness of your just and patriotic devotion, you do all this, we entreat you to despise not the humble offering we this day unveil to view. For while Abraham Lincoln saved for you a country, he delivered us from a bondage, according to Jefferson, one hour of which was worse than ages of the oppression your fathers rose in rebellion to oppose. Fellow citizens, ours is no newborn zeal and devotion, merely a thing of this moment. The name of Abraham Lincoln was near and dear to our hearts in the darkest and most perilous hours of the Republic. We were no more ashamed of him when shrouded in clouds of darkness, of doubt, and defeat than when we saw him crowned with victory, honor, and glory. Our faith in him was often taxed and strained to the uttermost, but it never failed. When he tarried long in the mountain, when he strangely told us that we were the cause of the war, when he still more strangely told us to leave the land in which we were born, when he refused to employ our arms in defense of the Union. When, after accepting our services as colored soldiers, he refused to retaliate our murder and torture as colored prisoners, when he told us he would save the Union if he could with slavery. When he revoked the proclamation of emancipation of General Fremont. When he refused to remove the popular commander of the Army of the Potomac, in the days of its inaction and defeat, who was more zealous in his efforts to protect slavery than to suppress rebellion. When we saw all this, and more, we were at times grieved, stunned, and greatly bewildered, but our hearts believed while they ached and bled. Nor was this, even at that time, a blind and unreasoning superstition. Despite the mist and haze that surround him, Despite the tumult, the hurry, and confusion of the hour, we were able to take a comprehensive view of Abraham Lincoln, and to make reasonable allowance for the circumstances of his position. We saw him, measured him, and estimated him, not by stray utterances to injudicious and tedious delegations, who often 539 tried his patience, not by isolated facts torn from their connection. Not by any partial and imperfect glimpses, caught at inopportune moments. But by a broad survey, in the light of the stern logic of great events, and in view of that divinity which shapes our ends, rough hew them how we will. We came to the conclusion that the hour and the man of our redemption had somehow met in the person of Abraham Lincoln. It mattered little to us what language he might employ on special occasions, it mattered little to us, when we fully knew him, whether he was swift or slow in his movements. 
It was enough for us that Abraham Lincoln was at the head of a great movement, and was in living and earnest sympathy with that movement, which, in the nature of things, must go on until slavery should be utterly and forever abolished in the United States. When, therefore, it shall be asked what we have to do with the memory of Abraham Lincoln, or what Abraham Lincoln had to do with us, the answer is ready, full, and complete. Though he loved Caesar less than Rome, though the Union was more to him than our freedom or our future, under his wise and beneficent rule we saw ourselves gradually lifted from the depths of slavery to the heights of liberty and manhood. Under his wise and beneficent rule, and by measures approved and vigorously pressed by him, we saw that the handwriting of ages, in the form of prejudice and proscription, was rapidly fading away from the face of our whole country. Under his rule, and in due time, about as soon after all as the country could tolerate the strange spectacle, we saw our brave sons and brothers laying off the rags of bondage. And being clothed all over in the blue uniforms of the soldiers of the United States. Under his rule we saw two hundred thousand of our dark and dusky people responding to the call of Abraham Lincoln, and with muskets on their shoulders, and eagles on their buttons. Timing their high footsteps to liberty and union under the national flag. Under his rule we saw the independence of the Black Republic of Haiti 540 the special object of slaveholding aversion and horror, fully recognized, and her minister, a colored gentleman, duly received here in the city of Washington. Under his rule we saw the internal slave trade, which so long disgraced the nation, abolished, and slavery abolished in the District of Columbia. Under his rule we saw for the first time the law enforced against the foreign slave trade, and the first slave trader hanged like any other pirate or murderer. Under his rule, assisted by the greatest captain of our age, and his inspiration, we saw the Confederate States, based upon the idea that our race must be slaves, and slaves forever, battered to pieces and scattered to the four winds. Under his rule, and in the fullness of time, we saw Abraham Lincoln, after giving the slaveholders three months' grace in which to save their hateful slave system, penning the immortal paper, which, though special in its language, was general in its principles and effect, making slavery forever impossible in the United States. Though we waited long, we saw all this and more. Can any colored man, or any white man friendly to the freedom of all men, ever forget the night which followed the first day of January, 1863, when the world was to see if Abraham Lincoln would prove to be as good as his word. I shall never forget that memorable night, when in a distant city I waited and watched at a public meeting, with three thousand others not less anxious than myself, for the word of deliverance which we have heard read today. Nor shall I ever forget the outburst of joy and thanksgiving that rent the air when the lightning brought to us the Emancipation Proclamation. In that happy hour we forgot all delay, and forgot all tardiness, forgot that the President had bribed the rebels to lay down their arms by a promise to withhold the bolt which would smite the slave system with destruction. And we were thenceforward willing to allow the President all the latitude of time, phraseology, and every honorable device that statesmanship might require for the achievement of a great and beneficent measure of liberty and progress. Fellow citizens, there is little necessity on this occasion to speak at length and critically of this great and good man, and of his high mission in the world. That ground has been fully occupied and completely covered both here and elsewhere. The whole field of fact and fancy has been gleaned and garnered. Any man can say things that are true of Abraham Lincoln, but no man can say anything that is new of Abraham Lincoln. His personal traits and public acts are better known to the American people than are those of any other man of his age. He was a mystery to no man who saw him and heard him. Though high in position, the humblest could approach him and feel at home in his presence. Though deep he was transparent, though strong, he was gentle. Though decided and pronounced in his convictions, he was tolerant towards those who differed from him, and patient under reproaches. Even those who only knew him through his public utterances obtained a tolerably clear idea of his character and his personality. The image of the man went out with his words, and those who read them, knew him. I have said that President Lincoln was a white man, and shared the prejudices common to his countrymen towards the colored race. Looking back to his times and to the condition of his country. 
we are compelled to admit that this unfriendly feeling on his part may be safely set down as one element of his wonderful success in organizing the loyal American people for the tremendous conflict before them. And bringing them safely through that conflict. His great mission was to accomplish two things, first, to save his country from dismemberment and ruin, and second, to free his country from the great crime of slavery. To do one or the other, or both, he must have the earnest sympathy and the powerful cooperation of his loyal fellow countrymen. Without this primary and essential condition to success his efforts must have been vain and utterly fruitless. Had he put the abolition of slavery before the salvation of the Union, he would have inevitably driven from him a powerful class of the American people and 542 rendered resistance to rebellion impossible. Viewed from the genuine abolition ground, Mr. Lincoln seemed tardy, cold, dull, and indifferent, but measuring him by the sentiment of his country, a sentiment he was bound as a statesman to consult, he was swift, zealous, radical, and determined. Though Mr. Lincoln shared the prejudices of his white fellow countrymen against the Negro, it is hardly necessary to say that in his heart of hearts he loathed and hated slavery. The man who could say, fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war shall soon pass away, yet if God wills it continue till all the wealth piled by two hundred years of bondage shall have been wasted. And each drop of blood drawn by the lash shall have been paid for by one drawn by the sword, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether, gives all needed proof of his feeling on the subject of slavery. He was willing, while the South was loyal, that it should have its pound of flesh, because he thought it was so nominated in the bond, but farther than this no earthly power could make him go. I am naturally anti-slavery. If slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. I cannot remember when I did not so think and feel. Letter of Mr. Lincoln to Mr. Hodges, of Kentucky, April 4, 1864 Fellow citizens, whatever else in the world may be partial, unjust, and uncertain, time, time is impartial, just, and certain in its action. In the realm of mind, as well as in the realm of matter, it is a great worker, and often works wonders. The honest and comprehensive statesman, clearly discerning the needs of his country, and earnestly endeavoring to do his whole duty, though covered and blistered with reproaches, may safely leave his course to the silent judgment of time. Few great public men have ever been the victims of fiercer denunciation than Abraham Lincoln was during his administration. He was often wounded in the house of his friends. Reproaches came thick and fast upon him from within and from without, and from opposite quarters. He was assailed by abolitionists, he was assailed by 543 slaveholders, he was assailed by the men who were for peace at any price. He was assailed by those who were for a more vigorous prosecution of the war, he was assailed for not making the war an abolition war, and he was most bitterly assailed for making the war an abolition war. But now behold the change, the judgment of the present hour is, that taking him for all in all, measuring the tremendous magnitude of the work before him, considering the necessary means to ends, and surveying the end from the beginning. Infinite wisdom has seldom sent any man into the world better fitted for his mission than Abraham Lincoln. His birth, his training, and his natural endowments, both mental and physical, were strongly in his favor. Born and reared among the lowly, a stranger to wealth and luxury, compelled to grapple single-handed with the flintiest hardships of life, from tender youth to sturdy manhood. He grew strong in the manly and heroic qualities demanded by the great mission to which he was called by the votes of his countrymen. The hard condition of his early life, which would have depressed and broken down weaker men, only gave greater life, vigor, and buoyancy to the heroic spirit of Abraham Lincoln. He was ready for any kind and quality of work. What other young men dreaded in the shape of toil, he took hold of with the utmost cheerfulness. A spade, a rake, hoe. A pickaxe, or a bill. A hook to reap, a scythe to mow. A flail, or what you will. All day long he could split heavy rails in the woods, and half the night long he could study his English grammar by the uncertain flare and glare of the light made by a pine knot. He was at home on the land with his axe, with his maul, with gluts, and his wedges, and he was equally at home on water, with his oars, with his poles, with his planks, 
and with his boat hooks. And whether in his flat boat on the Mississippi 544 River, or on the fireside of his frontier cabin, he was a man of work. A son of toil himself, he was linked in brotherly sympathy with the sons of toil in every loyal part of the Republic. This very fact gave him tremendous power with the American people, and materially contributed not only to selecting him to the presidency, but in sustaining his administration of the government. Upon his inauguration as President of the United States, an office, even where assumed under the most favorable conditions, fitted to tax and strain the largest abilities, Abraham Lincoln was met by a tremendous crisis. He was called upon not merely to administer the government, but to decide, in the face of terrible odds, the fate of the Republic. A formidable rebellion rose in his path before him, the Union was practically dissolved. His country was torn and rent asunder at the center. Hostile armies were already organized against the Republic, armed with the munitions of war which the Republic had provided for its own defense. The tremendous question for him to decide was whether his country should survive the crisis and flourish, or be dismembered and perish. His predecessor in office had already decided the question in favor of national dismemberment, by denying to it the right of self-defense and self-preservation, a right which belongs to the meanest insect. Happily for the country, happily for you and for me, the judgment of James Buchanan, the patrician, was not the judgment of Abraham Lincoln, the plebeian. He brought his strong common sense, sharpened in the school of adversity, to bear upon the question. He did not hesitate, he did not doubt, he did not falter. But at once resolved at whatever peril, at whatever cost, the union of the states should be preserved. A patriot himself, his faith was strong and unwavering in the patriotism of his countrymen. Timid men said before Mr. Lincoln's inauguration, that we had seen the last president of the United States. A voice in influential quarters said, let the Union slide. Some said that a Union 545 maintained by the sword was worthless. Others said a rebellion of eight million cannot be suppressed, but in the midst of all this tumult and timidity, and against all this, Abraham Lincoln was clear in his duty, and had an oath in heaven. He calmly and bravely heard the voice of doubt and fear all around him. But he had an oath in heaven, and there was not power enough on earth to make this honest boatman, backwoods man, and broad-handed splitter of rails evade or violate that sacred oath. He had not been schooled in the ethics of slavery. His plain life had favored his love of truth. He had not been taught that treason and perjury were the proof of honor and honesty. His moral training was against his saying one thing when he meant another. The trust which Abraham Lincoln had in himself and in the people was surprising and grand, but it was also enlightened and well-founded. He knew the American people better than they knew themselves, and his truth was based upon this knowledge. Fellow citizens, the 14th day of April, 1865, of which this is the 11th anniversary, is now and will ever remain a memorable day in the annals of this republic. It was on the evening of this day, while a fierce and sanguinary rebellion was in the last stages of its desolating power, while its armies were broken and scattered before the invincible armies of Grant and Sherman. While a great nation, torn and rent by war, was already beginning to raise to the skies loud anthems of joy at the dawn of peace, it was startled, amazed, and overwhelmed by the crowning crime of slavery, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. It was a new crime, a pure act of malice. No purpose of the rebellion was to be served by it. It was the simple gratification of a hell-black spirit of revenge. But it has done good after all. It has filled the country with a deeper abhorrence of slavery and a deeper love for the great liberator. Had Abraham Lincoln died from any of the numerous ills to which flesh is heir? Had he reached that good old age of 546 which his vigorous constitution and his temperate habits gave promise? had he been permitted to see the end of his great work. Had the solemn curtain of death come down but gradually, we should still have been smitten with a heavy grief, and treasured his name lovingly. But dying as he did die, by the red hand of violence, killed, assassinated, taken off without warning, not because of personal hate, for no man who knew Abraham Lincoln could hate him, but because of his fidelity to union and liberty. He is doubly dear to us, and his memory will be precious forever. 
Fellow citizens, I end as I begun, with congratulations. We have done a good work for our race today. In doing honor to the memory of our friend and liberator, we have been doing highest honors to ourselves and those who come after us. We have been fastening ourselves to a name and fame imperishable and immortal, we have also been defending ourselves from a blighting scandal. When now it shall be said that the colored man is soulless, that he has no appreciation of benefits or benefactors. When the foul reproach of ingratitude is hurled at us, and it is attempted to scourge us beyond the range of human brotherhood, we may calmly point to the monument we have this day erected to the memory of Abraham Lincoln. West India Emancipation Extract from a speech delivered by Frederick Douglass in Elmira, N. Y. August 1, 1880, at a great meeting of colored people, met to celebrate West India Emancipation, and where he was received with marked respect and approval by the President of the day and the immense crowd there assembled. It is placed in this book partly as a grateful tribute to the noble transatlantic men and women through whose unwearied exertions the system of Negro slavery was finally abolished in all the British Isles. A. Lincoln. Mr. President, I thank you very sincerely for this cordial greeting. I hear in your speech something like a welcome 549 home after a long absence. More years of my life and labors have been spent in this than in any other state of the Union. Anywhere within a hundred miles of the goodly city of Rochester, I feel myself at home and among friends. Within that circumference, there resides a people which have no superiors in point of enlightenment, liberality, and civilization. Allow me to thank you also, for your generous words of sympathy and approval. In respect to this important support to a public man, I have been unusually fortunate. My forty years of work in the cause of the oppressed and enslaved, has been well noted, well appreciated, and well rewarded. All classes and colors of men, at home and abroad, have in this way assisted in holding up my hands. Looking back through these long years of toil and conflict, during which I have had blows to take as well as blows to give, and have sometimes received wounds and bruises, both in body and in mind. My only regret is that I have been enabled to do so little to lift up and strengthen our long enslaved and still oppressed people. My apology for these remarks personal to myself, is in the fact that I am now standing mainly in the presence of a new generation. Most of the men with whom I lived and labored in the early years of the abolition movement, have passed beyond the borders of this life. Scarcely any of the colored men who advocated our cause, and who started when I did, are now numbered among the living, and I begin to feel somewhat lonely. But while I have the sympathy and approval of men and women like these before me, I shall give with joy my latest breath in support of your claim to justice, liberty, and equality among men. The day we celebrate is preeminently the colored man's day. The great event by which it is distinguished, and by which it will forever be distinguished from all other days of the year, has justly claimed thoughtful attention among statesmen and social reformers throughout the world. While to them it is a luminous point in human history, and worthy of thought in the colored man, it addresses not merely the intelligence, but the feeling. The 550 emancipation of our brothers in the West Indies comes home to us and stirs our hearts and fills our souls with those grateful sentiments which link mankind in a common brotherhood. In the history of the American conflict with slavery, the day we celebrate has played an important part. Emancipation in the West Indies was the first bright star in a stormy sky, the first smile after a long providential frown. The first ray of hope, the first tangible fact demonstrating the possibility of a peaceable transition from slavery to freedom of the Negro race. Whoever else may forget or slight the claims of this day, it can never be other to us than memorable and glorious. The story of it shall be brief and soon told. Six and forty years ago, on the day we now celebrate, there went forth over the blue waters of the Caribbean Sea a great message from the British throne, hailed with startling shouts of joy and thrilling songs of praise. That message liberated, set free, and brought within the pale of civilization 800,000 people, who, till then, had been esteemed as beasts of burden. How vast, sudden, and startling was this transformation! In one moment, a mere tick of a watch, the twinkle of an eye, the glance of the morning sun, 
saw a bondage which had resisted the humanity of ages, defied earth and heaven, instantly ended, saw the slave whip burnt to ashes. Saw the slave's chains melted, saw his fetters broken, and the irresponsible power of the slave master over his victim forever destroyed. I have been told by eyewitnesses of the scene, that, in the first moment of it, the emancipated hesitated to accept it for what it was. They did not know whether to receive it as a reality, a dream, or a vision of the fancy. No wonder they were thus amazed, and doubtful, after their terrible years of darkness and sorrow, which seemed to have no end. Like much other good news, it was thought too good to be true. But the silence and hesitation they observed was only momentary. When fully assured the good tidings which had come across the sea to them, were not only good but true, 551 that they were indeed no longer slaves, but free. That the lash of the slave driver was no longer in the air, but buried in the earth. That their limbs were no longer chained, but subject to their own will, the manifestations of their joy and gratitude knew no bounds, and sought expression in the loudest and wildest possible forms. They ran about, they danced, they sang, they gazed into the blue sky, bounded into the air, kneeled, prayed, shouted, rolled upon the ground, embraced each other. They laughed and wept for joy. Those who witnessed the scene say they never saw anything like it before. We are sometimes asked why we American citizens annually celebrate West India emancipation when we might celebrate American emancipation. Why go abroad, say they, when we might as well stay at home? The answer is easily given. Human liberty excludes all idea of home and abroad. It is universal and spurns localization. When a deed is done for freedom. Through the broad earth's aching breast. Runs a thrill of joy prophetic. Trembling on from east to west. It is bounded by no geographical lines and knows no national limitations. Like the glorious sun of the heavens, its light shines for all. But besides this general consideration, this boundless power and glory of liberty, West India emancipation has claims upon us as an event in this nineteenth century in which we live, for rich as this century is in moral and material achievements. In progress and civilization, it can claim nothing for itself greater and grander than this act of West India emancipation. Whether we consider the matter or the manner of it, the tree or its fruit, it is noteworthy, memorable, and sublime. Especially is the manner of its accomplishment worthy of consideration. Its best lesson to the world, its most encouraging word to all who toil and trust in the cause of justice 552 and liberty, to all who oppose oppression and slavery is a word of sublime faith and courage, faith in the truth and courage in the expression. Great and valuable concessions have in different ages been made to the liberties of mankind. They have, however, come not at the command of reason and persuasion, but by the sharp and terrible edge of the sword. To this rule West India emancipation is a splendid exception. It came, not by the sword, but by the word, not by the brute force of numbers, but by the still small voice of truth. Not by barricades, bayonets, and bloody revolution, but by peaceful agitation, not by divine interference, but by the exercise of simple, human reason and feeling. I repeat, that, in this peculiarity, we have what is most valuable to the human race generally. It is a revelation of a power inherent in human society. It shows what can be done against wrong in the world, without the aid of armies on the earth or of angels in the sky. It shows that men have in their own hands the peaceful means of putting all their moral and political enemies under their feet, and of making this world a healthy and happy dwelling place, if they will faithfully and courageously use them. The world needed just such a revelation of the power of conscience and of human brotherhood, one that overleaped the accident of color and of race, and set at naught the whisperings of prejudice. The friends of freedom in England saw in the Negro a man, a moral and responsible being. Having settled this in their own minds, they, in the name of humanity, denounced the crime of his enslavement. It was the faithful, persistent, and enduring enthusiasm of Thomas Clarkson, William Wilberforce, Granville Sharp, William Nibb, Henry Brougham, Thomas Fowell Buxton, Daniel O'Connell, George Thompson. 
and their noble co-workers that finally thawed the British heart into sympathy for the slave, and moved the strong arm of that government in mercy to put an end to his bondage. Let no American, especially no colored American, withhold 553 a generous recognition of this stupendous achievement. What though it was not American, but British, what though it was not Republican, but monarchical? What though it was not from the American Congress, but from the British Parliament? What though it was not from the chair of a president, but from the throne of a queen, it was none the less a triumph of right over wrong, of good over evil, and a victory for the whole human race. Besides, we may properly celebrate this day because of its special relation to our American emancipation. In doing this we do not sacrifice the general to the special, the universal to the local. The cause of human liberty is won the whole world over. The downfall of slavery under British power meant the downfall of slavery, ultimately, under American power, and the downfall of Negro slavery everywhere. But the effect of this great and philanthropic measure, naturally enough, was greater here than elsewhere. Outside the British Empire no other nation was in a position to feel it so much as we. The stimulus it gave to the American anti-slavery movement was immediate, pronounced, and powerful. British example became a tremendous lever in the hands of American abolitionists. It did much to shame and discourage the spirit of caste and the advocacy of slavery in church and state. It could not well have been otherwise. No man liveth unto himself. What is true in this respect of individual men, is equally true of nations. Both impart good or ill to their age and generation. But putting aside this consideration, so worthy of thought, we have special reasons for claiming the 1st of August as the birthday of Negro emancipation, not only in the West Indies, but in the United States. Spite of our national independence, a common language, a common literature, a common history, and a common civilization makes us and keeps us still a part of the British nation, if not a part of the British Empire. England can take no step forward in the pathway of a higher civilization without drawing us in the same direction. 554 She is still the mother country, and the mother, too, of our abolition movement. Though her emancipation came in peace, and ours in war, though hers cost treasure, and ours blood. Though hers was the result of a sacred preference, and ours resulted in part from necessity, the motive and mainspring of the respective measures were the same in both. The abolitionists of this country have been charged with bringing on the war between the North and South, and in one sense this is true. Had there been no anti-slavery agitation at the North, there would have been no active anti-slavery anywhere to resist the demands of the slave power at the South, and where there is no resistance there can be no war. Slavery would then have been nationalized, and the whole country would then have been subjected to its power. Resistance to slavery and the extension of slavery invited and provoked secession and war to perpetuate and extend the slave system. Thus in the same sense, England is responsible for our civil war. The abolition of slavery in the West Indies gave life and vigor to the abolition movement in America. Clarkson of England gave us Garrison of America. Granville Sharp of England gave us our Wendell Phillips, and Wilberforce of England gave us our peerless Charles Sumner. These grand men and their brave co-workers here, took up the moral thunderbolts which had struck down slavery in the West Indies, and hurled them with increased zeal and power against the gigantic system of slavery here, till, goaded to madness. The traffickers in the souls and bodies of men flew to arms, rent asunder the Union at the center, and filled the land with hostile armies and the ten thousand horrors of war. Out of this tempest, out of this whirlwind and earthquake of war, came the abolition of slavery, came the employment of colored troops, came colored citizens, came colored jurymen, came colored congressmen, came colored schools in the South. And came the great amendments of our national constitution. We celebrate this day, too, for the very good reason that we have no other to celebrate. English emancipation has won 555 advantage over American emancipation. Hers has a definite anniversary. Ours has none. Like our slaves, the freedom of the Negro has no birthday. No man can tell the day of the month, or the month of the year, upon which slavery was abolished in the United States. We cannot even tell when it began to be abolished. 
Like the movement of the sea, no man can tell where one wave begins and another ends. The chains of slavery with us were loosened by degrees. First, we had the struggle in Kansas with border ruffians, next, we had John Brown at Harper's Ferry. Next, the firing upon Fort Sumter, a little while after, we had Fremont's order, freeing the slaves of the rebels in Missouri. Then we had General Butler declaring and treating the slaves of rebels as contraband of war. Next we had the proposition to arm colored men and make them soldiers for the Union. In 1862 we had the conditional promise of a proclamation of emancipation from President Lincoln, and, finally, on the 1st of January, 1863, we had the proclamation itself, and still the end was not yet. Slavery was bleeding and dying, but it was not dead, and no man can tell just when its foul spirit departed from our land, if, indeed, it has yet departed. And hence we do not know what day we may properly celebrate as coupled with this great American event. When England behaved so badly during our late civil war, for one, felt like giving up these first of August celebrations. But I remembered that during that war, there were two Englands, as there were two Americas, and that one was true to liberty while the other was true to slavery. It was not the England which gave us West India emancipation that took sides with the slaveholders' rebellion. It was not the England of John Bright and William Edward Forster, that permitted Alabamas to escape from British ports, and prey upon our commerce, or that otherwise favored slaveholding in the South. But it was the England which had done what it could to prevent West India emancipation. It was the Tory party in England that fought the abolition 556 party at home, and the same party it was, that favored our slaveholding rebellion. Under a different name, we had the same, or a similar party, here. A party which despised the Negro and consigned him to perpetual slavery, a party which was willing to allow the American Union to be shivered into fragments, rather than that one hair of the head of slavery should be injured. But, fellow citizens, I should but very imperfectly fulfill the duty of this hour if I confined myself to a merely historical or philosophical discussion of West India emancipation. The story of the 1st of August has been told a thousand times over, and may be told a thousand times more. The cause of freedom and humanity has a history and destiny nearer home. How stands the case with the recently emancipated millions of colored people in our own country? What is their condition today? What is their relation to the people who formerly held them as slaves? These are important questions, and they are such as trouble the minds of thoughtful men of all colors, at home and abroad. By law, by the Constitution of the United States, slavery has no existence in our country. The legal form has been abolished. By the law and the Constitution, the Negro is a man and a citizen, and has all the rights and liberties guaranteed to any other variety of the human family, residing in the United States. He has a country, a flag, and a government, and may legally claim full and complete protection under the laws. It was the ruling wish, intention, and purpose of the loyal people after rebellion was suppressed, to have an end to the entire cause of that calamity by forever putting away the system of slavery and all its incidents. In pursuance of this idea, the Negro was made free, made a citizen, made eligible to hold office, to be a juryman, a legislator, and a magistrate. To this end, several amendments to the Constitution were proposed, recommended, and adopted. They are now a part of the supreme law of the land, binding alike upon every state and territory of the United States, North and South. Briefly, 557 This is our legal and theoretical condition. This is our condition on paper and parchment. If only from the national statute book we were left to learn the true condition of the colored race, the result would be altogether creditable to the American people. It would give them a clear title to a place among the most enlightened and liberal nations of the world. We could say of our country, as Curran once said of England, the spirit of British law makes liberty commensurate with and inseparable from the British soil. Now I say that this eloquent tribute to England, if only we looked into our constitution, might apply to us. In that instrument we have laid down the law, now and forever, that there shall be no slavery or involuntary servitude in this republic, except for crime. We have gone still further. 
We have laid the heavy hand of the Constitution upon the matchless meanness of caste, as well as the hell-black crime of slavery. We have declared before all the world that there shall be no denial of rights on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. The advantage gained in this respect is immense. It is a great thing to have the supreme law of the land on the side of justice and liberty. It is the lineup to which the nation is destined to march, the law to which the nation's life must ultimately conform. It is a great principle, up to which we may educate the people, and to this extent its value exceeds all speech. But today, in most of the southern states, the 14th and 15th Amendments are virtually nullified. The rights which they were intended to guarantee are denied and held in contempt. The citizenship granted in the 14th Amendment is practically a mockery, and the right to vote, provided for in the 15th Amendment, is literally stamped out in face of government. The old master class is today triumphant, and the newly enfranchised class in a condition but little above that in which they were found before the rebellion. Do you ask me how, after all that has been done, this state 558 of things has been made possible? I will tell you. Our reconstruction measures were radically defective. They left the former slave completely in the power of the old master, the loyal citizen in the hands of the disloyal rebel against the government. Wise, grand, and comprehensive in scope and design, as were the Reconstruction measures, high and honorable as were the intentions of the statesmen by whom they were framed and adopted, time and experience, which try all things, have demonstrated that they did not successfully meet the case. In the hurry and confusion of the hour, and the eager desire to have the Union restored, there was more care for sublime superstructure of the Republic than for the solid foundation upon which it could alone be upheld. They gave freedmen the machinery of liberty, but denied them the steam to put it in motion. They gave them the uniform of soldiers, but no arms, they called them citizens, and left them subjects, they called them free, and almost left them slaves. They did not deprive the old master class of the power of life and death which was the soul of the relation of master and slave. They could not of course sell them, but they retained the power to starve them to death, and wherever this power is held, there is the power of slavery. He who can say to his fellow man, you shall serve me or starve, is a master, and his subject is a slave. This was seen and felt by Thaddeus Stevens, Charles Sumner, and leading stalwart Republicans, and had their counsels prevailed the terrible evils from which we now suffer would have been averted. The Negro today would not be on his knees, as he is, abjectly supplicating the old master class to give him leave to toil. Nor would he now be leaving the South as from a doomed city and seeking a home in the uncongenial North, but tilling his native soil in comparative independence. Though no longer a slave, he is in a thraldom grievous and intolerable, compelled to work for whatever his employer is pleased to pay him, swindled out of his hard earnings by money orders redeemed in stores. Compelled to pay 559 the price of an acre of ground for its use during a single year, to pay four times more than a fair price for a pound of bacon, and be kept upon the narrowest margin between life and starvation. Much complaint has been made that the freedmen have shown so little ability to take care of themselves since their emancipation. Men have marveled that they have made so little progress. I question the justice of this complaint. It is neither reasonable, nor in any sense just. To me, the wonder is, not that the freedmen have made so little progress, but, rather, that they have made so much. Not that they have been standing still, but that they have been able to stand at all. We have only to reflect for a moment upon the situation in which these people found themselves when liberated, consider their ignorance, their poverty, their destitution. And their absolute dependence upon the very class by which they had been held in bondage for centuries, a class whose every sentiment was averse to their freedom. And we shall be prepared to marvel that they have under the circumstances done so well. History does not furnish an example of emancipation under conditions less friendly to the emancipated class, than this American example. Liberty came to the freedmen of the United States, not in mercy but in wrath. Not by moral choice but by military necessity. Not by the generous action of the people among whom they were to live, and whose goodwill was essential to the success of the measure, 
but by strangers, foreigners, invaders, trespassers, aliens, and enemies. The very manner of their emancipation invited to the heads of the freedmen the bitterest hostility of race and class. They were hated because they had been slaves, hated because they were now free, and hated because of those who had freed them. Nothing was to have been expected other than what has happened. And he is a poor student of the human heart who does not see that the old master class would naturally employ every power and means in their reach to make the 560 great measure of emancipation unsuccessful and utterly odious. It was born in the tempest and whirlwind of war, and has lived in a storm of violence and blood. When the Hebrews were emancipated, they were told to take spoil from the Egyptians. When the serfs of Russia were emancipated, they were given three acres of ground upon which they could live and make a living. But not so when our slaves were emancipated. They were sent away empty-handed, without money, without friends, and without a foot of land to stand upon. Old and young, sick and well, were turned loose to the open sky, naked to their enemies. The old slave quarter that had before sheltered them, and the fields that had yielded them corn, were now denied them. The old master class in its wrath said, Clear out. The Yankees have freed you, now let them feed and shelter you. Inhuman as was this treatment, it was the natural result of the bitter resentment felt by the old master class, and in view of it, the wonder is. Not that the colored people of the South have done so little in the way of acquiring a comfortable living, but that they live at all. Taking all the circumstances into consideration, the colored people have no reason to despair. We still live, and while there is life there is hope. The fact that we have endured wrongs and hardships, which would have destroyed any other race, and have increased in numbers and public consideration, ought to strengthen our faith in ourselves and our future. Let us then, wherever we are, whether at the north or at the south, resolutely struggle on in the belief that there is a better day coming, and that we by patience, industry, uprightness, and economy may hasten that better day. I will not listen, myself, and I would not have you listen to the nonsense, that no people can succeed in life among a people by whom they have been despised and oppressed. The statement is erroneous and contradicted by the whole history of human progress. A few centuries ago, all Europe was cursed with serfdom or slavery. Traces of this bondage still remain but are not easily visible. The Jews, only a century ago were despised, hated, and oppressed, but they have defied, met, and vanquished the hard conditions imposed upon them, and are now opulent and powerful, and compel respect in all countries. Take courage from the example of all religious denominations that have sprung up since Martin Luther. Each in its turn, has been oppressed and persecuted. Methodists, Baptists, and Quakers, have all been compelled to feel the lash and sting of popular disfavor, yet all in turn have conquered the prejudice and hate of their surroundings. Greatness does not come to any people on flowery beds of ease. We must fight to win the prize. No people to whom liberty is given, can hold it as firmly and wear it as grandly as those who wrench their liberty from the iron hand of the tyrant. The hardships and dangers involved in the struggle give strength and toughness to the character, and enable it to stand firm in storm as well as in sunshine. One thought more before I leave this subject, and it is a thought I wish you all to lay to heart. Practice it yourselves and teach it to your children. It is this, neither we, nor any other people, will ever be respected till we respect ourselves, and we will never respect ourselves till we have the means to live respectably. An exceptionally poor and dependent people will be despised by the opulent and despise themselves. You cannot make an empty sack stand on end. A race which cannot save its earnings, which spends all it makes and goes in debt when it is sick, can never rise in the scale of civilization, no matter under what laws it may chance to be. Put us in Kansas or in Africa, and until we learn to save more than we spend, we are sure to sink and perish. It is not in the nature of things that we should be equally rich in this world's goods. Some will be more successful than others, and poverty, in many cases, is the result of misfortune rather than of crime, but no race can afford to have all its members the victims of this misfortune, without being considered a worthless race. Pardon me, therefore, for urging upon you, 562 my people, the importance of saving your earnings. 
of denying yourselves in the present, that you may have something in the future, of consuming less for yourselves that your children may have a start in life when you are gone. With money and property comes the means of knowledge and power. A poverty-stricken class will be an ignorant and despised class, and no amount of sentiment can make it otherwise. This part of our destiny is in our own hands. Every dollar you lay up, represents one day's independence, one day of rest and security in the future. If the time shall ever come when we shall possess in the colored people of the United States, a class of men noted for enterprise, industry, economy, and success, we shall no longer have any trouble in the matter of civil and political rights. The battle against popular prejudice will have been fought and won, and in common with all other races and colors, we shall have an equal chance in the race of life. Do I hear you ask in a tone of despair if this time will ever come to our people in America? The question is not new to me. I have tried to answer it many times and in many places, when the outlook was less encouraging than now. There was a time when we were compelled to walk by faith in this matter, but now, I think, we may walk by sight. Notwithstanding the great and all-abounding darkness of our past, the clouds that still overhang us in the moral and social sky, the defects inherited from a bygone condition of servitude. It is the faith of my soul that this brighter and better day will yet come. But whether it shall come late or come soon will depend mainly upon ourselves. The laws which determine the destinies of individuals and nations are impartial and eternal. We shall reap as we sow, there is no escape. The conditions of success are universal and unchangeable. The nation or people which shall comply with them will rise, and those which violate them will fall, and perhaps will disappear altogether. No power beneath the sky can make an ignorant, wasteful, and idle people prosperous, or a licentious people happy. One ground of hope for my people is founded upon the returns of the last census. One of the most disheartening ethnological speculations concerning us has been that we shall die out, that, like the Indian, we shall perish in the blaze of Caucasian civilization. The census sets that heresy concerning us to rest. We are more than holding our own in all the southern states. We are no longer four millions of slaves, but six millions of freemen. Another ground of hope for our race is in the progress of education. Everywhere in the South the colored man is learning to read. None now denies the ability of the colored race to acquire knowledge of anything which can be communicated to the human understanding by letters. Our colored schools in the city of Washington compare favorably with the white schools, and what is true of Washington is equally true of other cities and towns of the South. Still another ground of hope I find in the fact that colored men are strong in their gratitude to benefactors, and firm in their political convictions. They cannot be coaxed or driven to vote with their enemies against their friends. Nothing but the shotgun or the bulldozer's whip can keep them from voting their convictions. Then another ground of hope is that as a general rule we are an industrious people. I have traveled extensively over the South, and almost the only people I saw at work there were the colored people. In any fair condition of things the men who till the soil will become proprietors of the soil. Only arbitrary conditions can prevent this. Today the Negro, starting from nothing, pays taxes upon six millions in Georgia, and forty millions in Louisiana. Not less encouraging than this is the political situation at the South. The vote of the colored man, formerly beaten down and stamped out by intimidation, is now revived, sought, and defended by powerful allies, and this from no transient sentiment of the moment. But from the permanent laws controlling the action of political parties. Transcribers Notes Punctuation, hyphenation, and spelling were made consistent when a predominant preference was found in the original book, otherwise they were not changed. Simple typographical errors were corrected. Unbalanced quotation marks were remedied when the change was obvious, and otherwise left unbalanced. Illustrations in this ebook have been positioned between paragraphs and outside quotations. In versions of this ebook that support hyperlinks, the page references in the list of illustrations lead to the corresponding illustrations. And, C note, was printed at the bottom of page 409, but wasn't referenced on any page.
The note on page 413 was not referenced on that page. Both of these omissions were corrected in a later printing of the same edition of this book, and Transcriber has adjusted both notes to be consistent with those corrections. The last few chapters of the original book did not begin with drop cap letters, this ebook follows that format.